Oh, hit him, sir. Let the rock him, sir. Are you booing because the rock was supposed to be here at 4 o'clock? Is that why you were booing? Yeah. was a little late. Is that why you were booing? Yeah. Why was the rock late? You want to know? Yeah. You want to know why the rock was late? Are you sure? Yeah. You want to know? Yeah. Why the rock? was late. Yeah. He was watching YouTube. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> <what's that? laughs> he was watching YouTube. <laughs> Is that a recent thing? Yeah. Hmm. Who's wow. that? Lost Trust and NPR? Is that Flip? Hold on. They're... I guess it has to be flipped. There, so few people have lost trust in NPR. Oh, yes. He's the only one I've ever heard of. <laughs> You're muted, Flip. We can't hear you. How about now? There you go. Flip, so, yeah. you didn't. Oh. You huh? didn't have a. You didn't have practice or a rehearsal. Oh no, the show. The show was last week. Two oh, weekends. okay. Gotcha. Um, no, today. But my schedule is all different today because, like, normally I work morning. And I'm off for hours before this starts, but I just got off of work half an hour ago, which is why I'm going to go take a shower. I'm going to put it on audio and listen to you guys and then come back. Sweet. Um, right. Oh, Chris Mormon face Hannah. Oh, we're live. Whoops. <laughs> we are. <laughs> That's why he disappeared right there. <clears throat> What's up, Reese, though? Do we, so who's the sponsor for this um, episode? I haven't pulled one. It could be. Is, a, is it birch gold? Have we got? Yeah, we could do a birch gold. Uh, <laughs> what's what's another big one going around lately? Um, oh, I was thinking of one just the other week. Oh, I I heard it everywhere, but I can't remember what it was. Oh, dang it! Well, it's sheath underwear, birch gold. Hang on a sec. We gotta do a, a birthday song for Morgan, as it said. You've had a birthday chaperone. <laughs> we wanna sing to you today. One year older, it was a two. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> you did the Mormonist version. <laughs> All right, so I'll get our, uh, I'll do our ad read real quick. All right. So this, this, to set the scene, <clears throat> it's a montage of people in various states of discomfort. A woman fidgets in a business meeting, her dress clinging uncomfortably to her thighs. A man winces during a workout, his underwear riding up into an unmentionable place. A couple on a date sits stiffly across from each other, silently suffering through sweat and veggies. Tired of underwear that betrays you at your worst moments? <laughs> Introducing the Imprisoner, the revolutionary <laughs> new sheath underwear that promises nothing and delivers even less. Made from a fabric so unforgiving, it'll leave you longing for the sweet embrace of cotton, if you can, rem if you can even remember what that feels like. The Imprisoner features a unique bind and squeeze technology that guarantees a constant feeling of being vaguely wrong. Look, <laughs> look like you have your life together on the outside. The imprisoner, the imprisoner will ensure you're a swirling vortex of misery on the inside. Order yours today and experience the uncomfortable joy of the imprisoner because you deserve it. <laughs> the imprisoner? <laughs> yeah, it was just, it, it's a, I, I asked AI to write a snarky um, <laughs> underwear ad. Did he just barely do that? Yeah, I just, I just, it just popped it up, and and it did say sheath underwear, but it's it's their new line of underwear called the Imprisoner. I guess the it imprisons your balls. Um, I can advertise. I can advertise one last little thing. Uh, if you give us some of this money, some of the proceeds will go to sex toys, which is important. Um. <laughs> Oh, God. 
Oh, geez. I'm so excited to see where he is in five years. <laughs> Well, all right. So uh, that is uh, for sale. It's for sale. Oh, my God. You better not outbid me, you son of a bitch. No, I am totally outbidding you. I'm getting that. That's mine. (laughs) It's going to be in the background back here. I'm going to be in my Dan McClellan shirt, and that's going to be my background. And I'm going to be. He should actually buy it. (laughs) it. Today's fit is Dan McClellan shirt. And in the background, I got. Today's fit is a blank t shirt because fuck (laughs) you, I'm an adult. Yeah, well, all that's for sale. So buy all that and help the podcast out by, uh, I don't know. I guess it would help, would it? I don't know. I I don't want that podcast to be helped. They're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't, yeah. like, it's every now and then you'll get something halfway decent from Nuance Ho or from John DeLynn, but literally never from Zelf. Like they, they never do anything worth a damn. Yeah. That is totally true. So Flip will be back later. I guess uh I guess there's a bunch of little stuff. We are we invited Forrest on to discuss whether you should or should not evangelize leaving to Mormonism. Mm. Uh, I guess that's a the general concept. Something like that. How, He's, go ahead. I wonder if uh, Forrest was as good of a missionary as as he is an ex missionary. <laughs> he didn't go on a mission. Oh, he didn't. Oh no. What a, what an asshole. Yeah, he did go See, to uh, BYU Hawaii though. That's as good as going on a mission. What? Oh Jesus! You, you suffered some difficulty like the rest of us. Um, but I was gonna pull up here to go along with that. Thing, um, yeah, that's where that's where old Maven went. Maybe they cross paths. <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt. Did oh yeah, she did, didn't she? Yeah. Um, I was gonna pull up. Uh, it was clear last week. We pulled it up last week, but Jonathan did a beautiful trouble on modern art, and he posted it on <laughs> Mormon Stories podcast, a hour and a half long video by Stephen Hicks. They got into the detail about postmodern art and modern art. It's a little bit different in the painting world because what's postmodern was technically called modern, but you can consider it the same thing. It's just kind of a different title for the same thing. And um, trying to find it because he posted it last week. But um, that whole video, it talks about how the deconstructors have been doing the same deconstruction for 50, 60, 70 years now. <laughs> so it's kind of like that Jackson Pollock thing. And when we saw another article recently, which we always knew about, that most of that deconstructive stuff was pushed to the forefront by the CIA. The CIA, which I also, uh, uh, speaking of which, too many, too many uh, tangents, don't want to get into too many tangents, but uh, I watched Lawrence of Arabia this week, which was interesting. But I also know too much about Lawrence of Arabia in the sense of uh, that the movie was very good, assuming that this was just a guy who fumbled over to to uh, Saudi Arabia and ended up leading a bunch of wars. But it's not, I don't think that's exactly how it happened. But uh, I mean, it's a beautiful movie, imagining that it was that way and it had awesome music and awesome shots and awesome visuals and all that sorts of stuff. But T.E. Lawrence was definitely a spy sent over by the Milnerites and all of that was intentional and done intentionally. It, it, it wasn't <laughs> as happy as the movie would, uh, might make you believe. But um, that's that's all right. I, it was a very good movie. It's fun to pretend the world is like that. Well, I mean, I'm sure it was beautiful like that. Or, I mean, beautiful, desert beautiful. That's but, fun uh, to pretend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, just just imagine it. Like, uh, you Have you seen Lawrence of Arabia? Risto is the one who uh, had me watch it. 
you seen that at all or you just yeah he's been wanting us to watch i haven't i haven't watched it no i don't i don't know anything about it i didn't even know it was based on like an actual story no lawrence of arabia was a an englishman who went over it's kind of pre-world war ii-ish era saudi arabia egypt um jordan area and he ended up joining in with a bunch of different, like, you know, the Sufis versus the, you know, that type of stuff, but way, way, way back when the British had the British mandate in the area. So it has, it's all kind of pre Balfour agreement, which is all the stuff that led up to the creation of modern day Israel. Um, well, one of the issues with like all that stuff is that mm. you could, you could view the British, what the British did in the Middle East at that time was a little bit of how people accuse Soros of doing stuff over here. It's like he, they kind of just played two sides off of each other purposefully to kind of create wars and then be able to scoop up what they could. And then the movie sort of gets in that. It doesn't say it didn't happen. It just it kind of glosses over how purposeful it was. It kind of made it look like this happenstance, uh, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed boy just accidentally found himself upon some wars, you know, type stuff. But now nah, he was a spy <laughs> sent to do that entirely by the <laughs> the Milnerites that, and it was all just to kind of Soros up an area of people of just have them all start attacking. Each other. Soros like, up. Yeah. They totally Soros up the region. They had, they acted like uh, they were in with these guys and also in with these guys. So like they played like both sides of it and then got them to fight each other. And uh, that's, that's what they did. And maybe I they, just laughed. At yeah. It's funny. I actually think if you look at most of stupid, like if, there's this book by Carol Quigley that gets into details about like what crazy nutty elitists did all the way back from World War II and beyond. And one of the things that that book gets in his two and is famous for is that uh, different banking things that funded both sides of the war. And this is kind of what it's always been. And it's always been a little bit confusing is that the money and all that stuff. You, you saw that meme going around about Iran attacking Israel. And there's a thing like, those are my tax dollars and it's these missiles. And then it shows the other missiles and goes somehow also my tax dollars. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's just been totally true just from the, the time and all memorial. Well, especially in modern war eras, both sides get totally funded by both by the same people. And they are, I think Soros has been the person who everybody's been able to see it more distinctly with uh, James Lindsay just did like a long podcast on Soros recently, but like the whole idea is create all the friction and then you can catch what, what falls out of the friction. So, so it's a long history of just playing both sides against each other and not really having like a dog in either one of the fights. And uh, I guess mm. we all need to be aware of, of that stuff going on, but that was a tangent and what I was trying to say that that Hicks one that I'm trying to pull up that Jonathan posted in Mormon stories is something that where, where the heck is it? I'm looking for it in our, uh, was it a link or was it a, a media thing? He just, a, he just posted a screenshot. I think I thought it was a screenshot, but anyway, um, I can't find a screenshot or maybe I'm not going back far enough. Anyway, he recommends uh, watching this video by Stephen Hicks. And one of the first things Stephen Hicks acts in it is why does that deconstructive art never freaking change? And I have a little bit of a general sense that when I sit there and look at Tanner recreating Jackson Pollock, <laughs> how many years past Jackson Pollock that when everybody's doing all the deconstructive, deconstructive, deconstructive stuff, it is basically, it's like Andy Warhol repeat of the canned good, but the canned good actually took some talent to repeat. Nowadays, it's just a repeat of the deconstruction, repeat of the deconstruction, repeat, and we can't get out of the cycle of the repeat of the deconstruction. And it sucks, and it sucked a long time. Yes, so so Morgan actually is the one that showed me that painting, and she's like, doesn't this look stupid? And I was like, you know, I don't even know. I don't know yeah. what stupid looks like anymore because my judge of what makes good art is how realistic it looks. Basically, I don't, I don't know. I'm I'm so used to this bullshit art where some like rich trust fund brat gets an art gala for a weekend and then jumps off of a trampoline and splats into a 
a trough of blue paint and the <laughs> whatever splatter have like whatever splatter gets on the wall is the exhibit and everybody pretends that it's so like beautiful because they don't want to seem like the idiot that doesn't understand it but nobody <laughs> understands it because it's nothing to understand it's just it's I to call it entropy would be an insult to entropy. Yeah, no doubt. And it's true that it was always astroturfed. That stuff gets astroturfed. There's not really that much interest in purchasing it up. Uh, are you playing this song? I'm. Is that your guitar? I'm not seeing the screen. That's that's Flip. He's not muted. Oh, Flip, Flip, are you Am ready I... to <laughs> sing a song, a birthday song for? Yeah, you can sing a song, Flip. Yeah, you're muted. I gotta work on it for a second. <laughs> She said she wanted a fat acceptance birthday song. You gotta do the. <laughs> um, I'm still trying to find Jonathan's beautiful troll. Maybe it was way long ago, and I'm just. It's been. How it was. It's been a little while. I, I'm past it too fast. Our group chat is. Our group chat's pretty massive, but if you just like, if if you probably look for keywords and just type in "beautiful trouble," it'll probably pop up pretty quick, but. But yeah, it was just screenshots. I'm not sure if he posted. How the crap and far link. back is it there? Yeah. I don't know. It's we we chat a lot. Is Flip <laughs> playing the guitar? Is he gonna do a song for? I think Flip was just practicing. And he oh. is he back? Did he already shower? Or did he just come and go? No, nah, he well he had just forgot to mute himself to begin with and. So he was practicing guitar. And that's why we heard him. It's a good thing he didn't do that thing he normally does when he thinks he's off mic, where he just like starts shouting a bunch of racial slurs. Where he does that, yeah. I've yeah. seen him do that. It's nasty. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yo, yo, yo. Uh, yeah. Are you playing a song? Let's see how this works. I just wrote this in the shower because she wanted them. Um, wait, wait, you're way, you're way. Uh, I've got them like way gained up. You're, gained yeah, up. you're loud. I mean, I because I, I mean, is that super loud? Am I loud with my microphone? Yeah, you're loud. Your gain is like way, way, way. How do I ungain? I don't know. Is that this a, is, a, is really it setting on your podcast. ears on the thing on your ears? I don't think like so. a... I've never I've never messed with the game. Huh. I don't know. Here, you know what? Let me just it's, do this. I'm going to right now. Come back. Is that I I don't know. Sounds fine. Okay. I just wrote this in the shower. Now Morgan said she wanted what birthday and <laughs> fat acceptance? Yes. <laughs> it's it's okay to get fat, Morgan, as long as you are old. Your husband won't care if you're fat. Morgan, as long as you are old. Younger ladies, please keep it together. The patriarchy wants you to better, but it's okay to be fat, Morgan, because you're a mom and you are old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do think she'll appreciate that. She is 30 now. Holy shit. Imagine being that old. <laughs> Well, I just found the actual post, so I'll just pull that up for a second. It took me freaking forever. Um, this is it. He posted on uh, "How Art Became Ugly" by Stephen Hicks. But yeah, in the very intro of this, I'll put it. I'll put a link of it in the uh, thing. In the very, very intro of it, and that's a uh, Jonathan commenting on that on uh, Mormon stories of a. Uh, the philosophies of men mingled with scripture, just more fear mongering by the brethren, right? We have no need to fear the philosophies of men. It's not like those philosophies will somehow change our self conception or worldview. They are just people, people ideas, and we are free thinkers who've escaped the cult. And so, so can see a manipulative philosophy a mile away. Somebody want to finish reading? If you can see I, don't know where I just realized yeah. I had my oh, room right mic on that whole time. That's why that was screwed uh, up. Yeah, but I guess it worked out. Yeah. <laughs> Right there. As you explore the landscape of ideas outside the bubble of Mormonism, at first everything will seem fresh and new. You have a new freedom to explore and consider all the different ways of seeing the world that were previously closed off to you. 
You can view art and media at your will and pleasure without having to first filter it through the would the brethren approve this test. It's all very exciting. You might notice something as you do that, though. Things are just bleak. If bonus point, uh, if bonus points in Mormonism are rewarded for an almost Pollyanna unrealistic positivity, much of the secular art is great because of its ability to negate, subvert, deconstruct, and portray the ugliness of humanity in the world. It's an important dimension of life, to be sure, to see the good and the bad and the ups and downs, but the imbalance of the focus will probably soon catch your notice, and it affects us all. Art and media have long been abstractions of thoughts and ideas, and artistic uh, and artists are philosophic in what they and what and how they choose to portray with their efforts. The philosophies of men mingled with art is what we have always experienced, but it takes some study to trace where those philosophies come from and how they manifest on the canvas or on the screen. The lecture. The lecture from Stephen Hicks is a great view uh, review of this phenomenon and is an eye-opening view into how we have all ingested philosophies in the course of ingesting the media and art that surrounds us. Would love to hear any thoughts on this. Yeah, I don't think I can show the thoughts inside of the Mormon Stories group, but I think I can show that much at least. But Mormon Stories. Anyway, go by... Jackson Pollock by Tanner. How many Jacksons and Tanners can you beat up? <laughs> if, if you, like, if Wait you a minute, doubled that's, them that's up. That? Would you rather well, fight a horse-sized Jackson or 50 Jackson-sized Tanners? <laughs> that's, the, <laughs> that's the old uh, Reddit question of would you kind rather of, fight it, a horse-sized it, duck or a thousand duck-sized horses or something. But, um it kind of sounds like um, it, it depends, really, on is Jackson spelled with an X or, or <laughs> Yeah, only I one see. of those is bred entirely on soy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, I guess it, it might kind of even out because Jackson spelled with an X is probably half of them are, are utards that are like, with stupid spellings of names, but then the other half yeah. are like white trash. Like they could probably they'd probably bite your ear off in a fight type people. So it's sort of a wild card. Yeah, um, I'm gonna look just at a couple longhouse posts real quick. Uh, I just noticed that uh, <laughs> backwards. <laughs> I'm trying to open my damn window. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, Oh, that's I a just, lot of uh, flexion. Forrest says he's coming in, but he's got he's eating at eight Pacific Standard Time. That means ten o'clock our time, right? Or no, nine o'clock our time. Yeah, I mean we'll I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, we'll still be here. There's a, there's some of us Steve's drawings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that didn't need to be immortalized. Trent Horn debated. Uh this is a great depiction by Gary Larson of the mom that infantilizes the bear and attacks. No one ever heard from the Anderson brothers again. <laughs> but I always bring up the concept from Paul Bloom of there's nothing more dangerous than a mom that has assumed there's a predator around its uh, kids. And then if you go over <laughs> into infantilizing the whole world. So Gary Larson made a thing about that. Oh, good old Norm. We're missing him right yeah. now. No, really. And when I got the news, like I looked at my phone. It was also funny because like, I, I really wonder how the Fox News people decide when to clickbait and not clickbait. Because, like, for once, they're just oh, like, they OJ Simpson you on this? dead. They didn't clickbait me on that one. Because I thought it's like, they you know, said like OJ? NFL legend, like Heisman Trophy winner dead at 76. And everybody's like, oh, wait, do you mean OJ? But no, they actually just came out and said it. But the first thing that went through my mind is like, Norm. Oh, no, Norm's <laughs> dead. <laughs> like, Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Why did OJ so have to die about, after Norm? We were talking about <laughs> Selma Envy last week, and I just realized in my head that there was a uh, an overlap, a Venn diagram overlap of people who had Selma Envy and people who cheered the OJ acquittal had to have been like the same <laughs> exact. And it's yeah. kind of funny because like I saw there's this dude named FD Signifier, this lefty bread tube black dude. And I saw even him 
and it's even funny like watching him come out with like this apologetic stuff of uh saying uh, let's see uh the one time in 1994 when white folks had a point <laughs> you know that's the name of his <laughs> That's the name of his uh, thing. And <laughs> he, of course, this lefty <laughs> YouTuber is kind of just like, yeah, <laughs> I guess OJ was a uh, pretty bad. Uh, and we <laughs> use race politics to get a bad person off. Yeah, and it's it's just like amazing <laughs> to hear the guy kind of say that, you know what I mean? But of course, it can only yeah, be admitted to. Bad shit. Yeah, it can only be admitted to and reevaluated 30 years later. But somebody like, even like, um, you know, Mark Lamont Hill, he had that debate one time with James Lindsay, who, you know, he just went mouthing off about all the Marxist stuff, acting like he was owning James Lindsay, but he was just proving the point that it was all Marxist stuff. Um, he said that OJ had one bad day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it was probably when he that, lost that the football feels like game. Almost as, that feels about as dumb as the... Um the Rittenhouse prosecutor saying like, you should have just taken the beating. Sometimes you just got get nearly yeah. murdered. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, like, yeah. I think that thing just happened where like, you know, the guy only shot 11 times and hit three cops. Like, <laughs> and like they should have traded volleys. Like, okay. Like I shot 11. Now you guys get 11. Okay. All right. <laughs> like shit. We missed him 11 times. I, I viewed it as like this, this hey, uh, no fair. You strategy game like Final Fantasy. <laughs> it's so dumb, but <laughs> the thing is, is that, uh, <laughs> um, the OJ thing, man. The people coming out and having like apologetics and think pieces on all that stuff. And I saw that some other people saying we weren't rooting for OJ, we were rooting for Johnny Cochran. That's who we were rooting for. Like, <laughs> shut up. Like, how is that better? So like that guy, that guy is <laughs> like like OJ is a horrible cold-blooded murderer, but like I, mean, I guess it's not cold-blooded. It was a murder of passion. Like OJ lost his head and did something horrible. Johnny Cochran took the money and then pulled one over on the entire justice system. Like yeah. he's so calculatedly evil. He's so <laughs> dumb. Um. Yeah, I can't believe that stuff flies or flew and like, anywhere. And there's still think pieces coming out right now. Just one thing uh, that I think is just like uh, the unbelievable injustice is that O.J. Simpson's lawyers got paid, but Nicole Brown, <laughs> Simpson's family, and the Goldstein Goldman family, like I just saw, like as soon as he was dead, they already had a thing where his lawyers were moving to um prevent any of his estate from being pay from paying out the civil settlement. We're just like, oh my god, you guys! <laughs> Fuck's sake! Oh like at gosh. some point, like, come on, <laughs> give um, him a fucking second. <laughs> <laughs> There's been some funny memes on that, like people saying like families can be together forever and showing pictures. Of <laughs> that was a good one. That Stuff was a good like one. That. But um, oh, Umberto Echo. Umberto Echo is another. Uh, uh, Watch like in the name of the rose with Umberto Echo. Uh, this is Umberto Echo stuff. I'm esoteric as fuck. Same, I'm extremely esoteric. I'm a total mystic. Do I come across to you as esoteric? Yeah, <laughs> you think I'm uh, esoteric, right? <laughs> but yeah, I think, uh, I think ugly art can be cool too. I mean, we're the thing is, is like we're all. There's Something. no way you can be rockers like we are and not like have an appreciation for the deconstructive or destructive. That's just um, the first pavement record is like a masterpiece of noise. Like just some, like I, the first pavement record in particular. Like some of the songs, like um, like Zurich is stained or Loretta scars, or like like there's the bones of just a simple beautiful song, but everything's just dripping and all this feedback and crunchy noise and that crazy hippie drummer. And like it's hard to wrap your head around. Like normally people are like, "This is come on, this is garbage." But like, there's a reason why that album like ended up like burrowing into the zeitgeist like it did, and sending Pavement off to being the kings of indie rock, you know. And like, and that thing's like later on in his career, he cleaned up. He learned to play guitar and how to record and stuff. And he didn't have to make noisy stuff. But like, man, that first record, like yeah, that song Loretta Scars, like it's like all this just crazy crunchy noise, and there's just beautiful <laughs> little song that's hiding underneath. It's great. Yeah, that's a that's one of the weird things that I'm always kind of examining, and I guess that's what 
we would be examining or will be once the force is on, but we're eternally in this no man's land. And I don't even know like what to preach for. And I feel like there still is something to preach for because I mean, I feel like esotericism is fine unless you go become one of these guys and go all the way esoteric, you know, or, or postmodernism, some ideas in it are good. It's just, they're not, 100% universal, true of all times, at all moments, in all situations. It's like everything is just like, hey, you got to pick and take take it and leave it and use it when it's useful and let it go when it isn't type stuff. And deconstructive stuff can be interesting, but where's the construction? Like get on the construction side of stuff sometimes. And... Yeah, yeah. At some point. <laughs> hey, bud. Uh-oh. Uh, are we going to get another a, is that a... He's got pants on this time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, so he, he's white male, right? He can tell us about the patriarchy. I wonder what his opinions are on whether women should have nice hair. Boy, think of young men getting born today and all the patriarchy they're in for. They're, how hard they're going to cash in on patriarchy. <laughs> like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> I mean, that's the, I, sometimes I like to just, like, count up all the dollars I made off of patriarchy. So, <laughs> It's just so easy so easy yeah, life is a uh, life is unfortunately about balance and balance unfortunately is really like fucking gay is what i've realized balance that, is boring so that's yeah. Yeah, like no, a lot of like, like going, going toward your whole esoteric rant and talking about how like uh, esotericism is fine until you go full esoteric mm. you're like yeah i know it's it's about finding like a balance and that sounds so fucking gay <laughs> yeah let's be balanced let's let's be reasonable shut the fuck up man i'm a stoic <laughs> i don't feel pain all right <laughs> i don't know maybe talk about your feelings sometimes <laughs> all these norm yeah. mcdonald bits are flashing through my head when norm was talking about his teenage son he's like my teenage son says he cuts himself just so he can feel something I said, what's wrong with feeling nothing like everyone else? <laughs> <laughs> but um, Risto, is there any difference between ugly and meaningless? Yeah, I think so. Some ugly things are meaningful, and a lot of meaningless things are totally banal. Yeah, I, I like how some ugly stuff looks for sure, and I like how Yeah, no, there's some things like, well, like ugly airplanes. Mm. Like, oh my gosh, I'm going to do the screen share. One of the weirdest things to ever fly. That's Some awesome. of the ugly AI art that Jonathan drops makes me laugh my butt off. Uh, it's hideous sometimes, but uh, well, it's like there's certain things that are intentionally ugly, like uh, like Ren and Stimpy shit, even just caricature art. Like it's all it all exists to play up on like your most disgusting features <laughs> and exaggerate them. But I don't know. Yeah. This was ugly on purpose. This thing actually flew through the air and was designed for a specific purpose in mind. Have you got the screen, Oshero? What the fuck is that? Yeah, it's sharing. It looks, the whole idea of this, like this, a, this guy, he was, a German, he was a German aircraft designer in the 30s and 40s, and he was a mad genius. He came up with all kinds of crazy ideas. And what's funny is like this plane was unsuccessful, not because it was a bad airplane, but just because pe pilots didn't want to fly it because they just looked at it. But the whole idea of this is that it was a, a reconnaissance observation plane. And this crazy asymm asymmetric layout was like the best way to get maximum observable view, like, you know, to be able to look around and see and take pictures and still keep it down to one engine. And so he came up with this nutcase design. And like by the accounts, it was a great airplane. It was like stable and easy to fly, but it was unpopular just because it's such a crazy looking thing. So uh, I might want to play a video, and it's it's like an eight-minute long video. I might want to play most of it, though. I'll put it on like a little bit faster. But um, Some beauty kinda... is boring after a while. I mean, yeah. you know, the best part about the sunset is when it's over, and then you oh, know, like, you like stuff all the while. hot chicks I date. Like after a while, I'm like, oh, come on. Just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> Enough of the hot. Why can't I date one ugly woman? Ugh. <laughs> Ugh, gosh, where's the snaggle tooth here and there, man? Jeez. Um. <laughs> I was also raised by a hoarder. I was raised by a hoarder and a half. All right, listen to this one. Tell me what you think about this one. You might have to listen to all of it, but feel free to stop. But um, 
This is somewhere on like the border of the the people who fight with James Lindsay and Bogosian about being Christian and Christian nationalist and conservative. But Aaron McIntyre is also not wrong either. And they're not wrong. They're, they're, there's a whole side. Um, Bogosian and Aaron I had already had an hour discussion and they agreed on most of the stuff they were talking about. But then they still have a major big rift too. So. According to recent reports, a gay Spanish politician who belongs to the country's left-wing governing party has been forced to resign after pictures surface of the municipal councilor eating his own excrement. While incredibly disgusting, the existence of yet another degenerate politician would be oh, unremarkable God. if the fact that he was defended by an unlikely ally, Peter Bogosian. Did you see that on Twitter? Which one? The the post, I, like there yeah, was a Spanish politician who got caught. Peter like, Bogosian defending the... No, I didn't see that. So the video came out kind of just like those um, videos of the people having the sexual relations inside the Senate or whatever oh. um, of this Spanish politician eating his own poop. And, oh, fun. Uh, for sexual escapades, he had a video of it. He and, was a coprophiliac. Yeah. And Bogosian came out and said, <laughs> this Who, might What's not wrong be... with that? Who's to say? Did you exactly. go have a chapter on that? A little bit. He said... <laughs> this might not be a popular take, but leave the guy alone, is what he said. So. Bergosian has made a name for himself in the conservative sphere yeah. as a non-woke classical liberal willing to stand against the corruption of academia. The former professor of philosophy felt a bizarre compulsion to take to Twitter and ward off those that would question the Spanish politician's behavior, urging his followers to, quote, mind your own business and leave the guy alone. When Bogosian inevitably received pushback for his strange reaction, he attacked his critics for their, quote, pervasive normative rigidity that comes from Christian fear of judgment, end quote. Many were confused at this absurd reaction from a man who had portrayed himself as a champion of returning rational standards to the university system. But Bogosian's outburst reveals an important contradiction that lies at the heart of liberalism and makes it incompatible with those who seek to return order and civilization to the West. Like many non-woke liberals of our era, Bogosian began his political journey as a militant new atheist progressive who spent much of his academic career attacking religion. The philosopher joined forces with prominent atheists like Richard Dawkins and Michael Shermer, hosting debates with Christian apologists to drive out the last vestiges of religious dogma from the enlightened West. As new atheism waned in popularity, many public intellectuals involved with the movement discovered a new target for their acerbic deconstruction, wokeness. The social justice warriors who dominated college campuses in the late 2000s had grown up and taken positions as professors or administrators in the university system. Woke dogma was threatening the liberal order in academia, and the new atheists framed the successor ideology as the next in a long line of religions that needed to be defeated. Bogosian's most famous salvo against wokeness in academia came in 2017 when he teamed up with fellow new atheists James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose to submit a series of fake scholarly papers to peer-reviewed journals. White, the papers white, were white. filled with a jumble of critical theory jargon designed to draw the adoration of woke <laughs> academics despite saying nothing of substance. Some of the papers drew praise from reviewers, and a few even got published before the hoax was uncovered. Peer review is the linchpin of legitimacy for modern academic expertise, and discrediting the process threatened to deal a huge blow to the foundations underlying the power of our managerial elite. This revealing glyphs into the absurd system that has come to dominate <laughs> in the field by Peter Bogosian Boyle a fair amount this. of credit among conservatives and classical liberals who are interested in joining the woke revolution. That's funny. Because Peter Boyle's that famous actor. Right? I'm not crazy, right? Hold on. Was that another? Yeah, I, meant, I, was, I didn't yeah. mean to turn that off. What was that? Oh, but just because like I didn't realize that Peter Bogosian used the um acronym Peter or the acronym, the pseudonym Peter Boyle. So Peter oh, Boyle yeah. is that famous old British actor. Yeah. Oh, no, he's American. So it's like cycle one. I'll put the card. It should be popping up right now in the video. Conservatives have a nasty habit of immediately accepting and even elevating to leadership liberals who hate them simply because they agree on a few issues. Many disgruntled liberal atheists have suddenly found themselves on the side of the very conservatives that they loathed for decades in the fight against wokeness. But that doesn't mean that they've had a change of heart. I didn't leave the left. The left left me is the refrain most often uttered by these liberal castoffs, and they rarely take any responsibility for what their movement became. Despite his temporary embarrassment with the pace at which progressive <laughs> Rated, Bogosian is still an unrepentant revolutionary who clings to every belief that inevitably led to the very woke order he now claims to oppose. As expectations for political leadership go, not eating excrement is a pretty low bar. It would be nice if we could demand more from those who rule over us, but asking them not to be so degenerate that they literally consume their own feces seems reasonable. But this very mild request appears to be a bridge too far for Bogosian, who sees any standard for sexual behavior as an absurd relic from our religious past. Like most liberal atheists, Bogosian refuses to connect his purposeful deconstruction of spiritual and moral sentiments with the dysfunctional world in which he finds himself. 
The philosopher's radical commitment to individual freedom dissolved every barrier to wokeness, but he simply refuses to own the consequences of his beliefs. When asked to place even the slightest restrictions on personal freedom, Bogosian reflexively strikes out at Christianity, which he still perceives as his true enemy. And to be very clear, Bogosian is not ignorant of the fatal flaws residing in classical liberalism, and to his credit, he's willing to discuss them at length. I personally had a cordial discussion with the philosopher during which I laid out the reasons why liberalism couldn't defend itself from hostile ideologies and why a more robust tradition was required to ground Western society. I went in expecting a knockdown, drag out fight, but to my surprise, Bogosian spent most of the hour long discussion conceding every one of my points. But despite the posture of general retreat, Bogosian still insisted that liberalism remained the only way forward. Recent events have clearly shaken his faith, but ultimately the academic can't imagine a world where liberalism does not reign supreme. Although they often adopt the moniker of classical liberal, the leftists ejected from progressivism share very little with the historical movement. The father of classical liberalism, John Locke, famously wrote that atheism was immoral and that its adherents could not be trusted, especially with political power. In the face of overwhelming evidence that the lack of religious and moral conviction in public life has destroyed Western civilization, liberal atheists like Bogosian simply can't admit the failure of their ideology. In theory, liberalism holds that rational discourse can resolve all issues in the public square. In practice, the advocates of liberalism have proven impervious to that discourse. The faith of the spurned liberal is, in fact, as dogmatic as the religious doctrines they sought to undermine. The unrepentant liberal can't take ownership over the consequences of his ideology and will always return to his core hatred of the religious traditions it displaced. The West must embrace That's the strong, that make demands of its citizens and uphold standards for its leaders. If liberals can't even summon the moral fortitude to demand that their leaders refrain from literally eating their own crap, then maybe... They simply have no place in a conservative coalition. How did the yeah. poop eating get exposed? I don't know. It got leaked online or something. Was like it that. like, was he hacked or was it a whoopsie? I or have was no it a, idea. I saw, a, I saw some edited out image of him doing it. Though. Yeah. Was it vengeance? Was it, I wonder. Oh, yeah. Man, I don't know. Like, that is a tough one because, like, because that's things like the whole, like, look. <laughs> What you do by yourself, like Ooh. whether, however objectionable I think it might personally be, I think like if we wanted to create all of the mechanisms a civilization would need to stamp out autocoprophagia or whatever the fuck that's called, like that's worse than a guy eating poop, you know, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I would agree with that too. Like you gotta like beware the authoritarianism of some other side. You yeah. you would hope that it would be more coming from the insides of the individual, but they have all the arguments that say that it must from some come from some community things. So I'm I'm kind yeah. of setting the table here of a kind of a the issues the problems, to eat some, some setting the table so that we can all eat some excrement and then uh, say mind your own business. <laughs> Uh, I that we're talking about this horrible thing when I'm drinking the most excellent wine I've ever had on this podcast. Oh, should I go to the, Oh, yeah. You, you want to switch over to the thing real quick? Yeah. <laughs> oh they had them. Um, it is it's a tricky spot to be in because I'm like I feel that my knee jerk is to also be like Bogosian and be like the, what you do in privacy I don't really care about but I'm like fuck well, man how how bad okay, would it have so, to be if I were to like if if my guy were to be revealed to eat shit, would I vote him again? <laughs> I'm like, ah. But that's just know. exactly yeah. it. I'm I'm trying to set the table here because like uh, I, I I we're we're supposedly going to talk with Forrest, and I kind of came at Forrest a little bit for being uh, you know I made I made fun a little bit of one of his posts, and the only thing I made fun of about it is that uh um. The post, in my view, kind of asked that if you presuppose that what I have is the truth, you'll see that I'm right. And I think that you can maybe say that on any post, right? So if you presuppose that what I say is true, um, you'll see that I'm correct. And uh, But just play along with me and presuppose that what I'm saying is true, and then, you're, then you'll get it, see? Uh, but that might be a bit of a caricature, but that that's just kind of how I viewed it. But I think that's kind of how most philosophical philosophical arguments come down but we've been kind of circling around forever around a forest of do we be evangelical about not being mormon anymore or not so that that's kind of coming up and what i'm kind of setting the table for here maybe it'd be nicer to like have Forrest here listening to it or not if he wasn't but um i'm setting the table with like all the types of things where i don't know good answers for like i take that critique that, that he says right there and at the same time i also go 
I don't take that critique. Like yeah. I'm showing all these different areas where it's kind of like, I get what you're saying. And I, so I'm going to pull up yeah. a couple other things that come at Christianity. I even posted one yesterday that that Bronze Age pervert guy who was with Michael Malice, that guy's a Nietzschean. And the Nietzschean guys come at Christianity saying, you guys are too weak. You know, and and, and, and that's just how stuff goes. I mean, it's just it's just an eternal like finger pointing thing. Uh, when it comes to like the right trying to sort that stuff out, but uh, I still maintain like a generally classical liberal position. I even posted something about uh, Glenn Lowry and Schellenberger still being some of my favorite thinkers around, despite everybody else out there that I listen to and whatnot. I still land on the side of uh, that that's the best society, but um, I'll pull up more. But we got Booze Corner up here, and it's yeah, this won't take long back off or to <laughs> zip off onto other stuff because we we got a while before Forrest might pop up. So. Yeah, but um, because I had um, my dad died, so I had a personal loss. But the upside is my coworkers or some out to him bought me this. Um, this is a hundred dollar bottle of wine. This is Chateauneuf de Pop. Um, some people call it the gateway drug to French reds. Uh, Frank Black of the <laughs> Pixies. This is his favorite kind of wine, and uh, this one in particular, what kind of makes it stand out, especially in French wines, is their whole kind of gimmick is that. Like it's predominantly Grenache, followed by a big chunk of Syrah and Mauvedra, which is the classic Rhone blends. But it's actually made of all of the thirteen grapes allowed in Rhone, including the white and the pinks. To you know, ever descending amounts, but it just makes this incredibly rich, complex. It's like the everything. It's like Beethoven symphony wine, where it's just got all the little bits. Because like most of the time, like when you throw a lot of money at wine, you're kind of like, oh, that was I didn't get my money's worth. Like, I didn't pay for this, but like, this is the kind of thing where if you're going to throw money at wine, get something like this a shot to Neuf de Pop that costs a nice amount of money because they're just, it stands out. It's, you know, if you have this next to an ordinary red, you'll understand why someone goes out of their way to spend some money on wine because this stuff is just gorgeous. I won't tell you exactly what it is because there's a few of these, but man, yeah, this, this is what the wine nerds live for is this kind of thing. So I'm really grateful. My coworkers were, I was not expecting this. And they bought me these really excellent proper Bordeaux style glasses, which is even better. So no, they really took care of me, but yeah. So drinking fancy wine for my dad. That's who never sweet. drank fancy one, <laughs> but there you go. That's the Chateauneuf to pop of the day. Yeah. <laughs> it's like just um, everything. Like the nose is so big. And it's just balance. Everything is there. It's got the licorice of Grenache. The Syrah spiciness comes over. And then, like, you can just pick up, like, the little weird Viognier fruitiness. Anyway, I'm done. I just got the picture back up. <laughs> Save four or five more ingredients. <laughs> can you? There's, yeah, can you... I don't remember all the grapes that are in it. Like, there's so many goofy <laughs> little grapes in it. Huh. Oh. I know that grape is in it. <laughs> the what? So I posted this from Malice yesterday. It's got Bronze Age pervert in it. And the guy's he's an interesting dude. He's famous because he wrote a book that got pretty popular online called um I think it's Bronze Age Mindset. He's a German guy, he's got a funny voice. And he got people kind of like look at him and Curtis Yarvin, um, uh, both of the uh Curtis Yarvin, maybe Nick Land as the dissident right thinkers, the thinky thinkers of the weird. And this guy, he's kind of like a weird uh, pagan um, of the thinky thinkers. And of course, on his Wikipedia, oh, I got to get into the NPR lady and, and how she ran Wikipedia and Wikimedia for a while. Oh, didn't care God. about lying on the stuff. And what does truth matter? Yeah, he wrote this book, Bronze Age Mindset, in 2018. And so between him and Mencius Molebug, and so this guy is the guy who coined the term the longhouse. So um, I was borrowing from it, not that I agree with everything Brian Jake Perry ever said. Because, um, but, Thanks for the disclaimer. Yeah. <laughs> but um, if you listen to that whole entire podcast, he's a Nietzschean and the pagans of the right wing world, they all become Nietzschean. And what they say is that the Christians are too weak. The Christians are a bunch of uh, too wussy to keep out the uh, the barbarians. And so like, here's a uh, 
here's Uber Boyo, who is also a Nietzsche, and he has that Nietzsche channel and talks about Schopenhauer a whole lot. And uh, he's bouncing off of this post of a bragging Islamist who says to Tommy Robinson, Tommy Robinson says, uh, he's talking about this random, I guess, uh, I don't know, some what, what do you call somebody who's a leader in the Muslim world or in India? But he Imam. goes, oh yeah, he's Imam. He says he was a Nazi, um, butchered, killed, and raped. He raped, him. oh, he's talking about Muhammad, but um, this to this Imam. He was a he was an aunt who butchered, pillared, and raped. He raped a nine year old. Those of us who've taken the time to read it and research the barbarian know exactly who he was. Oh, that sounds a little so bit. So is this like, woke Islam? No, 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 no. This is just basic Islam. There, there's oh. also this other woke Islam world that's kind of more left Islam that's kind of coming lost. I mean, up. there's queers for Palestine. That's yeah. No, but yeah, like some Islamists got in the fight or just some back and forth with Tommy Robinson. And said, Islam's the fastest growing religion in the UK, fastest growing religion in Europe, fastest growing religion in the world. Cope while choking on your bake, bacon sarni. Oh, oh Tommy wow. Robinson said he was a Nazi butcher. But I was confused. Yeah. Okay. So they're bragging that, that Islam has taken over Europe. Oh, right? yeah. Well, like, I mean, I, I told you guys this, like, I mean, you know, just my experience. Like, I stayed two nights in uh, West London in Hounslow. Which I found out later. Like, I didn't know this. You know, I just booked my hotel. And by the way, like, I'm Mr. Diversity. I had a blast while I was there. But I stayed in a hotel run by Indians. I went across the street where I bought Chablis from a shop run by Indians. I walked two miles to a chemist to buy uh, hydrocortisone cream from a pharmacy run by Indians. And then I got fish and chips and the kebab from a place run by Indians. And the entire time that I was in Hounslow, London, I did not see. Me and my son were the white people. Yeah. Right, like when I went into Soho, there was a lot of white people, you know. And then like Chinatown had white people; they were the tourists. But like Hounslow, like West London suburb. But I found out later, like I looked it up, but I found out that it was like the least white um, borough of London, you know. But like you know, because like and those things, like again, like I love diversity. I don't mind. I don't mind people immigrating just uh, like on its own. I'm all for it. But when people talk about like the alarmingness of how not English London is, I mean, I went there for two days and holy shit, they are not exaggerating. It is not English there. Hounslow <laughs> is an Indian neighborhood. Yeah, and they say there's other cities that are just completely overrun too with them. Um, I heard, uh, oh, I forget which city it was. Anyway. Um, no, I... I know Actual Justice was... Warrior just did a couple of videos today on the fake asylum seekers here and and them in New York City just basically have overrun Central Park and all that sorts of stuff. It's not like we aren't experiencing our own strange death of Europe. The same thing that uh, yeah. Douglas Murray was talking I don't about. Like, there's like this is one of those things that makes me so crazy about like the way the left views this conversation, right? Because like I found out recently. And in fact, I'm really excited. I got to save up some money and do it. But I guess my little sister did all kinds of legwork and preloaded my information into the database. So all I got to do is throw about a thousand dollars at the Republic of Portugal, and I will be a European. <laughs> like, and actually, and I'll have a passport, and I can live and work in Europe freely without restriction. You know, it's like I fucking love immigration. Like, ha exactly half of my nuclear family are immigrants. You know, and a, I have Wait, a you lot can just of be like, uh, Let's say, go is ahead. that how it works? You can just be a European. You're not like yeah. So European like a, Union, like, like I don't know. So you're, Brexit, you're not like, British. I guess. I guess like yeah. Kinda, so England, like the, speaking, they probably the have UK to is that out. Way. The UK Brexit ended that. Like that's the thing that annoys me because like you know I'm trying to immigrate to the UK. And so you're if not I was British, Portuguese, you, you would just yeah. be. If I was Portuguese, but if Brexit hadn't passed, if I got my Portuguese passport, I could live and work in the UK without restriction. But because of Brexit, that's not an option. But I can live, work, and travel Italy, France, Germany, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Poland, uh, Sweden. Sweden, they're still on the kroner, aren't they? I guess I don't know. Risto might know that. He's a Finn. Um, but yeah, like I'll I'll be a European, and I and I plan to go to Europe and take their jobs. I'm gonna take their jobs. 
you know, like I'm all for immigration in the principle of people going places, you know, but like, which is not, but like, that's the thing is like unrestricted immigration is not that thing. Like that, that thing that people like to talk about, like, well, I'm looking for a better life. Like, that's why I want to go to Europe. I want to leave America for a life that's better for me. That's the idea. But I'm going to go through the proper channels. I'm going to pay my $1,000. I'm going to do the thing. I'm not going to pay a Tunisian gangster $30,000 and hope that I don't die on a truck in the channel, you know, which is the way most people get to England nowadays. Yeah, and the thing, actually, just as Warrior talked about what's happening over here, and I, this is not just like hearsay scene. I've witnessed this first one. There's major amounts of asylum lying going on. So Everybody's much. a Venezuelan who's seeking asylum. No, they aren't. <laughs> and I've met them. Oh. I've met everybody who says they're Venezuelan and have this name because they're a Venezuelan asylum. No, you aren't. I know. May, I'm, maybe there's one or two I've come across. And my ex, my ex girlfriend was actually one who really had a father who was part of the opposing party down there. Yeah. But he came several. He was years. in the judiciary, right? Like he was a yeah. conservative in a position of power, so he was yeah. a target. But she also came years ago. The people who are coming now are, it's, they come in, I, I catch them all the time kind of saying, I'm from Ecuador and Colombia, but I'm a Venezuelan asylum seeker. And, yeah. and it's just happening left and right all over the place. Yeah. And so like it's, all they, sorts of the benefits number and they're of getting fast with cards. Like you can tell that like, that's the, it's like, I mean, it's kind of similar to Brazilians, although... <clears throat> That was what from an older time, and I think it was Brazil. It's just because a lot of the costs are higher. But like the thing you notice, like with the the Venezuelan immigrants, like how many of them, like when you talk to them, and they have college degrees, like they are professional oh, yeah, people. It's a different. It's a different. Back in Venezuela, yeah. like it's a whole different thing from like, oh, I'm, you know, like the, but I the think poor is, immigrant family, you know, like I no, think these there is people, some that they said that in venezuela they released people from prisons and sent them over here i think there might be some truth to that because i've met some ruffians yeah. too oh um, yeah. but anyway so these nietzscheans start going after the europeans and the christian culture and it says the challenging question for the europeans what culture is capable of keeping out of out competing islam is it atheism christianity nope. a new christianity a new paganism come on mormons <laughs> this is your challenge this is your what is great challenge is what will drive a massive religion revolution mm -hmm. in the West? A neo-pagan revival? I don't mean this is a rude jibe at Christians. Christus Rex, I'm asking hard questions. Consider Islam wow. empowers male instincts in an absolute sense. Brotherhood, male privilege, multiple wives. Islam has the old restrictive on vice that makes a people powerful. Bans on debt, financing, usury, strong sexual taboos, anti-alcohol. This hey. makes Islam, <laughs> Islamic men organized, ruthless, and effective. It is a great culture for men to wage territorial war in a modern society. Organized teams of men pool resources, buy assets, and breed like rabbits. And so did you guys see the um, thing of um, Andrew Tate coming out and criticizing the white men? You guys have all just basically signed your warrant to die because you're not boinking and having babies with as many women as possible. Um, have you met our woman? <laughs> he just barely said that uh yeah. yesterday and shapiro got all pissed about it but he's basically making the same islamic argument like you guys aren't having a bunch of babies and you aren't pooling your stuff together like us you guys are dead uh, andrew tate just basically said that just said you guys are dead it's over he says i have a friend from manchester who has watched a muslim family of brothers slowly buy up his whole estate while all his blonde friends are gambling and drinking christianity pedestalizes women in its current form but if it reforms and it might, can it really liberate male instincts as much as needed? Nietzsche is so seductive to men because he gives voice to emotions that are usually emasculated, passion for victory, willpower, and status seeking. The greedy and ruthless emotions are critical to incentivizing men to organize. Empowering them leads to a culture that rewards men for success with multiple wives, absolute authority, and no responsibility to get caught up in domestic life. Can Christianity, Christianity honestly provide this? It seems like a total reorientation of the church. Priests don't understand this. They are not warriors. The church has incredibly strong ability to assert a powerful future on these grounds. Hardline on sin, alcoholism, sodomy, and usury. A lot of the young people will be convinced if you tell them they are debt slaves to the elite who try to distract them through homosexuality and drinking. If the church presented itself as a sexual marketplace where they cultivated a community of girls and operate as the keys for young men to access them, does the church have the stomach for this? 
If it can't take hardline here soon, it's doomed. Pushed into a state of existential fear, why would Europeans take a hard turn? They feel pressured by infertility and being outbred by the races. This is a deep primal fear, and they feel shackled and strangled to combat this. Why wouldn't they take risks? A new eth ethnic religion, a religion of the race, this is what told all the pre-Christians religions were. The Roman religion permitted the father the right of life or death over his children. Why would men begin demanding such absolute authority? Paganism has no qualms about organized male brotherhoods. Mars, Wotan, Mithras, these are all warrior cults that liberate male instincts. Men who don't think this way will be outcompeted and outbred. The only wild card I can see in this is the technocratic atheism gets so powerful with AI robot police enforcing liberal norms that even the Muslims become gay communists and enslaved usury. Well, that <laughs> is their aim. Like that that's the, that's the exact strategy. Yeah. I mean, like um, Bronze Age pervert said all the crazy. same things in that video. He says there needs to be like some young men cult that that overpowers this or there's nothing going to happen and Andrew Tate saying the same. So right. there's this bubbling there's this bubbling from the right wing youngsters in the world like part of me just feels like i don't know like like he's got a point just like but instead of going 90 percent throttled in that direction like if we just like i'm more like what if we just gently correct course <laughs> that's know? the classic you're being the classical liberal again so both the, Oops, there both I the go. but that's what i'm saying <laughs> is that there's this big uh, spider-man pointy circle going on on the right that nobody's tough enough nobody's tough enough Except for the classical rivals who you really couldn't quite say are the right, but they're just kind of saying, like, how about we just correct what we had going? And they're like, you! <laughs> I don't know. Like, you! Yeah. you! Like, I just have, like, you know, like a, the abortion debate. You know, I, like I said, I have, I have that thing that makes everybody mad because, like, I, I, I don't like it. I, I think it, it would be better if there was less abortion. And, like, you know, and, like, if a girl was wondering should I have an abortion and she cared to ask my opinion in most circumstances I'd say probably not like my feeling is no but should you have the right to yes <laughs> like you know that's my whole thing it's like I I think it is bad but I well, think the abortion debate out is worse the debate is difficult you know and like the I was like like it's difficult because why is it bad well exactly but like like because this is like the argument I have with the maven types which is just like you know, like, I want what you want in the sense that, like, should abortion be safe? Like, should it be available and legal and private? Like, yes, I want that. Because you want that, I want that. But I want there to be less abortions. And in and and feminist dogma, you're not allowed to say that. You're not allowed to put any level of restriction whatsoever, blah, 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 blah. blah. You know, where it's like, that's thing, like, what I would like to see is, you know, People continue to have personal freedom, but it's okay to say to women, clubbing life leads <laughs> to pregnancy, and we don't have sympathy for you if What's you the, get knocked up. What's the link, you fucking, you fucking yeah. misogynist? Like, is there it's okay to shame? Like, some shame is okay. You guys are okay with shaming the fathers of unwanted pregnancy feminists are 110 percent on board with shaming all the way to prison if they have to to shame the fathers of unplanned pregnancy if that's okay then it's okay to shame the mothers of unplanned pregnancy you know like if all you did was get drunk put on a mini skirt and go clubbing and you ended up with a dick inside you i don't have sympathy with you because you didn't want to get pregnant yeah, no, there's this, this there's this woman that I, I call her my ex Mormon feminist rival, and she was talking to me lately. We and she's like, I normally don't talk to conservatives. I'm like, yeah, whatever. But um, and I was like, look, g give it two years. I'm serious. Give it two years, and I'm I'm not gonna be called uh like a bigot misogynist anymore. I'm gonna be called uh gay loving. Uh, race mixer and, and shit like that because it's common, man. Like I and see this excrement shit. eating protector. Yeah, yeah, shit like that. Where where I'm like, I, no, I it sh you shouldn't make it illegal for this guy to eat his shit because, like, first off, how would you effectively do that? But like, let him it, it, ew, but let him do what he wants, I guess. And the 
Like, the problem is, like, you see a lot of these people talking about how insane this whole debate has gotten with the, um, like, with the trans thing. And then they're like, see, we should have kept sodomy illegal. And I was like, okay, again, how are you going to regulate that? Like, if, if two, if, if a married straight couple is doing butt stuff in their own house, like, you're going to have people in there looking. And even if, even if you do, like, that's, yeah. that, that's so wildly illiberal to me that i'm like oh that's the direction we're going we are getting some actual reactionaries some actual sort of knee jerks and shit like that well that brings us back to this with the um this whole side getting upset at the fresh and fit dude who knocked the woman up and this guy is getting shamed into well he said that the lady should take a pill but he's getting shamed by brett cooper and the whole uh daily wire right many many more of them saying no, you go man up and have that baby and wife that lady up type stuff. And then, uh, of course, in the middle of it, they're all decrying the uh, the uh, no fault divorce stuff for ruining society type deals. And yeah, no, I I don't know. Like this one thing's like when when the male if if they're ever in invent safe, effective, cheap male birth control, it's gonna totally upend civilization. Like, can I don't you imagine think how we, like, I don't even think we feminism created. will not know what to do with themselves at that point. They will be completely befuddled because their single greatest point of leverage will be taken from them. We haven't really even there are a few things in safe <laughs> female birth control at this point. Yeah. No, you know the things like IUD. The IUD, like because I did all the research back in the day when I was worried about this stuff. Like I think for a lot of women, the non the non hormonal IUD. The reason this is important is because it's the effective. It doesn't yeah, like, do anything hormonal. It doesn't interrupt the period. Like it seems to the be copper like IUD. It, the, the, yeah, the not yeah the non hormonal IUD like statistically seems like as far as like most effective, fewest side effects, doesn't fuck with your hormones. That seems to be a good one, and it's reversible. Anyway. That's this message brought to you yeah, by Planned Parenthood. That's, that seems to be the best one. It it does. I, I don't know. I, I think there's some concerns with like copper poison. I, well, I know that comes up. Like that's one of those things that comes up. But like I kind of feel like it's like uh, sulfites in wine or MSG in Chinese food, where like enough people make noise about it that they're obliged to say like we looked into it and there's no there's no statistical significance there, but people are worried about it, so we're going to mention it. But yeah, I don't know. That's I don't know. That's weird. But yeah, like if they actually ever get to the point where like men can actually control their fertility, like holy shit, that's gonna that's really gonna throw a monkey wrench into the machine. Yeah. But all right, go ahead. Um, this is just showing the Andrew Tate thing, just the receipts on that. A lot of young men are falling into this sort of stuff. There are a lot of people. Obviously, he has. He's very popular. So Andrew Tate got a lot of blowback for this, and then he plays the dumb game that is played on X all the time. The dumb game goes something like this. Again, this is the, it's such a gaslighting game. He's going to say two things, both transgressive. One true, one false. Then when you attack... Oh, that's later. I'm, I think this is the... Uh, these, are, these are his posts right here. There it is. Now they tell you they don't want any more kids. Dear white men, you're effed. I think it says you're being replaced because none of your you have children. Even those of you who I, I don't know what they're bleeping out about the replacement online, like little girls don't find the gumption to. I think it's F again. I see white men bragging about having five kids as if it's an achievement. LOL, five per year, right? Oh, all you white boys lost control of your women and now they won't accept multiple wives anymore. Now they tell you you don't want any more kids. One's enough. I think is that the whole thing? Soon your race will be nothing more than a few pages in a history book. A lesson on what happens when you F the female psyche so hard they're obsessed with money and social media as opposed to being one of many baby factories for a king. 30 <laughs> children minimum for the dons. White people, go talk to your best friend, wife, about what to do this weekend. Maybe you can take a nice walk around Ikea. Enjoy extinction. Don't treat your wife like a person that will cause the extinction of your race. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you wrote it down. <laughs> uh, 
I just, I'm, I'm just, I got to take notes. <laughs> Sorry, Morgan. <laughs> we were friends, but that's, I've been weak. You are a baby factory. Andrew Tate. I think Andrew Tate is a psyop at this point. Like he's, yeah, I think it is. He's all of, of the, he's like all of the fucking things that feminists pretend that we are, you know, they're like, Oh, you guys just think women are baby factories. I'm like, no, we don't. And they're like, well, look at Andrew Tate. And I was like, he does, but he's fucked in the head. <laughs> yeah. Did, isn't he like, wait, he's, he's on Romanian trial. Is he on like on Romanian house? Yeah, he went in and out twice and he keeps getting released. I don't think it's a, like, I, I mean, cause even under a Romanian law, like, I don't know. Alpha Chads, Alpha Chads don't let prison contain them. Okay. Like, cause I'm just guessing that like, like, I don't know. I mean, assuming that they have an adversarial, uh, system, not entirely unanalogous to ours. I'm just going to guess that Andrew Tate has 10,000 text messages from every one of these girls saying, may I please suck your dick more, Mr. Tate? Mm -mm. I, I love this arrangement we have. And, you know, it like, probably I have happens this, according to home math. But. I have this persona that I always put on at work, and it's basically Andrew Tate, where like I'll, I'll ask these absurd hypotheticals, right? Like I'll... I'll go up to these guys while we're working. I'll be like, hey, if you were straight, who's the one woman you would sleep with? And I was like, I am straight. And I'm like, huh, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. Just, just let's pretend that some parallel universe, you were a straight man. And and they, they always try to be like nice about it. And then they're like, my wife. And I'm like, that's the fucking gayest thing you could have said. <laughs> Obviously, I'm joking, but I feel like that's what Andrew Tate is. Anytime he's like, Anytime you're like, I'm in love with my wife and I, I'm only going to have sex with her. But you're fucking gay, man. Are you fucking gay? I, so this is... We have a commenter that says about Andrew Tate. He's just a loser. Or he's a loser just like Shapiro. Shapiro's a loser? What? Like... Like that guy. Well, both of them have tons like, of money and tons of women and stuff. But like, what are we judging? No, I just mean like, like, I mean, Shapiro's a guy like where it's like that's the guy like he his he's he's one of those guys like I envy where he's like he has his goals, he he achieves his goals, and he just puts all the pieces together. Like the thing that I don't envy about um guy like Ben Shapiro is that like he's not allowed to ride an elevator on Saturday. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, but like, but like everything he else, he does like. Models is see, right man. here. Uh, his his company and his stuff and all that stuff. But boy, oh boy, is that guy saber rattling right now about we should just march right into World War Three. We should fight Iran. Yeah, we yeah, should just take him on. I wouldn't. I wouldn't call him a loser, but I would. Uh, I would definitely oh, say oh, no. he's spazzing out right now. Yeah, I don't like this whole thing. It's tough because like I understand the Jewish Israeli position just in the sense that like because i mean they have to be in the most like gaslit kafka-esque nightmare in that like because you know it was my birthday i know the day because it's my birthday was the day that israel was founded and every single one of their arab neighbors vowed to god to destroy them and then like the decades have gone by and we had, you know, the six day war and the 1967 war and um, the, the, what is it? The, the Khartoum declaration, the three no's, no peace, like no Israel, no peace, no negotiation. And like every one in the Middle East signed this. It is in the Iranian, like the destruction of Israel is in the Iranian founding documents like H Hamas has declared it their God-given mission to continue in armed struggle until there are no Jews in Palestine. And the most recent poll done by the AP showed a 90% support for Hamas amongst Palestinians, including Palestinians in the West Bank, not just the Gazans, right? And like, because like, and I just like, I know that Israel is just imagine like, okay, the West, like, hey, Britain, hey, Britain, hey, America, hey, Britain, hey, America, hey, Russia, hey, China. Can you guys all just come together and say, look, guys, you need to drop the no. You've got to drop the three no's. You've got to change those to yes. Yes, Israel. Some kind of Israel. Yes, it's okay to negotiate, you know, and yes, peace. But that's the thing. It's like, that's why I understand Ben Shapiro's craziness. 
because the average American, especially the American, average American lefty, gets listens to NPR and MSNBC and CNN, and they don't, they've never heard of the three no's. They think that Hamas is fighting colonialism. Mm -hmm. They don't know that Hamas is a Salafist, Islamist, terrorist well, organization. We had on April 15th, we had all the cities get shut down by the marchers and all that stuff. But Shapiro's ready for just the fight now. Like, let's do the fight. And, and he's for well, yeah, sure that's there. No good. He's but, like, for sure think, there. But, and this is the thing that scares me about Shapiro is because, like, I don't know, Shapiro's because Shapiro is an Orthodox Jew, and I don't think he's the atheist kind. I think he believes in an Armageddon. You know, yeah. like that's oh, yeah. the scary thing about a guy like Shapiro. You know, this thing's like, you know, like this is where, like, I, I, I also wish Shapiro would back off, but I like that's the thing. It's like I do understand the the Israeli sympathetic position of like if only the world would like just like I mean you know like like Chris you know you say for years like you're just saying like all you wanted was for people to fucking read the Judith Butler the Foucault like just just look at what these people put down to say about themselves like and I have that whole thing about Hamas and Hezbollah where it's like. They have websites. They translate them into English. They want people to know what they believe, what their motivations are, and why they are doing the things they do. They want people to know it, and you can go read it. And my experience is that almost no one in America has any idea what Hamas has to say about itself. Like NPR is speaking for Hamas. And they're calling them an anti-colonialist resistance group. Like, oh my God, get a fucking grip. Hamas has genocidal aims against Jews, plain and simple. Anyway. Well, that's a good time to... I guess yeah, I'm Ben Shapiro. <laughs> to move into... No, I mean, I, I, I like Shapiro right up until the point he says, you guys help us do the war now. And that's like the one... Yeah. Okay, like, now I'm on the train. Like, for me, like, like, to start the war now, no. But like, if... If the West brought the political pressure to bear to say, listen, Hamas, Palestinians, Arab Muslims of the Middle East, the 20% of Arab citizens of, of Israel right now who live as full citizens in full rights with full rights in Israel, they are the model to follow. Have peace. Have Palestine. Have two states. You know... Like you can have peace, but like this thing that's this is the thing. Hamas does not want peace. They want to install an Islamist caliphate, basically, all over what they call Palestine, which leaves no room for any Jew in the Middle East. Yeah. So those same NPR people who are all about the Palestinians and all that stuff. I guess there was a major debate last night between Dennis Prager and Dave Smith and Jenk Uger. I, I want to watch it, but I haven't seen it yet. But um, Peter Bogosian, the, that terrible classical liberal here pointing out mm -hmm. the uh, new CEO of NPR, the, the Palestinian Lava, um, and Vivek Ramasamy pointing to her take on truth. But the hard things, the places where we are prone to disagreement, say politics and religion. Well, as it turns out, not only does Wikipedia's model work there, it actually works really well. Because in our normal lives, these contentious conversations tend to erupt over disagreement about what the truth actually is. But the people who write these articles, they're not focused on the truth. They're focused on something else, which is the best of what we can know right now. And after seven years of working with these brilliant folks, I've come to believe that they are onto something, that perhaps for our most tricky disagreements, seeking the truth and seeking to convince others of the truth might not be the right place to start. In fact, our reverence for the truth might be a distraction that's getting in the way of finding common ground and getting things done. Now, that is not to say that the truth doesn't exist, nor is it to say that the truth isn't important. Clearly, the search for the truth has led us to do great things, to learn great things. 
But I think if I were to really ask you to think about this, one of the things that we could all acknowledge is that part of the reason we have such glorious chronicles to the human experience and all forms of culture is because we acknowledge there are many different truths. And so in the spirit of that, I'm certain <laughs> that the truth exists for you and probably for the person sitting next to you. But this may not be the same truth. This is because the truth of the matter is very often for many people what happens when we merge facts about the world with our beliefs about the world. So we all have different truths. They're based on things like where we come from, how we were raised, and how other people perceive us. I, I just shouted into the mute, but like, this woman belongs <laughs> in a booth at a fair with a sign that says psychic readings. <laughs> like, that's, that's all the substance that she has to offer. Just platitudes. Good God. We all have different truths. What do you talking about there many truths like what are they? many truths like you mean there are different things that are true or there are different there are truths different that things really that apply to one thing well that's the problem like, I... it's true that the moon is made of rocks and it's true that it's cheese these are different truths or what what are you talking about lady it's, yes it's, well, it's 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 fucking deepak the... chopra but she runs a publicly funded news organization <laughs> What a world. I used so, to wonder how that's, Nazis happened. That's and then I my... saw that lady give a TED talk. <laughs> would you, would so you that's like one of my beefs more? with um there's gotta be like a there's gotta be a word for this when they uh they say a thing and they explain that thing, but th they know that it it sounds differently in your mind, right? So when when they say that there's different truths, right? What they're really saying is that people hold different opinions about reality like your perception yeah. of reality is different than mine a mormon's perception of reality is that joseph smith was a prophet my perception of reality isn't but there's actually only one truth he either was or he wasn't right and yeah. and so it's anytime they say this um they're trying it's this it's this weird fuck fucking mind game because they're trying to say that perception of truth are different but they know that your mind is going to ingest that and say oh there is no real truth yeah does that make any sense i i'm i'm trying to word this the right way because i i was explaining this to morgan the other day when i she one of her one of the people she listens to was talking about how like oh the first thing you need to do in therapy is to validate somebody let them know that their their feelings are valid and I was like, what does that really mean? Your feelings are valid. Because if you really boil it down, all it means is that your feelings are real feelings. Like you're, you're actually, yeah, yeah. I trust <laughs> that you're actually feeling your feelings. That, that's right? the whole that's argument I've got to do with that, that but guy about not, and stuff. But, like his but whole thing is not like, not actually what? how people's yeah. brains interpret that. Because you might be saying that, but people's brains interpret it that, no, my valid means correct. My feelings yeah. are correct. So yeah, I got into that whole thing with Seth. What is meant and what is interpreted. Because he's like, you know, because like his whole thing seems to be resting on like, look, like people who people who say they are trans are experiencing a psychological condition in which they believe they are trans. Therefore, trans is real. It's like, okay, that's no, where we're having like, that's where we're breaking that down. Their truth. Like, yeah, yeah, like, yeah I, like, okay, that's their I truth. I hate the same talking. talking with like a woman who she pulled up some statistics that like, well, women get attacked at night or something like that. And she goes, this is why women are more afraid than men at night. And I validated that. I believe women are more afraid than men at night. But if you pull up the attack statistics, men are far more likely to get attacked. But I bet you it is a truth that more women are afraid of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't oh, know. Yeah, I mean, you, you're less likely to be able to fight back if you're a woman. I understand that. But, but even beyond that, like there's probably more of you that have like the type of, I mean, as Peterson points out, the yeah. big five personality traits that have the, the neuroticism, don't say that word, James, the more of uh, <laughs> being very, very afraid of the possible statistics out there. Uh, but on yeah, paper, no, I, men should be more afraid because it happens more often. Because uh, that's one of those things where like, because I think about it, you know, growing up, like times when, you know, 
my whatever my mom was out of the picture for whatever reason she was away and so like you know when i'm six seven eight nine years old whatever it is like asking my mom can i go do this versus asking my dad can i go do this whereas like my dad was just like whatever yeah. go nuts you know whereas my mom was like are you going to be safe are you going to be back are you going to screw around you're not going to break commandments, are you? You know, like, <laughs> and like my mom was erratic. Whereas my dad, like, looking back, like, dad, you probably should have shown a little bit more, like, like, ask, like, where are you going? What are you doing? Like, these really basic things. But like, my dad was just like, okay, go nuts. Bye. See you later. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, yeah, it's like, but that's the thing. Like, there are trade offs. There are no solutions. There are only trade offs, you know? Yes. Like, so I got a lot of freedom. Because of my dad, and I probably got into trouble that I could have avoided. Whereas, like, if like if I only had my mom, then I would not have learned all kinds of things that you only learn by getting in trouble. Yeah, so I'm just kind of floating out some um, appetizers out here in the world as, as we get into discussing evangelizing, becoming an atheist or whatever, uh, once um, or an ex-Mormon, once ever... Um, Forrest gets here if he is able to get here but part of it is just like looking at like the complaints of the right of like the degeneration of the society thanks to that as they claim thanks to liberalism or atheism and they'll point sometimes more at liberalism or atheism even if they're allied against them they'll blame on that the wokeness of the world and the degeneracy and the postmodernism they'll blame it they'll say that this started with you this started with you you guys initiated it this postmodern idea of truth type stuff but i'm just kind of also just kind of doing appetizers of some like the concept of truth is ripe out there a bunch of people are talking about it because of the npr thing i saw scott adams say something about it and i this other post went kind of viral that i have some stuff on it and then i want to talk a little bit like what you said about the trade-offs because Forrest likes to not not only in that post did he talk about like assuming who's got truth but then there's the second question of what causes harm or how do you how do you measure harm or yeah. happiness, happiness or harm. And so I, I'm just kind of and I'm not even saying one way or the other stuff. I'm just kind of uh, seeding the ground of all the stuff that just kind oh, of floats through my head. Yeah, there's Jared's doggo. Uh, let's listen more from this lady. I put a picture of her on Dog Spotting Society. Oh yeah, next with to a book a, of Mormon. Book of, yeah, next to a book of Mormon and a Bible, <laughs> because there's this dude that keeps putting a picture of his dog named Nix N Y X, and just wrapped oh, in like ideological stuff, weird yeah. flags and stuff. It was like this one is the is the bi gender flag. It's for people who experience both genders fluidly or not, and blah blah blah, whatever, and. And anybody who's like, what do you, this is a dog group, man, gets seriously booted from the group. So I, I posted a picture of her next to the Book of Mormon. Jesse likes doing morning readings with me. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got kicked out. I'm not sure. I haven't, I haven't checked back. That's funny. Most significant differences critical for moving from polarization to productivity is that the Wikipedians who write these articles aren't actually focused on finding the truth. I don't think I've seen that. Like Christopher Rufo went on Jag, and people claimed it was Rufo doing cancel culture, but he pulled up all of this lady's old tweets about being a complete lefty honky for all that anti-racism, all the Biden, all the everything, and uh, she's the one running the CEO of uh, our public money for NPR these days. But, but there's so much culture. stuff. Maybe cancel culture was the wrong way to phrase it or something, but yeah, I, I think it's it ridiculous. Feels like, it feels like if um, I don't know if there's a teacher that we find out is on like r slash pedophilia or whatever, and yeah, and he's not. He has it's never relevant. Acted on, he has never <laughs> acted on his pedophilia, his pedophilic desires, but like he is what I, I feel like at that point. Maybe you'd be pretty stupid to not. Okay, you you can't actually be a teacher anymore, buddy. It's so not cancel culture because like the the left always called it like taking responsibility, or whatever. But it wasn't that. It was dig deep for anything that seemed off brand for any sort of lefty or any joke that you could take completely out of context for positions that had nothing to do with anything. It's no, I know. Completely it was always like, different. Kind of mean. like like this guy can't be our our state our uh, city comptroller because at one point. 
he said a joke with the word chink in it. He he <laughs> laughed at a Dave Chappelle joke where he did a Chinese yeah. thing that everybody else laughed at. I mean, that's how, that's know, how like cancel it, culture got. You know, if, like, if, like, if I'm buying like wood from you and like you're a really good woodworker and making me these awesome sculptures and I, I find out that you believe that the Jews control everything, I'm probably not going to stop buying stuff from you. But if like I have to, if you're babysitting my Jewish children, I might be like, okay, no. Yeah. You but can't. if you're in charge like of our publicly funded media apparatus, it matters. It's not cancel culture, you ridiculous doinks. Mark Cuban called it cancel culture, and, and Rufo was exposing all of her old wacky uh, posts. And she went deep. She was, I mean, she's straight up yeah. like a freshman at Brown type post since forever. Yeah, yeah. No, like, yeah, it's like there's no paucity of dirt on this lady as far as dumb, woke nonsense. Yeah. Man, you know what's I'm funny? I was just thinking little... about, I don't know why, somebody said something that made me think about uh, uh, back when I was in catering and I worked with 10 million uh, hablantes españoles and uh, Sammy. There's only a couple of times that I caught him, like, uh, and I wish I could have been there for more, but he would do imitations of Americans like me speaking Spanish. And it was so <laughs> hilarious. I, like, and I like, I want to hear more of that stuff. Now, like, because, like, you know, the the part of me that's woke is like, I run to Chris at HR and say, hey, Sammy's a racist. I was like, no, no. It's funny when foreigners speak your language. It's mm -hmm. fucking funny. And, and, like, and like, I want to have, like, I'm so into diversity. Like, I want to have that little window and be like, what do Mexicans think I sound like? You know? It, the like, Mexican, like, you know how, like, we'll say ching chong ding dong ding for Chinese or whatever. Uh, yeah. The Mexicans will go when they're faking English. They'll go witty, 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 yeah, witty, 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 witty. Yeah, <laughs> that's their version of Ching Chong Ding Dong, whatever. <laughs> racist! Oh, cancel him! See, and cancel culture would be somebody it's like going and racist. pulling that up of me. And, yeah, not, not researching racist, this lady's it? history. Yeah, it, it's actually um you uh. I don't know if you remember this, but post-colonial theory is... You, have you read post-colonial theory? Oh, yeah. It's taught us you actually can't be racist against white people because we live in a white supremacist world. I, I, I'm i convinced they think we live in a white-dominated world. What are the world. lights in your hall? Do you, are oh, you, that's, is, that, is that the highway? Is that the train? No, it's... Is that a nightclub? It kind of so Morgan put up these her birthday, uh, she's partying. LEDs. Oh, in the back. well, no, it's she put up these LEDs that they're just always on our wall, right? And you can turn them off and turn them on, but oh. anytime, anytime the boys want to listen, I don't hear the train, I don't hear the train, <laughs> but it's going through your past your window. But well, so no, it's, it's actually just... like it's it's rhythmic anytime it hears like a, a like, watch, oh. <laughs> see it anytime it hears part? something, it uh, it freaks out so my kids are yelling in the background but it's it's fun for like music i guess because anytime the boys want to listen to music oh, i turn it I on so and it, it like, pulses with the music and they like it but it i forgot I to thought, turn it like, off i thought like you're in a basement with a bay window and like you happen to be next to like the light rail i was so confused <laughs> the light rail of idaho falls yeah <laughs> yeah i'm like wow that's pretty progressive up there monorail <laughs> which is the best of what we can know right now and after seven years there i actually believe that they're onto something that for our most tricky disagreements seeking the truth and seeking to convince others of the truth isn't necessarily the best place to start in fact i think our reverence for the truth might become might have become a bit of a distraction that Holy is preventing fuck. us from finding consensus and getting important things done <laughs> Don't Holy let the fuck. truth None get in the way. The truth isn't important. The truth obviously exists. It's at the core, or the search for the truth, is at the core of some of our greatest human achievements. It can animate and inspire us to do, learn, and create great things. But I think in our messy human hearts, we also know that the truth is something of a fickle mistress. Oh, she's a purity. The beauty of the truth is actually often in the struggle. It's the reason that we have so many sublime chronicles of the human experience, because there are so many different truths to be explored. 
Jesus and so Christ. in this spirit, I know that the truth exists for each of you in this room. It also probably exists for the person sitting next to you. But the thing On the is, subject the of the truth, what is your true hair color, truth? lady? Is that a thing that's and true? And this is because for many of us, <laughs> truth is what we make when we merge facts about the world with our I can beliefs see about the world. Each of us has our own truth, and it's probably a good one. It's based. Do you remember mm. going through? Did you ever go through a phase where you liked listening to TED Talks? Oh, I mean, geez, yeah. Okay, back they there were was a once time good. When TED Talks were like, hey, these are all interesting, novel ideas expressed by the top people in their fields. And then TEDx came along, and anybody in college could get on stage. And no, so, I know. So I, I remember reading about this this Jungian idea of liminal spaces, right? And the, the liminal space, it's the whole thing where like it's it's a doorway, it's a it's like a hallway. It's somewhere you're not meant to stay. It's a transitory phase of your life. And it's all metaphorical, right? Like moving from um, adolescence to adulthood, there's a little a little piece in there. And you're not supposed to stay in that liminal transitory phase. You're supposed to move on. But a lot of people try to stay. And the more they stay, the, the more terrible it gets for them because they try to maintain some type of a youth that just doesn't exist anymore. And... And I was like, oh, I want to learn more about that. And that was when I thought TED Talks were cool. And because I had listened to a few of them, I'm like, these are great. So I, I searched Liminal Spaces TED. And I found this lady giving a talk on how awesome it is to just stay in liminal space. And she, she just was, she clearly misunderstood the entire concept. Like, I barely understood it. I was trying to research it. And she's just like live in a liminal space constantly moving around and and like between all this and like that's not that's not what it means and it also doesn't work even if it did work that way i it was wild so tedx just they fucking take anyone like if 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 anybody tries to brag to me like i did a tedx talk i'll be like okay your your ideas are probably dumb man i mean sam hyde did oh. a tedx talk this this channel we talked about it years ago and we even did our little thing about um making uh what was it bingo bingo cards for watching mormon stories he made bingo cards for um for watching ted talks and basically they all gotten so woke this the scribe light channel that he just watches whatever random ted x ted excellence he calls it and uh <laughs> does a bingo card for uh, woke stuff and listens these to these are so good yeah. These are, I know this is the thing that, like, there's some things that I know that YouTube squashes. Yeah, and this is one of them. Because you have sent me so many of these and have watched them, and but I've like forgotten about them because YouTube never suggests them to me. Well, it's also I... a, a good way to catch up on a bunch of those TED X's that you would never, ever, 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 ever watch. But you can watch a bunch of them and see that they're real because you got kind of somebody doing mystery science theater and a bingo card with them as they're sitting there listening. So the Sam Hyde, the Sam Hyde TEDx, like that oh, was yeah. amazing. That, that, that's that's the um, grievance studies affair version of yeah, TEDx. Where like, sure. how do we know that TEDx is crap? Because Sam Hyde, Sam Hyde proved it. <laughs> Look at this. A uh, Mormon uh, award radio is doing debunking. She they're debunking. Uh, New York Times hit the piece, the uh, Mormon face ones. But that's one of the things I want to talk about. That same girl did a TikTok on a uh, Mormon voice, the voice of the uh, of the women at conference and all that stuff. Of no. course, because every mean, single ex Mormon, Mormon talks boy. about the Mormon voice. But I saw just today, I think it was Matt Walsh talk about the TEDx voice. And how do you explain, yeah. lady, that the TEDx voice is exactly the same thing as the Mormon yeah. voice? The, the statewide department noticing. the statewide department meeting voice is the same as Relief Society voice. What it's called is the Longhouse voice. Yeah, well, it it that's the thing. Like that, because um, like I know that Chris can remember from back in the convention days, because um, we we ran so many conventions for Magic Oil salesmen, and like it didn't matter that they were talking about money and sales and magic oils you could always tell when it was a mormon on stage because the mormons the well, mormons now, leading the magic oil people sound just like church mormons it's a it's remarkable 
Well, now almost TEDx, all of it almost kind of sounds like it. Like I said, Matt yeah. Walsh was just mar remarking on it today. Why did I all sign it? But this Ben Shapiro says that all of her tweets and stuff sounds like beat poetry. Here he is, here he is <laughs> doing that because Which her tweets read God like, makes them wear like beat poetry. She sounds like a Berkeley sophomore who has discovered pot for the first time and just read a little bit of Noam Chomsky. That, like that is what she sounds like. Most of the ex-Mormon like. podcaster. So, here, I here we go. Let's get, let's get he the sound in here. Let's do some. Like, he just said sophomore, and then Noam sophomore. Chomsky. Yeah, he does a lot. <laughs> sophomore, <laughs> and he's that. reading off a thing. I think he talks that way. He's got, like, a weird California accent and mixed with some Jewish stuff. Deep yeah. thoughts from Catherine Marr, the brand new CEO of NPR, one of the biggest news outlets in America funded with your taxpayer dollars. My brothers and I had some deep talks. We're each over 30 with real jobs and deep discomfort about what it would mean to bring a child into a warming world. <laughs> That's from March 22nd, 2019. Here's from 2011. With Elizabeth Warren running, there's finally a candidate for Dems to get excited about in 2012. <laughs> Holy Here's shit. one from 2012. Agenda for today. Do you, on do you remember Meet those 48 minutes when people were excited by Elizabeth Warren? Fawcett in a man's world. Critique the politics of representation. Scotch. 2019. Always trust structural privilege to show itself. She's like a Kamala Harris fortune cookie over here. This is one of my favorites. This is from 2019. Quote, anyone else love watching the credits at the end of a movie or show? Just to marvel at the diversity of names and surnames involved always gives me happy goosebumps to see the world scroll by. Okay, literally no one. No one has ever watched the credits on Marvel movie and been like, wow, look at the racial diversity in those names. Here's from 2016. This is when she's a racial justice hero. Quote, for the record, I don't usually fly business class. Just bored past it on the way to the back of the bus. She's like Rosa what? Parks gang on the way to the back of the bus in commercial class. And finally, 2017, I'm in Canada today where the sun is shining, healthcare is functional, facts are real, and no one is about to be imminently annihilated. That was 2017. I noticed the calendar now says 2024 and no one was actually annihilated. I lied. There's one more that I have to, that I have to include here. This is from 2018. And it's a handwritten note from her, kind of like Taylor Swift's latest lyrics, quote, what would a feminist internet look like? What would a black internet look like? <laughs> haven't haven't thought about that. Did did Shapiro wise enough enough to start letting other people write his jokes for him? <laughs> oh no, people have been writing for him for a long time. No, because no. he's just like I have I have never really laughed at a Shapiro joke. No, you know what? You know, here's the well, you know why? I can tell you why. We know why. Jared, are you ready for this? Because Ben Shapiro is the very Jewish head of a company. But look who he surrounds himself with, Catholics and Protestants. Not a single Jewish comedy writer is anywhere on his team. Because Catholics can't write jokes. Like, really? Mormon jokes? Like, that's his problem. He needs Jewish comedy writers. But all the funny Jews are atheists. So he won't hire them. <laughs> like, Larry David? Atheist, Seinfeld, atheist, Mel Brooks, atheist. All the funny Jews don't believe in God. So he's I don't stuck wanna... with Catholics, Catholic joke writers. What it can't get worse than that. <laughs> Who's the worst joke writers? You, you think Mormons. it's the Catholics? Mormons. Yeah, it's probably Mormons. No, I've had this discussion before as far as art. No, it's so as far as art goes, I've I've had this discussion with people that like Mormons are they are um, abnormally talented at directed art and abnormally untalented at creative art, right? They, so like directed art, like if you give them a piece on the piano, they can play it beautifully because all Mormons know how to play piano, oh, yeah. except for me. But um, if you, it's, it's almost like if you tell them to write poetry or to write a joke, it's most apparent in comedy. There are very few funny Mormons. The ones that are funny are very funny, but there are very few funny Mormons. And the the best part about that is it doesn't change once they leave the church. Like there's the 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 percentage of Mormons that are unfunny is the exact same as the percentage of ex-Mormons that are unfunny. I, you know 
because I way back in the days of classic Larson of in the Mormon Expression Golden Era, I don't even remember what episode it was, but there was some uh, some female guest that John L Larson had on, and they were talking about like Mormon art and comedy and why it sucks. And this lady said a thing that I think is true, and she said like part of what makes good art good is that it it helps to be challenging. And within the Mormon paradigm, you're not allowed to challenge, you know? So, like, you know, like, it's similar to, uh, uh, like, Ushanka show has a whole episode on stand-up comedy in the Soviet Union. And it's the exact same problem, you know, where it's like all of the best comedy challenges the, you know, the emperors of the day, which that's why comedy in the West is good, because we have free speech comedy within the soviet union and within the mormon paradigm is bad because you can't challenge things now that doesn't mean that mormons can't be funny because like for example um i had heard a story about my family because um one of my great uncles was a patriarch in fact like when he died there was a personal letter from thomas monson read at the funeral because just that's how close he was to those guys right and this guy was like the Mormonist of all the Mormons in my family. But then I, my dad told me the story about, because he was the patriarch of his family. And he said that, like, you know, every time he brought all of the family together, because not, not only was he the patriarch of the stake, you know, but I mean the patriarch of the family, but also like a Mormon patriarch of that position, that whenever they got together for a family photo to get everybody to smile, he'd say, everybody say shit. And <laughs> of course, everybody would laugh. Because this is like one of the holiest men on earth, right? So obviously that guy managed to have a subversive sense of humor despite being uber Mormon. So it's complicated. But again, going back to classic Larson, one of the episodes he did, I forget the name of the guy, but there was a guy who, like, he was pursuing a PhD in Mormon humor. And he describes when he stopped pursuing a PhD in Mormon humor because he was interviewing a bishop about Mormon humor, and he told a joke that was like, I don't even remember the joke, but it was a mildly funny joke that like had some subversive message about the Mormon control thing. And he described how he told the joke to the bishop, and the bishop went, <laughs> no, that's not funny. Right? And that's when he realized that, that's when he realized that you can't, that like, Mormon humor is oxymoronic. So like, I'm not sure what I'm saying with all that. It's, it's like I say, it's extremely complicated. Because, like, you know, my family was very Mormon, but it was full of very funny people. But they were also Jack Mormons in some ways. So and kind of subversive. Steve, Steve but, mentioned, he said, you guys are pretty funny. Word Radio guys claim to be comedians, but not that funny. And I would say that for Cardin and Brad, I will say I do think Kwaku has funny moments. Like, he, he actually has the ability to be funny. I don't trust him. Kwaku is... I think he's fake in, like, every possible way. But he, I, he is actually pretty funny usually he's quick on his feet yeah i don't know like Quaku is an interesting cat like um i remember I just recently i was listening to louis ck talk about actors and he he described he said a an actor is like a coffee mug waiting for someone to pour coffee into it <laughs> and that's kind of how i feel about Quaku. i don't know like Quaku is so charming he's so likable but like you say like he kind of just gives off this like he's he's this kind of trump thing where like Quaku will say whatever he needs to say to win the room that he's in now. Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah. that's, that's you know like that's. We... But I agree with Jared. He can be funny. Uh, oh, oh yeah, no, no. Quaku, like, well, like Trump. Trump is genuinely important. funny, but Trump is trying to win the room he's in, no matter what. You know, like I, I have the opposite problem. Where like I am willing to lose. <laughs> I'm willing to get thrown off the bus <laughs> to say what I think is true. Like, you know, Quaku and Trump shared that thing. Like, whatever the room they're in, they will say the things they need to say to win that room. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I mean, laughing at it, I mean, I don't know. I thought that the girls had a pretty funny quip, and then they reposted it all over. They said something this week that, like, oh, no, we're a cult so dangerous that the way you exit it is by sleeping in on Sundays. Uh, that, <laughs> that was kind of funny. That but, is yeah. funny. whatever whatever man wrote that joke is hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, obviously, no. She that that might be the only funny thing Cardin ever said. Falling asleep one night, 
It was like the last <laughs> thing. <before we laughs> and he passed it on. You don't and think then, the women could yeah. have done it? You sexist. Like, she stayed up for an hour going, oh my God, that's funny. <laughs> No, right, has this, I've had this discussion with Morgan before because she's she's talked about how it she is on the constant search for um a, a funny female comedian, and I was like, I don't think it's that women are cap are not as capable of being funny. I think that they, they have this handicap that men want to fuck them so badly that they'll laugh at literally anything they I, say. So they'd so be like, makes oh, them not aware of what yeah, they no, got to do. No, Morgan, if, if you don't act, if you don't exercise a muscle, it atrophies. Right? Does Morgan so, know about Diane Morgan? I, I don't know about Diane Red, Morgan. Oh, my God. That British girl? Philomena oh, no, Kunk? no, no, no. Okay. You know, Phil, Chris knows Philomena Kunk. You know Philomena yeah, Kunk? That's hilarious. No, we, I, we've like, talked about her on here before. The real I'm, name of Philomena Kunk is Diane Morgan. I'm yeah, pretty sure hilarious. Diane Morgan she's, is the funniest woman walking. She's just hilarious being today. stupid, but just she should. Um, no, I know. And that's the thing. She's like, brilliant. Has, she's so brilliant. Like so I Morgan realized has... that I don't I like we're married, so I don't laugh at things that aren't funny. And <laughs> so now she but she really, really wants to she loves making me laugh. So she's she's gotten funnier and funnier. Like we have this um we, we watch these terrible movies. That's sort of our, our thing. And sometimes we'll watch like terrible Hallmark Christmas movies just to like check off the bingo card like it's funny how how many things are predictable like we've got the one of the bingo card items is director's daughter but one of the things she pointed out the other <laughs> night <laughs> yeah no, it's and the director's producer's daughter kid. Can be, it can be kid. anyone right director's it, daughter it producer's be, kid yeah it can be like an 80 year old man it's it's whoever's the worst actor there that just doesn't <laughs> be there clearly but we were watching one like, like a couple days ago and she mentioned a new category where like the, the woman walks in the other woman, like the rival woman. And like, you can just tell by the look on her face, Morgan just goes, hi, I'm the bitch. And I was like, <laughs> oh yeah, that's a new category. That's, <laughs> that's a total, that's a category in all these movies. It's there's one, the bitch. Yeah. You know, it's funny as I'm like, cause I was thinking I've been like, it's, it's been in my head for a while and I, I don't think I'll ever do it. But I thought it would be fun as an experiment to make an okay, pu uh, an okay Cupid profile or whatever. Just make an online dating profile that was like, don't want to fuck, don't want to cuddle, don't want a relationship. I just want somebody who wants to watch Kurosawa with me. <laughs> like, and see if I can get any takers. <laughs> like, like, just sit on a couch and watch and talk about Japanese movies with me. That's all I'm looking for right now. But I, I wonder if that would even go over. <laughs> Um. Uh, anyway, uh, this is just Scott Adams commenting on the truth lady. Let's see what he says. Because I'm just <laughs> doing true stuff now. Unless there's more to comment on uh, unfunny Mormons. Taking the following stand. Because in a speech, I guess it was to the Carnegie Endowment, uh, NPR CEO said that she believes that truth is subjective. Um, or, or a distraction from the pursuit or from getting things done. That the truth is subjective and a, and a distraction. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but it, this is pretty close. Uh, and, the per, and it can get in the way of the pursuit of truth. I'm sorry, the pursuit of truth can get in the way of getting things done. So Gad Sad said, uh, quote, truth is subjective. Uh, unquote, is precisely the key tenet of postmodernism. This is why I refer to it as the granddaddy of all parasitic idea pathogens. Well, that's a lot of smart words in one sentence there, Gad. I, I'll have to hire somebody to explain to me in my sixth grade world what that means. I think I understand. All right, Elon Musk said, and now imagine if this is programmed explicitly or implicitly into super powerful AI. It could end civilization. And he says, now no need to imagine. It is already programmed into Google, Gemini, and OpenAI, ChatGPT. Mm. So that would be talking about the idea that truth is subjective and it can get in the way of getting things done. Vivek, along the same lines, <clears throat> said that uh, um, he quoted, quoted the CEO, CEO of NPR saying, quote, our reverence for the truth might be a distraction getting in the way of finding common ground and getting things done. And Vivek says, this gets to the heart of the cultural divide in the modern West, whether you believe truth is a priority or a hindrance. Do you agree with all three of these people? Gad Saad, Elon Musk, and Vivek, that this, this uh, downgrading of truth in favor of getting stuff done is the problem and that it's a basically an existential problem if you throw ai in the mix everybody agree with that all right i disagree with all three of them uh, vigorously 
as hard as I can. She's completely right. And you see it every day. Yeah. Let me give you an example. Abortion. Abortion. Take the abortion thing. We have uh, different opinions which cannot be reconciled. Do you know why they can't be reconciled? Because we'll never agree on what's true. Is it true that it's murder? Or is that not true? Or killing? Killing a human, I guess, not murder. And so the argument is over what's true. Is it true that you're taking a human life? Now, that can't be solved. Would you, would you agree that can't be solved? In, realistically. Realistically, one of those is right, you think, and one of them is wrong, you think. And, but it can't be solved. So what do you do when you have a problem that can't be solved? You make do. You do what you can do. So what do we do as a nation when we can't decide what's true? We compromise. And we, we just work it out. We just find some middle ground where, where the people who don't get what they want are not willing to stage a revolution. That's a perfect example of what she's saying. We're not going to agree what's true, but if we stop there, we'd never get anything done. Because we do have to kind of move past, let's say, abortion. And I would say that's just an example. I would say every one of our big issues have the same, same issue. What's true, we don't agree on and never will. So if you allowed yourself to never try to fix anything until you found out what's true, you would never fix anything. She's completely right. It is 100% true that if you think that you know the truth and the other people don't, you're probably part of the problem. You might be right, but you could also be part of the problem. If you insist that the other people agree with you before you can move forward. In the real world, people don't agree what's true, but often we can find a way to work together. Right? So um, she's 100% right. Um, Reality is completely subjective. How many of you believe that free will is real? So he's a believer in the uh, no free will thing as well. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Like this, this is where for me, like tolerance. She, she's also the CEO of two different truth organizations, right? Wikipedia and then NPR. You know, there, there's. She's she's not wild. supposed to be looking for solutions. She's supposed to be reporting <laughs> accuracies. Yeah, um, but that's that's the weird thing that happened when Trump came around is that all of a sudden all the reporters suddenly became activists. I mean that's that's our problem since going back. I mean maybe they always were, but now the truth had an activism that trumped it. Um, but anyway. So this um, this little article made waves in the dissident right as well. Um, and has enough clout to be aggressive, but polite about it. So what do I stand for? I stand for the truth and for nice things. The key moment in my intellectual life was my figuring out why the truth and nice things are often incompatible. I always suspected that was the case. It's not an obvious case. Most people will tell you the facile idea that truth, beauty, and good are one and the same thing and that they will prevail if we work for it. But no, it's not that simple. Nice things require collective action, collective action requires shelling points, and truth is a terrible shelling point. It just doesn't work. Hence lies. Pretty lies, if you want. The results are often ugly, though. Sure, pretty lies can make you a cohesive coalition to keep social peace, but that comes at a cost. See, the pursuit of truth is not just some aesthetic hang-up. To make nice things you need technology. To make technology you need science. To do science you need truth. So there's a conflict there between the pretty lies we need to make politics easy, and the truth necessary to keep the lights on. The best solution there is to pay lip service to the pretty lies so that we get nice politics, but we keep them isolated and not let them affect other parts of society, for example the economy, academia etc. But it doesn't work like that. It never works like that. It can for a while, especially at the beginning. The ruling class comes up with some pretty lie, but they know it's fake, and they know how to dance around it to get things done. But the next generation wasn't there when that negotiation happened, so they don't get the joke. They take the platitudes literally and use political power to enforce them, and they fuck things up. This happened again, and again, and again. It really is the history of leftist creep in Western political history. Um, time and money reading our shit. Well, Kaufman is doing a terrible job of understanding human nature. He doesn't understand why wokeism won. He thinks wokeism can be defeated by spreading accurate information boldly, which is just diluted. Again, his heart is in the heart place, and I commend him for his courage, but he's getting the facts wrong. He cites, as pretty much his only supporting evidence, the triumph of Darwin's theory of evolution over creationism in the 19th century. 
he seems to think that was just because Darwin was right and the intellectual classes were converted magically to the truth, abandoning their outdated religious ideas for Darwinism. Bullshit. Man, if it were so easy we'd have been terraforming Mars by the Roman Empire. Darwinism is true, of course, and perhaps the most important insight in the history of human thought. But it didn't win because of its truth. It won because it undermined the Christian narrative in Europe, and the intellectual classes of Europe had been fighting Christianity for centuries. Ever heard of the Freemasons? Darwinism spread like wildfire among European intellectuals because finally there was a solid theory that they could rub against those darn hated stuck-up Christian intellectuals they hated so much. What uh, is this? Who said, who, I, hate, I hate AI narrator, by the way. Yeah, it's the dissonant right guy. And dissonant right guys almost all use these narrators because they can't show their faces on anything. Um, but he like, also uh, comes down on Christianity, but he's got this just this last little bit right here. But this guy Spandrel, he's a pretty big name like um Yarvin or or those different types of people. But this is a another guy who's uh, on the right but critical of Christianity. But these are just more thoughts around truth because the whole world was doing think pieces on truth. Here's just the last little bit of him talking about how the woke elitists aren't going to buy truth like you want them to buy truth and you're, you're up in the night if you think they are going to. You have to understand power at the ground level. Ideas themselves don't matter. The second and third order level consequences of ideas matter. All the nitty gritty ground level stuff is what actually carries the day. Intellectuals understand this too. Why are intellectuals today woke? Because they understand power at a gut level. They know where the power is, where the money is. Do they believe in wokeness? No. What does the word belief mean, really? Have all intellectuals put effort into understanding the factual basic of hereditarianism? Fuck no. Do they actually behave in their personal lives in ways fully consistent with their professed woke beliefs? Hell no. So how can we say that they believe in wokeness? Belief is a mental state, and mental states can't be proven. Wittgenstein famously said that you can never know for sure if someone else is in pain. All you can see is external signs, which can be fake. There's just no way to know for sure. Belief is the same. People will say things. They might even do things. But belief is not something you can measure. It's what I call a bad word, a very misleading concept. I try not to use it besides its original, most basic meaning, honey why are you so late, oh I had to stay longer at work, I don't believe you, you were at the brothel again. So how do we make the intellectuals become hereditarian? Um, so the reason I'm sorry, go ahead. The reason I'm plopping through sort of these things is like I said, because of the NPR lady, these ideas and all these think pieces on truth are out there. But in the middle of it, there was, um, there was Forrest kind of going at the, the Mormons on thoughtful faith and he was going after them. You, did you see his post? I guess you don't see him flip, but he went after, he, um, he pointed out that, uh, that there was the story of this Japanese kid who it was on a, one of these podcasts. Maybe I'll pull the podcast up and just show it. Um, there was a Japanese kid who was going to ditch and leave behind his entire family and face all these consequences for joining the Mormon church for truth. And Forrest said, uh, this is going to cause harm in this kid's life, right? Do you guys not see that this is a situation where it would not be good for this kid to uh, follow the, I guess, the lie? Maybe he didn't frame it as a lie, but the lie that Gordon B. Hinckley was handing him. But part of why I'm pointing at all this is like all these ideas are truth are floating around. But uh, I thought it was a bit strange because, of course, obviously, all the people in thoughtful faith thought, well, he's going after the truth. Like he, it. What does it matter if it harms or hurts his life if he leaves Mormonism because he's chasing the truth, right? And um, so I, I basically kind of uh, came came in a critical way at Forrest, just kind of just saying like, well, you know, obviously whatever you presuppose is true is going to be what validates a doing something harmful, right? But then you get into this whole Sam Harris world of does truth and harm, like, do those have to be like fully aligned with each other? Like if you follow a truth, should it cause less harm? Uh, that seems to be a bit of the. Uh... I, I am, I'm really in a, like, I'm in a, 
combined with this stuff in that like yeah, I look I'm at my aunt and uncle who are the most like paragon example of Mormonism imaginable. Now, like they are faithful Mormons and they believe all kinds of things that I just don't believe. But I absolutely envy their lives. The things that they get to do because of their faithfulness to the church, like I don't, I don't know how much I can say because like they kind of have like they kind of have high profile. It's hard to describe. They're like PR missionary specialists for the church now. And like they've been all over the world, they've met all kinds of crazy people, they've done all kinds of wonderful things, they've got this big family, like they like everything for them. Like if like just if you just never even mention Mormonism and just describe their life, I think just about any would be like, wow, I hope that when I'm 78 years old, I can say I have the things that that they have. Like because I know I'll never have those things, not even close. Like, I I've got my miserable truth. The church ain't true. Oh, look at me with the truth and my broken family and not a lot of money. And I, you know, I don't get to travel the world doing cool shit. Like, like, oh, there are dumb Mormons who believe the dumb thing, and yet their devotion to that dumb thing has blessed them so much. And like, you know, like, and I don't have the intellectual dishonesty to be able to be like, well, it's just all coincidence. Like, no, no, like they're, the church has been good to them because they were good to church, you know, like it fucking worked out for them. Like now I just intellectually cannot believe in God, let alone Joseph Smith and all the other crap, you know, but that don't make me happier. That didn't make my life any better. No way. Like so, like this is this is a paradox for me. Yeah, no, it's, it's like a difficult. Them line chasing the lie worked for them in such a way, like that's like it's hard. Like I've joked for them. I told them to. The, I told my aunt to her. I told her directly. Like I have joked slash. It's the truth that for me, like the single greatest testimony to the veracity of Mormonism is my aunt and uncle. You know, <laughs> like like the, yeah. So I don't. I don't know if. He pulled it down or not? Because I'm trying to find the actual. Po oh, here it is. Um, uh, well, it's somebody posting about it anyway. Here, um, I'll come back to it. So, Forrest posted that the clip from that those two people that I'm about to show you. It says, "Great example of a case where the church is harmful from an exmo perspective." Uh, seconds 48 to 148. So we'll listen to that. Regardless of how you feel about the rest of the podcast, examples like this Japanese naval officer are what can provide motivation for being anti-Mormon. Putting yourself in the stories of an exmo, do you see how this belief is harmful? Apparently, this group is incapable of putting yourself in the shoes of an exmo. Uh, very, very enlightening. Um, so then, in the conversation and in the messages down below, um, he he has to say that he's asking them to presume uh, that you're an exmo. You know, so presume that that you think the opposite is true, right? And uh, so totally you can see it if you presume the opposite is true. But totally you can see the other side if you presume the other way is true. Um, we'll, we'll look at the actual video. Um, it's a difficult line to straddle because it feels like, it, yeah, you maybe don't want to talk people out of things that make their life better. But then if you start saying that truth... It, <laughs> A, a, a comforting lie is better than a hard truth, then you'll probably start trying to give people your own comforting lies and then you'll fuck them up really badly. Yeah. And so that's why I was like pointing at that NPR truth stuff because that lady says that, Scott Adams says that. And then, of course, all those other people are saying, no, the truth is just the truth, no matter what hurts or not. And then you have those different, distant right people say, we'll see hardcore truth like the, the stuff that has to do with um, IQ or whatever that sorts of deal. But these uh, leftist elitists, maybe, so Scott Adams is half saying like, well, some of those abortion people, and I think he's right, believe one thing, whereas the other non-abortion people believe the other thing. But there's that other thing's also saying that there's all sorts of those woke people who are holding luxury beliefs. They don't really believe it. They don't believe it. They just are doing kind of Machiavellian pretending a certain belief because that's the way power uh, swings right now. 
you know, um, but I asked for us in this situation, if he assumed that maybe there's a possibility that the Mormons do, or even Gordon B. Hinckley doesn't believe enough to where he knew he was saying something harmful to this kid. Anything you want to add before we get started? Yeah, I was going to read uh, something from a general conference talk. And this was in 1973 with uh, President Hinckley. And what was going on is he was in Japan talking to a young naval officer. And the officer had not been a Christian, but during the training in the United States, he had learned about the church and was baptized. So President Hinckley asked the officer, your people are not Christians. What will happen when you return a Christian and more particularly a Mormon Christian? The officer replied, my family will be disappointed. As for my future and my career, all opportunity may be foreclosed against me. President Hinckley asked, are you willing to pay so great a price for the gospel? With his dark eyes moistened by tears, he answered with a question, it's true, isn't it? President Hinckley responded, yes, it is true. To which the officer replied, then what else matters? So that's the story. And um, then, of course, like a bunch of people like pushed back on it, saying that, like, yeah, I left. I did something hard and difficult because um, this was obviously true. Right. And. Uh, so, I mean, it all ultimately matters on like, what do you what do you think is true or not? It's just like right back to the true question. So then I kind of go like, well, what's harm got to do with it? Real, really, I mean, I, I, I get in like a weird uh, question in my head about like how those things even really relate because just like Flip said earlier, there's there's no solutions, only trade offs. There's no if if Forrest is asking a Mormon to leave the LDS Church, how how would it not be the same harm that it would be asking that Japanese guy to leave his untrue traditions because maybe Mormonism isn't true according to Forrest, but certainly it's not like Japanese Shintoism is true or something like that. So and I, I, I think the way that I view this is the, the truth harm thing is the same way that I view the utilitarian versus deontology thing where it's, yeah. there's a lot of people who, who are deontological until they can't be. And then there's a lot of people who are utilitarian until they can't be. And I would say the same thing, that there are people who are uh, truth-oriented until they can no longer be, and people who are don't-cause-harm-oriented until they can no longer be. Yeah, and like, I mean, hammering home the paradox that I've been dealing with my entire life since I left Mormonism, is that, like, because, like, Mormonism made me miserable. I did not like it. I didn't like being a Mormon. I didn't like the cognitive dissonance. I didn't like the mind-numbingness of church. But also, like, all of the things, all of the choices I made in my life that have caused me the most pain, had I followed Mormon advice, I wouldn't have done. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, like... Like, so this, like, for me is the big paradox is because, like, yeah, like, I hated being a Mormon. And yet the things that in my life that I re regret the most were things that I did in spite of my Mormon upbringing, not because of it. You know, it's a paradox in my life, you know, because, like, like, I mean, this is the thing that, like, you know, again, with my aunt and uncle, like, I wish I could have the things they have. But part of why they have them is because they have faith. They believe. Like it's in them. It's in them in a way that I'm just not capable of, you know, like, uh, you know, like I, I'm really happy that uh, the Muslim God put it in like the fifth verse of the second chapter of the Quran is that some people are just made to not believe in God. And I'm one of those people, <laughs> but like, you know, and I don't, and again, like I, I, I said envy, like, cause you know, I don't want to be them. I don't want to be them because I want, I mean, as, as shitty as it is, I'm happy that I'm me. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I don't believe in God, and I don't want to be the kind of person who does. <laughs> yeah. But I can look at some people who believe in God and go, God damn, that must be nice. <laughs> but just like you you see the individual <laughs> problems flip, that maybe some of those things cause individual problems in your life, but you still 
uh, accept the choice that you made. I totally do that too. And I totally yeah. have remarked even on Jacob's channel, the perhaps individual choices in my life that might've gone better had I followed some yeah. Mormon rules. But I also see the societal uh, issue too. Like, like the bigger, you know, that's the same question those Nietzscheans are asking the Christians and the same thing those Christians are asking Bogosian. Like I see that um, the way Doug Wilson just put it this week is like, he was talking to Dawkins who says he likes what comes out of Christianity. He likes the carols. He likes the stuff. He goes, well, you like the fruit, but you don't like the orchard, do you? You know, and it's like, uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> and so this sorts of stuff is, I think between the three of us, it's all like a realm of, of us kind of going like, we're <laughs> seeing the big old problems and get it. We get it. Uh, I, Do we got you answers? like the fried chicken, you just don't like the KFC. Yeah, exactly. Like we we see the problem, we see the issue, we see the stuff. Or like Jared said on Jacob's channel, like I like living in a place where people put up Christmas lights and go to church on Sundays. I just don't want to go. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Um, well, like I'm so happy that people get together to sing church songs. Like I want that to go on forever. I don't want to participate. But I, would, I want you guys to do that. I would imagine, though, that, like, I mean, one of the things that we've been on about and maybe had some back and forth just through the texting with Forrest is just that uh, he would say, no, we got to be a bit more like Jacob is, like evangelical for Mormonism. We got to be evangelical for atheism and get people out of that because it's harmful, I guess. Because it's harmful is always the the necessitating thing. But then, like, I get in my head about what harmful is and i saw troy had answered this but here's jacob answering the answering the japanese situation thing forrest hansen here's an analogy to the video you posted earlier bob joins the boy scouts his family and friends disown him and his employer fires him because of this who is the bad guy in this it's not bob this bob is being harmed because he joined the boy scouts or is he being harmed because his family and friends and employers are intolerant jerks it's not complicated yeah, the analogy rack, the, the frame of reference isn't there, but okay. Uh, Troy pushed back on this one. I think so did Forrest. Uh, Forrest Troy is a good pusher backer. I, I don't like care Troy who the guy. bad guy is. If the Boy Scouts is a net negative on his life and is false, then I would tell him not to be a Boy Scout. If X belief is false, but that, so that that's these are the areas where I'm getting in. Like I don't, I hate to be like a a. Uh, what, what do you call it? Like a Socrates about all this, but it's kind of just more stepping back and saying, I don't, <laughs> nobody can resolve those truth things and those cause harm things. Like they're just too, they're just too, the entire universe is in there. Yeah. yeah. So there's I sort of some, yeah, there's sort of some religious yeah. wisdom in this where, where they talk about, like, no, like um, this is one of those I, things where it's like, guys, know, it, the, the just, religions, they like, talk about not judging because you can't determine who a good man is, right? And then you gotta like, leave that to God. Kind of thing that that somebody like part at some of point realized like, that we can't determine who causes more harm and and, and shit like it's actually difficult and it, it's I, I always try to get at this it's it's more difficult to see the closer to the line you get the further away from the line you get it's really easy to see like if somebody was into Scientology I'd probably tell yeah. them to get out of it like I'd, I'd be like no that that's def that's far enough away from the it's good for you <laughs> line it's not blurry anymore. Mormonism, I would say, is more good for you than bad for you, and it's far enough away from that line that I don't even try to talk you out of it. I, I just yeah. Want, so um, I, I want to get I swear, Jacob Troy, and Forrest to respond to this one. Sorry, go ahead. No, that's it. I swear, Troy responded to that when I'm not finding it. Go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say, like, I mean, like watching them fight. I'm just like, guys, could you watch original Star Trek and then have this argument again? Like this, these things you guys are fighting about, like they're old things. There and these, I think these all come down to the Thomas soul. There are no trade offs. Yes, are, that's, there are no that's exactly. There are no that's exactly right? how I feel. But at like, the same time, like, too, I'm, I'm like, which is to the hear... moral of like thirty eight percent of original Star Trek episodes. Th this right. is one of the weird things, <laughs> like with Forrest, is that like I bet you that Forrest and I view the world. Beside, like, beyond, like, what you should be evangelical about or not, I bet you we're very close in, like, how we view it, you know, um, uh, very, very close, like, probably, like, even more so than Jacob and stuff. Like, I, I think we have our conclusions are very, very similar. Uh, it's just how much do we go do about it, you know? 
Um, which is kind of funny because there was this whole debate. Maybe I'll post it up because I'm not going to listen to the debate, but there was this, it's almost kind of the same debate. If you see um, this right here, there was a, a face off of Christopher Rufo versus Curtis Yarvin. And these are two right wingers going at each other. And Yarvin is going at Rufo because Yarvin thinks that you should just duck your head and stay quiet as like a dissident right person. And Rufo thinks I need to march out there and make changes, even if they're small, even if they're incremental, even if all that stuff. And they had a great big, huge debate about it and kind of lit into each other. Uh, it's all done in AI voice. So I'll save, I'll save up <laughs> from that too, because it's only done in AI voice because it was all done written. And then somebody put it to AI voice, but I'll put this in the thing, but they went hard at each other, which was kind of the same question of how activistic should we be about our similar politics? We have similar politics and hate the wokeness. What should we do? And Yarvin says, don't do nothing. And Fruvel says, I'm doing something, you know, but I don't know if it's the exact <laughs> same debate, but it's. Uh, I just yeah. watched the last two hours of the Hobbit trilogy, and that's kind of what it's all about. It's should we, shouldn't we? Oh, no, yeah. we're doing it. Grab should the we, ring, don't grab the ring. Grab it? the ring, don't grab the ring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, are we fighting each other? No, wait, are we on the same side? No, wait, <laughs> why are we on the same side? Hang on. It feels it feels like eternal for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, oh, so I'll show you the. So full disclosure, I was a little bit buzzed when I made this post, and I was like, oh, I shouldn't even done that because I was out walking Charlie, and I was all buzzed up, and uh, uh, I'm not often like that buzzed up and out and about, and but I made this post anyway, just kind of teasing the concept of. Um, let me see if I can find it. Ooh, where the heck did I put it? Um, now, all my best posts are when I'm a little bit buzzed. I, I think all my threshold. worst posts are. Like <laughs> I was like, ah, I should have done that. I should just enjoy my walk with my dang dog. But um, let's see here. Uh, but of course, there was a bunch of different people who made posts kind of pushing back on it. Uh, yeah, you see this guy saying like, oh, 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 look at all these people who did the difficult thing for the truth. And mm -hmm. uh, but of course, all that difficult stuff would be great for the truth. And may but maybe there's the world of pragmatism of maybe uh, something good came out of it, even if the thing wasn't true. That's that's the curveball pragmatism throws into stuff. Right. Um, good can come out of the out of the adventure, even if the thing chase for at the end of it it ain't the truth or maybe what is truth we didn't you know the truth um here i go so i go let's do a thought experiment let's presume i have the truth and you don't let's presume that since you don't have the truth you cause harm can you not see in the thought experiment that it's pretty obvious that if you start with those assumptions that you can conclude that i have the truth and you cause harm check me um so it's being dickheaded like a little bit but I'm, i i think i think most of those those um Philosophical, philosophical, philosophical debates get a little circular like that. I don't, I don't know how they're not circular. Like, could we presume that that the way you cause harm is worse, and what we have is the truth, and so stop it? You know, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I mean, maybe that's just too obtuse of a of a view. Of it, like, like that. I mean, you know, I, I've talked about it before. But, uh, you know, I, I imagine in conversations with people like Maven and like you're sort of because like, you know, because Maven can be spoken to. We've learned that like she's willing to consider these things. But like the whole thing about like within feminism and ideas about like women's rights and girls rights. Right. And also their ideas about colonialism. OK, now let's apply this to Afghanistan. Like what's the worst thing that the Taliban gets to do what they do to girls or that we colonize them with a bunch of Marines, right? What's the bigger evil that little girls can be murdered for dating a Christian or, and they're not allowed to go to school or drive cars or play soccer, right? Or that evil American it's wild, Marine. It's wild at risk. That we let the evil American and British and Australian coalition of Western Eurocentric 
patriarchal imperialists go in and impose rules like you may not sell your daughter for money. You may not stone the homosexual to death. These are things a, that we are going to say are not allowed. Those right? are Eurocentric like, colonialist views, though. Like, yeah, weird, it's, weird it's based Eurocentric on white colonialist methods of view, like, Yeah. <laughs> you know, but like... No, it, thing, it like, actually yeah, blows my mind. Anytime I, anytime I talk about, like, to American feminists, like, I'll they'll talk about how we live under a patriarchy. And then I explain... Um, I don't know. I, I start talking about one of those states where women like can be stoned to death for having sex or whatever. And they're like, yeah, patriarchy is a bitch, isn't it? And I'm like, how would you possibly use the same word to describe these two different things? <laughs> you know, you're using patriarchy to describe the, the murder culture that slaughters people for premarital sex or for not screaming loud enough during a rape or for, whatever possible like throwing gay people off roofs you're, you're comparing yeah. you're using the same word to describe that yeah. as you used to describe america where you ha you can only get an abortion up to 20 weeks like that i'll never forget your, my own you think you're my sister, oppressed my sister uh, we had this exact argument she's like i'm oppressed and i said how are you oppressed and she said my student loans <laughs> oh and like, because here's thing the thing: that, is like the thing you voluntarily yeah. got into, like the no, thing like, that you went into tens of thousands of dollars of debt for on purpose. Yeah. And like, here's the thing: is like, and I, I mean, I love my big sister, I love my family, and I, I think it'll work out for her in the end. But like, okay, for one thing, if you are like, okay, I'm going to go get my bachelor's degree, and I'm going to do it on student loans. And boy, does that cost more than it's worth. That's one thing. <laughs> but in the case of my sister, it's like, okay, it took you 10 years to do the four because you kept changing your mind, which is okay. You're allowed to change your mind, but that all cost the same amount of money. And then also, like, you could have gotten a roommate or lived in a dorm, but you insisted on living on your own in private in a place where you could have your cats. Okay, you're allowed to do that, but you did all of that on student loans. So, like, that wasn't oppression. That was a bargain you made with yourself and the future, you know? And, like, and like, I'm sure it sucks now, but look, it, like, again, like, I'm gratefully for myself. I'm happy for her that it worked out because I think she got a good job and she'll be okay because, you know, she doesn't have kids. She just has the cats, and so it'll work out for her. But, like, yeah, when it's like, no, that that's not oppression. That's a deal you made, and it's a it was a bad deal, probably. You know, I mean, for a lot of people. And you, you, you could have done that smarter, it. you know. But, like, yeah, like, because I've, I've gotten screwed over over and, over and over and over and over again. But it, a lot of the time believe, it's because I did it. <laughs> I can't believe you're saying this right in the week when we saw the oppressive – NBA WNBA player get only eighty thousand a year and an eight million dollar uh, shoe contract. It's, it's bad enough that they let them, but like hey, the WNBA. What are they, where do you think the money's going to come from? Male NBA players are they are paying a subsidy to the WNBA and have been for approaching thirty years now. The WNBA has only ever lost a lot of money. And that money is coming from where? The WNBA. What's the WNBA? WN, or sorry, the NBA. Sorry, the money comes from the NBA. What's their product? Basketball. Who provides the pot product? Male basketball players. So male basketball players, once again, are subsidizing. Like, And here's the thing. It's like, as, a, as an evil member of the white male patriarchy, like, Caitlin Clark, Clark, God bless you. Like, you deserve the money you got. Like, if you can make it work, like, if people come out to see you, God bless you. Like, you're so lucky you get to play that game. And, like, I, you know, any ev my well, dream has only ever time, been like, to be a performer. Have... Like, if you can get, if you could make a living doing a performance, like, that's all I've ever wanted to do, right? Like, my biggest dreams ever was, was to be a musician, you know? Like, hey, Caitlin, you got the fucking dream. Now, like, are you going to be grateful? You know, and oh, like, I don't think it's her. Like, Caitlin should be like, left out of it because she's she should, yeah, been that's a true. baller. She be she's really it. good, and she's she's actually not yeah. 
Well, Dennis that's my thing. Like, being yeah. a lefty at all, she hasn't been whining about it at all and, yet. And yeah, no, 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 very fair. That's exactly right. Well, like, I mean, yeah, this she isn't directed at her. This isn't directed at her. I should say it's the people who are speaking for her. Because, like, look, you're great at it, and and you're if you get to make money at it, then God bless you. God fucking speed. Oh, well, imagine the whole being thing able to make by men. The whole thing is subsidized. Guitar. The whole thing is subsidized by male basketball players and male basketball fans. You know, like. Well, she's getting huge so endorsement actually, deals too, like yeah. huge ones. Yeah, no, I, that's well, yeah, good. but that's that's you know, it's endorsement deals like, in the same thing. way as Walmart I giving money to bad, You know, like I was. I explained this to to Morgan today when we were talking about the. I was explaining the um basketball disparity thing, and I was like, I actually feel bad, you know, for women's basketball players. Because it's kind of this, it is this sort of cosmic injustice that people don't watch you as much. Like you're the top of, you're the best of the best, but like you only get paid like a fraction of a fraction of what the male best of the best gets paid. And that's, that's not fair, but like, who do you go to to fix that? Well, no, it's like really I feel the only I've done my part. Like, here, here's the thing, like, complaining but not watching you. <laughs> like, well, here's the thing, though. Like, like I, I think yeah. you're reversing the language. <laughs> no, I, and I feel bad for you, but there's there's no way to actually fix it. Like, no, but like, you, it, what do you want the government to subsidize you? You want you want like, like a mandate that you have to pay your male and female basketball players the same? Because you, if that happens, I'm just going to start a competing league where my male basketball with well, its all, only males, and I'm just going to pay them way more like that that's all but, that's gonna happen but jared see you felt you fell into the um the feminist language trap because you talked about fairness because the fact is because it's totally fair that she makes less right like and for example again in my imaginary conversations with feminists like maybe I'm, right, I'm just saying because of i her, am because of her identity she well, can't she doesn't have the ability to make well, the but, amount and that, that's well sucks. this is what i'm getting at no, no, okay, but like but then I'm talking about fairness, it's because like you know, because like because I'm I'm six foot three and I'm huge. Like I'm the size of a football player, I'm just out of shape, right? <laughs> now I had like for example, I, I was just telling people earlier today, like my dad is six one. I was as tall as my dad when I was 12 years old, right? I've for most of my life I've been a big tall dude, right? Now, as a consequence of this. Women are always assuming that they have control of my body and asking for me to l reach high things or to lift heavy things or to carry heavy things, right? Like, and it happens all the time. And like, you know, back when my catering days, it would happen all the time where like I wouldn't be scheduled to work and I'd get a call and they'd be like, hey, can you come in and work the job? And I'm like, yeah, sure. I like to work. And I'd be like, I wonder why they called me. I wonder who did somebody is somebody sick? Did somebody call out? And I'd get to work and I'd realize it wasn't that anybody called out. It was that whoever scheduled the event scheduled five five foot high Mexican ladies, and there was nobody to load the truck. So they would call me in yep. to be the guy to lift the heavy things. Was that fair? Yes, it was no, totally we've, we've fair. It was a hundred percent fair. I've had that before. Fair. It's I always. It's call not it... equal. Like, was it equal? No, no, it was not equal. The little Mexican ladies didn't have to lift all the heavy shit. I did. Not equal. I, fair. I always yes, use it was analogy, fair because the I'm the size of a football player, and they are tiny little Mexican ladies. So I'm fine with that. And like, and and then when I'm in the store. Because, like, again, like, I don't, like, this is one of those things where people, like, just don't, like, they just, like, tall privilege. People just assume tall privilege. Happens all the time that people are like, can you reach the thing? Hey, can you grab the thing? Hey, can you do this? Like, and okay, I don't mind because I can do it. It's not hard for me, you know? Equal? No. Fair? Totally fair. Absolutely fair. Which is also why it's fair to ask the ladies to take their kids. Because you're better I, at it I than always... me. <laughs> sexist. I'm a fucking this is sexist. Probably one of the biggest reasons why I was turned off. I was turned off from communism the second I heard about <laughs> the second I heard the phrase from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Ooh, I was turned off from it. I was like, that. no, I've 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 actually worked with people before, and um I know that uh, like I'm unwilling to pretend that my ability is less than it is and that my need is more than it is because that's the way you get ahead in that type of system because we already are as a society pretty much 
like a, a, we're adopting that in our own like social because I use the example, the analogy of of the cabin that I, I, I think I've explained it on here before, where you rent a cabin with a bunch of friends. And there's a couple bedrooms, but um, you know, uh, Jamie you, needs you, one bedroom would, because she has social anxiety. Um, what? Would you like to see Richard Wolf discuss with internet bozos how uh, how communism society would sort out who gets to play the PS5? Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Final question to you, uh, Professor Wolf. Uh, under your system of worker cooperatives, would I still get my PlayStation 5? <laughs> Absolutely. You'd have to struggle a little bit for it. You'd have to talk to your fellow workers. You'd have to talk about the distribution of income. You'd have to compare your desire for PlayStation uh, against all the other interests of all the other people. It wouldn't be something you worked out on your own with your particular boss uh, in any way. It would have to be a democratic decision. You'd have to come to terms uh, with that the way you do with democratic uh, decisions uh, now in our society to the extent uh, that we have them. Uh, Final question. Jesus Christ. Okay, so I know how this would go is the problem. Because like I said, in the cabin, you rent a bunch of, you, you rent a cabin with a bunch of friends. There's a bedroom. Oh, Jane, Jamie needs a bedroom because she has social anxiety and she has to go in there when she has, is, has the potential of a breakdown. Um, there's the, then, there's a master bedroom, but uh, Fred and Annie need that because they both have IBS and it has the bathroom right next to it. They need access to the bathroom at all times. After that, there's a couple of twin beds, but um, I don't know, Greg and Tim need that because they have back issues and, and, and they need to be able to sleep on a firm mattress. Then there's one couch left, but Jason here, he he needs a place to put, he has sleep apnea and he, he needs a place to put his sleep apnea machine on on this nightstand right next to the um right next to the couch so that he can he can sleep through the night and that leaves you on a pile of fucking blankets on the floor because you didn't express any needs and so i i've always understood this i know how it would go in my worker co-op where we're trying to figure out democratically who gets to play the fucking playstation i'm never gonna play it right because they're going to be like, okay, well, who needs to play the PlayStation? I'm going to be like, well, I I will never need to play a PlayStation. I just want to. I would like to play the game. And 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 these guys are going to be like, I actually have like this special condition, right? I, like I have a lot of social anxiety. And the only thing that calms me down is playing a PlayStation. And I'm like, well, fuck, I guess that guy gets the PlayStation every fucking night because we're all going to vote. Should the guy who will die without a PlayStation get the PlayStation? Or who, or should Jared who just kind of likes playing video games sometimes, should he get the PlayStation? Ob there's an obvious answer. Well, that brings us to this, the package. There's package. always, anytime I hang out with people, there's always, there's always something heavy that needs to be moved. And everybody yeah. in the room has a bad fucking back. I hate it. <laughs> it's it's have you, so irritating. Have you heard about package cuck? <laughs> yeah, I so this not. lefty. First one was so big. This He's lefty older. on Twitter messages all of Twitter saying, so my neighbor in the apartment next door just blatantly stole two of my packages. He even went downstairs to grab the second one because the first one was so big. He's older. So I just popped over like, hey, I think you grabbed my packages by mistake. He goes, no. <laughs> and, and he goes, and look, here's my dilemma. This dude is weird, but also the best neighbor I've ever had. Dead silent. Never complains about the noise level. I record a VO show that requires me to, shut, to shout at full volume and has his windows blacked out, so I have the entire fire escape to myself. Again, very weird. He might be chopping up bodies in there. I don't know, but I don't want him evicted. I'm obviously not going to call the cops over paper towels, so I'm just like, I guess I do nothing. If, if he moved out, any other neighbor would be worse for my situation. As much as I try to soundproof my closet to record my show, I'm 100% sure he can hear me, and it's got to be annoying. I'm kind of trying to rationalize the fact that sometimes my package might get stolen. But that's the price I'm paying for never being bothered otherwise. Anyway, just crazy. He answered the door shirtless and was just like, nope, don't know what you're talking about. Actually, I'm really sick right now. Bye. Does he does he not know what a ring camera looks like? 
Yeah, what a so, fucking Chad. Oh my God. That neighbor is such a Chad. Yeah. He just says, Oh, sorry, I'm doing this. Uh, also, like, obviously by now he opened them. I don't want them back. I already had Amazon send out new ones, and like, I don't want him to pay me for them. They didn't <laughs> cause me more to get resent. I feel like this is the kind of post where anyone who doesn't live in New York will be like, call the cops, and anyone who does will be like, leave him alone. Blessed that he, blessed that he doesn't do worse. And I honestly agree. So I like, brought up like this. Uh, <laughs> you can rationalize it as you bought your good neighbor some groceries. Literally, uh, reading the replies to realize a massive social divide. Those who understand the pros and cons of community and the upside of valuing your actual quality of life, and those who are deeply antisocial and can only interact with the world through rigid and abiding and revenge fantasies. Um, so it brings up like some uh, other um cartoons that came up. This guy who, um, this is called Bike Cuck. And back in the day, because my bike got stolen recently. <laughs> I was pretty bummed out about it. But I think whoever stole it was probably more happy to get it than I am sad to lose it. The total happiness in the world increased. With a, with a little uh, chart describing it. So whatever. <laughs> and uh, so it gets into like the arguments of utilitarianism, of course. And he brings up this... Um, this uh concept of the utility monster coconut and, island bullshit yeah um the utility monster is this monster it's this idea i guess a philosophical I, oh, maybe i'll let him explain this one but i think all this kind of like stems into like when we start bickering about harm it's just like the happiness level in the world going up versus the harm level in the world going up to me they're kind of like they're no matter what, once we start arguing the Sam Harris harm thing, we're entering into a utilitarian framework. That's my view on it. Like, I, mean, I guess you could ask, you got to ask harm or something in a deontological framework. But when we're sitting here like comparing harms or measuring harms or adding up harms or, you know, does that really have to do with truth? Or are we in this world of the utility well, monster? Forms of utilitarianism. Well, I Consent actually... I actually don't trust anybody to be able to. I, I don't trust anybody to be able to uh, tally up harm points uh, objectively, right? Because anytime I talk about, like, every now and then it'll get brought up on ex Mormon um, spaces this whole, like, do you feel bad about converting people on your mission? I always say no. And they're like, well, it was basically colonialism. I was like, good. I don't well, know. Part of why I don't, I don't feel care. bad is I know because for a fact what that I did, like, there's a bunch of people of I knew around. in Brazil. I just sure, like, but I don't, like I don't even the ones that stayed, I knew most of them I'm left, like, but yeah. I met a bunch of even the ones that stayed. Like, let's even assume they all stayed. I didn't baptize very many people because I'm a I was a dog shit missionary. But like the people that I did baptize, they like they didn't have a community before, and now they do. Like Mormonism is a good in Brazil. I know that. <laughs> like it, it did good for these people, and I saw it. And I, yeah. I, I even see it now. It like they. It gave them a bunch of friends. It gave them a safety net. And I, I, so I don't trust like ex Mormons, especially to be able to determine the harm caused by Mormonism. They might be able to point out some bullshit, but there, there's that whole, the age old, I, I can't remember who brought it up, but um, when they're talking about like, oh, I decided not to join the Mormon church because this uh, evangelical pastor told me all the bullshit about it. And the guy said, "Oh, would you go to a Chevy to ask about for a Chevy dealership to ask about Fords?" And that's obviously a stupid thing to say, because yeah, if you go to Ford, they're going to tell you all the good things about it. But also, if you go to Chevy, they're going to exaggerate all the bad things about Ford. So it, I, the answer is probably somebody who has nothing to do with Chevy or Ford. But even they are going to have some type of bias. So it's really fucking difficult to try to determine the harm cause versus the like the good done and, and not only that i mean we're we're talking about a measurement that goes across th these guys on the uh happiness meter or something the harm meter it, it's stuff that goes across time across generations like does one thing or the other like l let's say this the japanese guy leaves his 
his Japanese family or something, and they shun him or something. But then those Japanese people keep breeding at the rate of Japanese people, and he joins Mormonism and breeds at the rate of Mormonism, and then he has way more family, and then 30 yeah. generations down the line, what was more harm or not harm? Maybe that's one of the results that happened. I mean, it's just, it's, it's like I say, it's too much of like the whole wide known universe that we're trying to judge there, and let alone if we're going to ask if the afterlife harm gets gets to be included in there i mean <laughs> let's let's see the utility monster be ignored if the utility of the act is high enough this is the utility monster problem and oh my god we're having the retarded philosophy of ethics conversation a utility monster is somebody who enjoys a specific resource significantly more than your average person Assume that your average human eats a cookie and gets one unit of happiness. Now assume that a true diehard cookie lover eats a cookie and gains 100 units of happiness. A true <laughs> utilitarian system would allocate all cookies to the utility monster, assuming no diminishing returns, because giving cookies to anyone else would be a waste of happiness. In fact, if a normal person has a cookie worth one happiness to him and stealing it from him would give him 10 unhappiness, it would still be moral to steal it from him and give it to the utility monster because the happiness penalty for violating his consent doesn't <laughs> overcome the happiness the utility monster gains. That is what's being appealed to in the Bike Cuck comic. Even taking into account Shen's unhappiness at his ownership of the bike and his consent both being violated, because the thief gains more happiness than Shen lost, Shen is okay. The problem with this view is that Shen is taking the position of the objective observer looking at the total system and all of its distributed happiness. But in actuality, Shen is not an objective observer. He is a subjective person within the system, directly affected by another agent within it. And his desire to be objective has rendered him incapable of asserting his own position against the person infringing on him. This is also the problem with package cuck. These people are cucks, not because their partner's fucking someone else or something. They are ethically cuckolded because they are incapable of asserting the moral legitimacy of their own subjective position against their infringers due to some appeal to an objective position outside of the system, which in reality doesn't actually exist because we're all humans with subjective positions and none of us are actually capable of floating above the system like some disembodied spirit. In other words, if you are not capable of asserting your own position against others advancing on you, no one else is going to do it for you. This is a problem with the broader left, socialists and progressives and Democrats alike. They are incapable of asserting their own position as good, even if that position is subjective. And instead, they appeal to a non-existent neutrality or objectivity, a move that leaves them personally in a weakened position. Here's some more examples of this. So uh, we're back to like, can we judge this stuff from an objective outside standard as like we're watching the trolley problem and we're some philosophers who are able to do that. That's I've talked about like with Marty and you guys before how Seth, Seth's a pretty big utilitarian and he believes that like with metadata, we can sort out what the good is based off of the most amount of input from the most amount of people. But it always leaves you as the outside observer, which in a strange way kind of puts you in God position rather than the person who's just inside of the situation, who's going to accept or the, accept the consequences of whatever decision you make, whether it's truthful or untruthful. And, uh, Obviously, Gordon B. Hinckley and that Japanese kid can only make the decision based off of what they think is true and let the consequences follow, which I also think the same thing with Forrest leaving Mormonism or Forrest who is able to convince another person to leave Mormonism. Go, go after what's true. Let the consequences follow. Maybe that consequence is your family will shun you or generations will dwindle. You know, Maybe that is the consequence, but if it's true, I mean, who am I to stop you from it? But I feel a little bit like a, uh, I get in a position, maybe it's the classical liberal position of just being like, oh, as long as you're not harming anybody else or up in somebody else's face demanding that they assume this or that or the other thing is true that they don't agree with or isn't or, or is not, have at it. You know, maybe I'm a Bogosian. Maybe that's weak. You know, maybe it's eat your shit, whatever. You know, if, you, if, if that's true for you, eating shit is is on the menu, you know. But uh, at the same time, too, I wouldn't like be the thing of like, I'll, I'll judge you if you eat shit. I don't have a problem judging you if you eat shit. <laughs> but I, yeah. it's just it's one of those things where it's like, I mean, I don't know. There's can you leave the others alone? The world. Leave them alone. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's like I don't know. Like I said, it's one of the, you're doing it by yourself or or with people who are on board. Okay, like, you know, like just that. Like, I'd I'd rather just you do that and keep it private than 
create the shit eating police or come and demand of me to do your thing or be or agree with or I'll agree with your yeah. thing if I agree with your thing, you know, but don't come scream or demand at me or yeah. of other people that I yeah. see who aren't in the place of, uh, like, yeah, like I evaluate or stand up to an aggressive yeah. push. And I, like, I'm not, I'm not erasing or silencing shit eaters because I think that's probably something that you should not do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, like, you don't want to erase or silence. I am. Yeah, I'm like, like, I'm like, I'm not. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not invalidating your humanity. I'm not. I'm invalidating I, all of it. I'm just full authoritarian <laughs> at this point. Fuck, the, like the shit eaters face the wall, comrade. I, <laughs> I'm going. Like, for me, I'm the, going full here's the line: the, 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 the crossing the line is when you become a donkey raping shit eater. That's yeah. Once you rape donkey. <laughs> This is well any any type of rape is really weird. Well yeah, obviously because that's a crime. I think you should be socially ostracized if you eat shit. Like I will, I think you should be made fun of because honestly like there's there's this whole like kink shaming thing like never shame somebody for their kinks and I'm like okay but like what if my kink is that like I have rape fantasies and and I find yeah. somebody consenting to pretend that I'm raping them. Don't you think that maybe maybe I have some mental issues that need to be fucking worked out. And they're always yeah. like, I don't judge kinks. And I'm like, Oh, come on. Like judge them a little bit. All right. Like, yeah, like judge the guy that says, I want to shit down your throat and rape you. Like that, that guy, maybe, maybe he's unstable. Maybe we should shame that like, one. It's like, well, like, okay. Like, like yeah, you're dead. Jeffrey Dahmer types. Like, yeah, so I break my rules. I would say to Jared, like, I don't mind that you evangelize that person to not eat his shit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but pass a law, you know, but. Well, it's not an enforceable law, but yeah, don't pass laws. To... <laughs> I really, I hope this never comes up. I'm, I really, I'm so tired of like fighting for absurd bullshit, you know, like, because as soon as, as soon as the law comes up saying like, it's illegal to eat your own shit, I'm going to have to say, I'm going to have to fight against that. I'm going to hate that so much. I'm going to hate every fucking second of it because I'm going to be called a degenerate and like almost rightfully so. I have to defend like, no, the people eating gotta, their own shit. Yeah, you got to like, you got to let on this shit, side. Man. You Thanks, guys. To eat shit. One time you made me be on the side of Lindsey Graham, and now you're having me on the side of a <laughs> shit eater. Thanks a I'm, I'm so afraid of, of where this is going to go because of how goddamn stupid I'm going to have to look. I mean, you guys made me defend Donald fucking Trump for four years. Yeah, like, That's how insane it got, but it's only getting more insane. And once the pendulum swings the other day, I'm going to have to be like, no, you can't make it illegal to eat shit. <laughs> You can you gotta let people be fucking disgusting in their own homes. But I mean, and then the, uh, the, like, the shitty guy's like, gonna be like, "Yeah, you're on my side." He's like, I'm not on your side. You're disgusting, and I think you should stop eating shit. Like, you're fucking gross. Get away from me. Yeah, the, here's but the thing: is like, imagine that. So okay, let's just say like, oh my god, some people just have a compulsion to eat eat shit. And some of the people, they feel the societal shame, and they don't want to be shit eaters, but they just have a compulsion. But good news, pharmacists have developed a pill that suppresses the shit-eating urge. Now, one of the side effects, like, and it's effective, <laughs> it's safe and effective, It like, if you take the pill, your life is basically normal, except that... I, I mean, everything's the same, I should say, except that you don't want to eat shit. Now, one of the side effects is that it makes gay people not gay anymore. <laughs> is that... <laughs> what? Like, I've heard what? some thought experience of that. Yeah. <laughs> like, what if the same pill that makes it so like you don't get um, boners from women sitting on balloons or shitting on birthday cakes and eating poo <laughs> is the same pill that so makes this you is the most gay. bigotry bigoted you've been bigoted. <laughs> Even saying what if we is problematic. Wanna... <laughs> Are you saying uh, it's a kink? They were born with it. <laughs> no, but like, yeah, like, what if the pill, like, if you could give Jeffrey Dahmer and Dennis Nelson a pill 
that would make it so they were not sexually attracted to um, dead men. <laughs> but it would also make them straight. Bigotry. Nope, can't do it. That's, can't do it. They would probably they would probably death. fight you on that. <laughs> yeah. They'd be like, "Can't nope, 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 nope." I, so I would say, like, actually, it, Foucault it would fight on you on they, that. Who's no, to say would. what's normal, what's right? No, and the thing is, like, most people after the fact would say yes, but like, if if some Dahmer like person, like sprung up in the media and said i have these dahmer like temptations where i want to cut a man's head off and rape his dead face um should i take the pill that makes me not want to do that but also makes me not gay they'd be like whoa 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 this has hasn't happened yet you haven't acted on it and plus you could probably find somebody that would consent to role-playing this and if role-playing isn't enough then you know maybe you could find somebody consent to actually doing it consent is key if you can find somebody that consent to you decapitating them and face fucking their head then go for it because consent is all we care about wow well. Well, uh, that basically sets the table for whenever Flores wants to come talk about should we evangelize or not evangelize. If he's popping on tonight, it might be running late. I'm, I've got a bunch of other weird stuff or memes to look at, or Flip can talk about his top five favorite boozes. <laughs> um, Should I say it instead of typing it? Like, I'm just trying to, like, this isn't complete, but okay, I'll just do it. So this thing I just had now was great. It's a 2020 Tushat to Nifty Pup. Um, I, there's a 2006 Grand Reserva uh, uh, Rioja Tempranillo that's just awesome, but it's because it's available and uh, affordable. When I was in wine school, I tried a, a Cote Roti. Um, that was just standout thing. Um, also in wine school, uh, uh, like the Cote Roti, I think that was one of them that's 100% Syrah, but they've got it's got that weird... Um, uncanny almost briny savory meat like quality that uh just weird that some wines just get um uh, i had a javri chambreton grand cru burgundy pinot noir and that was um a revelation just like how just how perfumey and nice it was like especially like if you have just a regular burgundy by itself and then like a grand cru one after the other you probably wouldn't notice any difference but next to each other, it really pops out. But I should mention some whites. Um, a Montrachet, which is a, like a barrel fermented uh, uh, Chardonnay from Burgundy. Um, like they do the Lee mixing where they stir up the yeast and it makes like this big, fat, uh, really biscuity white wine. And like that's a $150 bottle. I only got to try that in uh, wine school. And then I had occasion, like, um, man, I'm leaving a lot of stuff out, but just stuff that pops out in my mind. I got to have um, lunch with a Tuscan winemaker, and he has this crazy wine that uh, is equal parts of the nine different wines of Tuscany. And it reminded me a little bit of that Cote Roti in that, like, it had kind of some savoriness, but it was also really big. But it was kind of like this thing I had tonight, the Chateauneuf de Pop, which is... You know, like I, I was said earlier, it's like a, the Beethoven symphony of wine. Because, but part of their whole thing is that it they incorporate thirteen different grape varieties in it. But it was just all perfectly put together. But yeah, those are really good wines. But then, like, because here's the other thing, though, when you talk about really, really good wines, like the most delicious things that went past my face, because some of them are expensive wines, and there's been a lot of expensive wine that I've tasted that is totally forgettable, utterly forgettable and some really cheap wine that is great because like if you had me like you know top five under 20 like that's a whole other list but it's also really really good 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 wines for sure um biscuity wines uh if you want biscuity wines that don't cost a lot of money um like you're in the midwest you have good uh, liquor stores there uh muscadet not muscat but muscadet is a white wine variety from Loire Valley. And um, they do the Lee mixing where like periodically while the wine is fermenting and maturing, they literally stir up all the dead yeast and let it sit in suspension. And it kind of like, it gives it that fatness and it gives it body and that biscuity thing. And then, you know, any kind of champagne style wine has that same thing. Um, Cause other than that, you have to start spending a lot of money on like, you know, white burgundies. 
But to get that taste for cheap, uh, look for Muscadet. Do -do -do -do. Minerally, Chablis. Chablis is the famous, famous minerally thing. There's some really interesting whites from uh, uh, what Dalmatia, does Bosnia. Mean? What? What? What does biscuity mean? Literally yeah. biscuity, like a lot of yeast flavor. Like literally mm. yeast flavor. Like part of what makes that. champagne champagne is that its production is that it spends a lot of time sitting on a big plug of dead yeast, which the more you age it, the more it contributes. And then again, like with the like a lot of style of brute, like Chablis is famous for being extremely crispy. It never sees the inside of wood. It's always um, fermented in like concrete or stainless steel, and it's all about light and crispy. But because Chardonnay is such a, a versatile grape, um, you can do other things where you barrel ferment it and barrel age it, which allows oxygen exchange, which softens all the acids. And then if you really want to go nuts, you do this thing, which is called lee, mix, lee stirring, where, again, you periodic, periodically go through and you literally dig up all that that's flock, dead yeast and shit, and stir it all up and let it all sit in suspension. And you make the opposite of Chablis, where it's like... a at like a thick, not you know, I mean, comparatively, but like really rich body and has like literally biscuity flavors of that, that fresh yeast flavor. Like if you ever had farmhouse ale, they're biscuity. That's what they call it. Hmm. We get the full <coughs> spectrum of uh, alcohol drinkers in this group because we've got Chris is basically a Mormon with alcohol. I just... <laughs> I just drink whatever gets me drunk, which in this case is New Amsterdam gin. Oh God, that's not good stuff. No, it's I. I didn't. I wasn't aiming for good stuff. I was aiming for cost-effective stuff. I mean, and, I, I mean, look, it is that. Do you? I, mean, I would have a rough it, time it, with it. I would. I'd New Amsterdam, like as a spritzer, like with a tonic, sure, fine. Almost not, any gin in a tonic is fine. Um, but it's um, not bad. I, yeah. Honestly, like my favorite. So, like. Blue Sapphire or Bombay Sapphire um, mixes the best with tonic. Like you can taste the least. Like it mixes very well. Um, yeah. Honestly, like Tanqueray is usually, it's not high shelf, but it's it's probably my most go to when it when it comes to gin. Um, Whistle Pig is overpriced. That stuff is. I, I'm I'm sorry. I'm actually. I'm, probably, I'm not supposed to say specific brands technically because of who i work for but whistle pig is a rebrander like <laughs> someday they're going to start making their own stuff and we'll see what it's like but right now everything they make is rebranded they like do their own thing they'll rest it in a thing but my experience with whistle pig is that like it's just overpriced it's not bad whiskey there's just way better whiskey for a lot less like um the whistle pig six-year rye Compared to Sazerac, which is like half the price, Sazerac every day of the week. The Whistle Pig six year was crap next to Sazerac and cost nearly twice as much. Anyway, uh, would you like to see a funny lady? Yes, this is a lady who's funny, she can do it. Excuse me, could you please record me for just a second? Oh my god, what? <laughs> <laughs> She's pretty funny. She has a couple like that. Oh, so. Excuse me. Could you please record me for just a second? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Why are you following me? <laughs> what is a word that starts with the letter P and ends with O R N? Yeah. Um, do you guys hear anything about the Bluey episode this week? Yeah, the gay no. one. Well, some people are mentioning well, we had, gay, but it was... Well, they had a queer family. I don't know what that means, yeah. so I haven't seen the actual episode. I don't know. It was just a general hint towards that, but all the whole world, including Dan McClellan, commented on it. It's basically just a story about them about to move their house, and then they didn't move their house. But like the whole world watched it like it was a piece of a 
digital mastery or something. Oh, something. I saw that. Yeah. What's the, but what's the queer family thing? That's is that a there was some one? there was no there was just like a hint to possibly two moms at a at, oh. a, at the yeah, wedding. So no, I I did watch the thing where like he just like rips the sold sign off of their house and they decide to stay yeah. and they're like crying. They made it seem like this one of those moments in Rick and Morty or whatever that's supposed to be really profound. Or, it was just a kid. I'm show. like, wait a minute, but they already sold the house. It's not theirs anymore. Yeah. But I saw, <laughs> I saw even Dan McClellan commenting on it because he's got to show all of his, uh, his, uh, I don't know what we call it. His soy bona fides. It's got to make sure you're as soy as possible. You want to see the weirdest thing in the world. Um, I don't know if Forrest is going to be able to pop in or not. And we're running okay. long and I haven't heard from him yet. Um, so maybe we'll wrap it up and do it next time as soon as we can get him on now that we've set the table or something. But check the, check this out. Check check how weird this is. Check out these pig competitions, what they have to do at the pig competitions. Man, she looks dead serious. That's what I'm saying. But did you know that's how they have to be? It must be because they're all doing they it. have to. They have to maintain that face and those stares at the judges. Oh, so that's just part of the rules of the game. Yeah, they're all doing it. Did you know that? <laughs> Why? I don't know. <laughs> It's the weirdest dang thing I've seen in the world. How do you score points? I have no idea. I guess the pigs got to listen to them while they stare angrily at judges. This is so weird. Wondering. Like, you know what? They're listening to this going in different places. What the fuck? This reminds me of a thing that I learned about this week, which I found on YouTube is findable. Because um, one of my coworkers is this wonderful lady from Mobile, Alabama. And sometimes she talks about how the South is different. And somehow it came up. Because like, oh, that's how it came up. Because in Utah, like the police and the firemen have um, a charity fundraiser game called, and it's a hockey game, and it's called Guns and Hoses. But they just play hockey. And I told her this, and she because her dad was a sheriff in wherever fucking Alabama she's from. And she said that they played donkey baseball. Where it was baseball, I, but you had to ride a fucking donkey. It's amazing. <laughs> Which is There's amazing. an old Saturday Night Live skit of uh, Charles Barkley playing donkey basketball. Oh, yeah. I, I guess I didn't. I don't remember that. Um, the girl who falsely accused that baseball pitcher is getting charged with felony fraud. That's a good thing. Uh, oh. Wow. Nice. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little. Yeah, that's not her in the picture. That's a reporter in the picture. She probably get a good six months probation or something. <laughs> uh, I mean, we don't want to ruin her life, right? Like, we don't. That would be. That would totally ruin her life, and that would be unjust. So <laughs> the Biden administration is trying to change from Latin X to Latin. Latine, Latine. Latine. I think they try to say it Latin. I don't I mean, know why. Just how I know they haven't started. Because, like, already, because, like, if uh, the Brazilian pronunciation of that is Lachini, which is not going to, that ain't going nowhere in <laughs> America. That's... I think they spelled it like that to get people to say it how a Spanish person would say it without the E, but then it's going to mess up a person who would say it with Spanish with the E and they'd say Latine. And, it's stupid. It's, it's no. It's how okay, about you leave I language know, alone? How I know, about leave that? It, alone, but it's also, it is less retarded than I don't know. Anytime I bring this up, people are like, "Oh, language changes all the time." And I was like, "Yeah, this, naturally, it just changes. It it morphs Morris throughout here. the years." Yeah, there's no but, top down commissar who decides it. Yeah, it's you. it's not like we yeah. decided today. Now we're just going to use they them pronouns for singular. It's like, yeah, it's used in singular instances when you don't know the gender or you're trying to um, hide the gender of the person you're talking about. That's it. So this lady hit the New York. Yeah, For Forrest post. is in the chat. He is? Yeah. Forrest, did you want to pop on or is it hitting late? Where'd you have dinner, Forrest, that was so good that it was better than hanging out with us? <laughs> <laughs> I 
Taco Bell. He wants five <laughs> tacos. Taco Bell. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. This is five minutes. Uh, did you see the Mormon face video? This is what my name is referring to. Did you guys watch? Yeah, it? I don't. I don't. I didn't watch it because I didn't want to. But yeah, I didn't I, go through the whole thing. But great. like, I don't. This is one of those things where it's like, okay, you've got a point, but are you taking it way farther than it deserves to go? Because it's like, sure, there's Mormon face and there's Juggalo face, and there's you know, pissed off guy face. Like, okay, whatever. Like, I don't know. Does she make sense? And then it just, it's just one of those things that got away from her. Yeah, that's kind of what I figure. It's like it's yeah, it's one of those things. Like yeah, no people. People who people tend to look like the people they are around and like they tend to adopt mannerisms and styles and things like, yeah, that's a thing. And like, sure, like if, if you might point at examples where that goes too far and I might go, yeah, but like, you know, I mean, because like, I mean, I was just mentioning earlier, like in uh, convention land, I could always tell when it was Mormons selling the magic oil. Even though they like they weren't talking about church, they were talking about magic oil and sales figures. But you could just tell from the cadence and the choice of words and all the little things. Like, okay, yeah, you're a Mormon. There it is. Cadence and the choice of words. Yeah, oh. uh, I'm sorry. I'm. I was listening to you guys on the other thing while I I have eggs cooking. So, um, <laughs> you got it. those eggs. <laughs> that protein isn't going to metabolize itself. I think she has Mormon face and Mormon voice and all that sort of stuff. I think she still. Oh yeah. Has. I mean, I would pick her out as a Mormon anywhere in the world, but. Wow, um, she's got shoulders. She's an ex-Mormon. I don't she think I'd be able like to pick Mormon out either of you two as Mormons if I ran into you in the wild. She's got shoulders. She's an ex. Yeah. Oh. I don't I know. Yeah. I, I. I don't know. I. I don't like. I, I feel like I always notice people's speech patterns and stuff like, like that, and so I avoid them. Like, th th as a Mormon, I, um, I really stopped using I, I stopped using words like truthfulness because it's a stupid word. Like, it has two suffixes, so it's dumb, but it's also everybody uses it all the time. I stopped using phrases like "beyond the shadow of a doubt." with every fiber of my being and all that shit. <laughs> I was like, I don't actually like using language or, or, uh, um, I don't know, um, facial expressions or, uh, like physical giveaways that I'm part of a certain group. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but also it's like, there's the point where it's totally unavoidable, you know, like, cause if you try to hide it too much, then you become the, uh, Steve Buscemi, Hello, fellow kids meme. <laughs> yes. Right? Well, like, I'm not, I'm not trying to in our fit. Comments. No, it, it's less that I'm, I'm not trying to fit into a certain group. I'm trying to fit out of a certain group. <laughs> Is that your no, far radical says, interest? Who cares yeah. about this outside of Mormonlandia? Well, that's as weird as they put it on the New York Post. Man. It, that yeah. guy was Mormon, though. Like, or that the Mormon. Writer. person who saw it. it? Well, no, the person who saw it was also an ex mormon and that's why he did it but that's it's weird that that's the ex-mormon thing that takes off i gotta point out right now that um forrest is the anti-est mormon on the screen and he has the mormonist haircut mormon look going on today yeah i might pick <laughs> yeah forrest talking out about I'm mormon, mormon face in a while. <laughs> i think i would come across that as a i don't know i can't tell anymore but I wouldn't. You come across as Mormon part. because nobody ever sees you drink, yeah, or smoke, or <laughs> like that's, yeah, and like uh, women are like throw themselves at you and you're just like walk away. And the people are like, yeah. oh, he must be Mormon. People I wouldn't think like I'm a Mormon Michigan. because of all the like gigantic gay orgies that I go to. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> no, that's what made me think you were What's Mormon, man. Fucking I mean, funny about that. Angels in America. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, uh, so I missed. I, I didn't hear basically any of the conversation tonight. Oh, actually, was, I kind of the very beginning, but that was it. Going through the NPR lady who had all of her things thrown up about truth, oh, yeah, and then yeah. some other think pieces about truth and all that stuff. I actually uh, also talked about and gave him the background of what your post was over on uh, Thoughtful Saints and uh, the the Japanese dude and all that stuff. And then we kind of just talked about other stuff like. Uh, 
some ideas in like um utilitarianism about uh maybe maybe happiness levels of the world increasing or decreasing with actions or harm levels increasing or decreasing but like looking at it in the grand scale rather than like an individual type stuff we talked about what else did we talk about we talked about uh those weren't that excellent on point. Wine, they were just right. in general those ideas. Uh, Flip talked about wine a lot, <laughs> and uh, the truth thing. And then what else? There was something else. No, but I, I mean, I don't. I guess some of the stuff that like, if, if we're gonna have fights but, with Forrest about is like that thing that I was talking <laughs> about earlier with um the paradox for me of Mormonism, is that uh, you know like, um I don't believe in God and Mormonism bores me and I was a miserable person as a Mormon. And yet, like, all of the most regrettable things in my life, like, if I had just taken the Mormon council, wouldn't have happened. Right? And then also, like, you know, like, because you weren't here for it, but I talk about, like, my aunt and uncle who are, like, these, like, paragons of Mormon happiness and well-being. And, like, they're extremely faithful Mormons, but, like, I call them Manhattan Mormons because, like, they're extremely open and tolerant and, like, they're totally cool with my life as a wine guy. Um you know, and like, and you know, and I look at them and like, because all the choices they made were guided by their Mormon faith. And I can't look at them and say that they did anything wrong. You know, like, I just don't believe in that stuff. But like, for me, there's this paradox because like so many people outside of the church say, like, oh, the church is bad, get out. Like, well, it was well, bad for me. So, it so bad for is saying that it takes more faith for him to be an uncle, atheist. What if your aunt and uncle weren't? <laughs> good to you because of their faith i didn't say good to me like it's coincidental that they were good to me but i'm just saying after just looking from the outside like you know because if, if you're going to tell me that like being a faithful mormon is bad and again like i look at them and like well hang on like it worked out for them in such a spectacular way that like that, you know, that whole thing breaks down so, sure it was so, bad well, for me the whole thing only breaks down in that instance the whole point is that does anyone i guess the question that i think is the most important is does anyone here believe how do i put this not believe um like think that there are people in the world that would be happier if they were not mormon so if i had to put a number oh, on it i would say that like there's there's like, like a there percentage one? right so i would i would say that if everybody in the world were mormon a higher percentage would be happy than would not be happy. No, no. So, so wait, he's saying the opposite. Current Mormons, single person. Current this, Mormons this who would be happier, not. Oh, for sure. For no, sure, I there's some there's people in this world that would probably be, and like the examples I was kind of giving in some of those chats is like, let's say the pioneers coming across uh, the plains uh, on the trek, like the ones that had kids die and or themselves died. I think it's a pretty safe bet to say they probably would have had better lives if they had not done that. Um, like, Forrest, do you or, know who or, those people were? Or that, or like, the missionary that handcart guys? The Maybe it was Hitler. Maybe it was you Hitler. No, well, no, not that, but like the, the handcart people, like these people came out of industrial England and Scandinavia, like middle 19th century London, like the nightmare of existence. Like they weren't on the planes because they were happy at home. They left so, because it was a hell. But what I'm saying is the ones that died on the track. But yeah, like, like or they, they could have died of cholera is, in a like, giant slum in Whitechapel. But so are you making risk, the case that they were better off dying on the track than in it, their previous lives? It, so if you could choose to die on the great open plains under the sunshine of the free son of America <laughs> and in a 19th century eating, London eating your family sanitarium <laughs> surrounded you know, like, by 80,000 other thing. dying people. And, like, so you're saying that those I don't know, are like, the only options? I, well, no, because like, no, again, that's, like, that's, that's a you don't risk think, you don't run, think there right? are people that yeah, had good like, lives just, and then decided no, but, to follow the but, prophet? Forrest, my, point is, Forrest, my point is this is part of their calculation. Absolutely is part of their calculation. Like the Mormons like to tell the story that like, oh, these people were motivated by, motivated by faith. Sure, in part. But they were getting the fuck out of the frying well, pan. That, that's my point. The in part is if you believe it's all justified in the end because of the afterlife, that throws off your calculation and someone 
that you think uh, someone that thinks that they're making the proper choice, if you think that that's a false decision, like you're not going to get paid off in the afterlife for this. So don't risk your life going across the plains. I think the moral thing to do if you are your brother's keeper is to say, Hey bro, that's a really bad idea because there actually isn't this afterlife that you're hoping there is. But what if there's a well, generational but, but they, benefit like, they didn't foresee? Yeah, something? no, like, like that thing's like, well, hey, I'm not making any broad you can, claims. You about, can like, take the afterlife oh, out of it. You can you can take that motivation out of it. Like, what about like never mind how they imagine their afterlife. What about how they imagine their children's lives? That that's part of why they did it. You know, like I mean, this gets into this whole the whole Jordan Petersonian thing about like what does it really mean to believe in God? You know, because like you can do the Petersonian interpretation and just say like, well, no, the afterlife. You know, heaven is the thing you make here. You know, like the paradise is the thing where your children are happy and prosperous. You know, and that's the thing that you're striving for, and that's why you're walking across the plains. Me, you're that's why you're building Zion, Zion and getting the fuck out of, you know, industrial Norway or some terrible place. Or, that or maybe you're getting out of a place because you truly just believe the doctrine and you think, like, I mean, this applies to any. This applies it's, to any religion. You don't think sure, Muslims like, blowing themselves up literally think. That their life is going to be better because they blew themselves up. Forrest, were you a missionary? Yeah, I do think they think that. But... You were a missionary, weren't you? No, no, I wasn't. Oh, you didn't go? Because here's yeah. the thing: like one of the thing, one of the things that all the ex Mormon down. missionaries will cop to is that, like, the whole like, oh my God, I felt the spirit. I'm Mormon thing. That doesn't happen. Almost everybody who joins the church is either mentally ill or sees a leverage to oh, be yeah. found it's there. Yeah, they they justify it in those ways. Just the, 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 my whole point is that there are people that would be better off without the church. If I mean, you, let's, yeah, let's sure. answer. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, like, and, and, I, oh, and, yes. If, so that answer is kind of. But conversely, for us, are there people say, better off in church? That's, you know, yeah. like. Look at Troy's question. Troy's got a good question. That might oh, be. Troy does have a good question. But like, when you ask me, like, are there some people who are better off out of the church? Yes. But the, the inverse of that question, are there some people who are better off in church? Uh, yeah, and, and I'm not I'm not arguing that all people need to leave the church. Well, okay. Okay, so well, how do we know? How, who, so how, wait, wait, what, we, what how was the um, how do we separate the, the wheat from Hold the chaff? What was the what was your um Facebook post. post trying okay. to get somebody to admit? It was trying Got to get it. just so, at so, least one okay. person to the, admit. The purpose of my Facebook post was to hopefully have a, a believer open up their eyes a little bit and say okay, an ex-Mormon trying to argue against the church isn't just some hostile anti-Mormon. They may, in fact, be doing the exact same thing that I'm doing, which is, oh, I love you so much that I want something good for you, and I want you to have the gospel. I want you to have the good news. That's why I'm so aggressive in my proselytizing. That's why I am going across, I'm going on a mission for two years to do this, is because I think that you, you need this for your salvation. That's basically what uh, some ex-Mormons are doing when they say, hey, gay person that's in the church, I actually think your life will be better if you leave the church, but you're, you think that this is true, so it's thrown off your calculus. But if you don't yeah. believe that the afterlife is a thing, then you're going to make way different choices, so I'm going to try to argue what's true. That was my whole point, just so that way they could see like, oh, you think you're arguing for what's going to make someone's life better. And yeah, yeah. I think that, okay, I get it. You're not just angry at the church. And uh, I mean, there are people that are angry. I'm angry in some ways. Like, I'm just saying there no, are. I, 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 I'm with you on this part of the fight because, like, you know, for 20 years now, I, like, a long, for, it took me a, a few years to realize that, like, my argument with guys like your brother and the Christians on the radio that I used to argue with, like, I'm, I don't, I'm so not interested in talking Jacob out of Mormonism. Or Cardin or those guys. My fight with them is trying to convince them that I really, really, really don't believe in God. That's the fight that I have with Jacob. Because like Jacob has this whole thing, like, no, you actually believe yeah, in God. Yeah, You're just yeah, like yourself. Like, no, no, Jacob, I really, 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 really don't believe in God. I I, I, I believe that you believe and I'm cool with it. I'm yeah. so down with it. Well, but, and, yeah, like, and I kept doing that in the argument. I kept saying, like, I understand the Mormon perspective of like, I don't think Mormons are trying to proselytize because they're angry and bitter. I think that they, they think it's what's best for me. So I'm like, 
I don't understand why a lot of Mormons can't see that same perspective from ex Mormons. Um, and no, here, I always tell them, and anytime. Anytime it gets brought up, the whole, like, can't leave the church alone thing, I'm like, well, okay, you kind of made your bet a little bit there, church, because you did the whole every member a missionary thing, and everybody became, <laughs> like, a, an evangelizing missionary, so you can't reasonably expect them to stop being a missionary. Well, yeah. I, I've been saying this, it's like, church, they're just a missionary I, I, for their new thing. Those comments kill me, because I'm like, you have, you are a part of a church that has an army of missionaries, and you won't even leave people alone when they die. So the fact that I can't leave the church alone because I'm in some Facebook group. Like you guys are baptizing dead people. So I, 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 I won't I really take the argument that like I need to be quiet and keep it to myself. That's one of those things that we're like, I don't know. Cause like on the one hand, I can understand people being annoyed, but also like if, if I found out like, that the Scientology club was throwing my Thetan into Xenu's time fortress, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not real bothered by that. <laughs> They can do it. Well, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> you know, and it's like, and if, and like, and if the Mormons are yeah. baptized again, Frank. Well, listen, okay. okay. So you, you Forrest, this is one of the weird things like, I, I sometimes wonder because I should, Jacob and I should swap families because uh, I'm the one out and everybody else is in extended family and everybody and pretty much live in the dream like nobody that i know of has like any sort of major crazy problem or issue and life's beautiful and perfect the perfect little jacob family for all of them you know what i mean and um his world seems the opposite over there but do you get proselytized to a lot so i, mean, I guess some of the questions that i would have with this is like what are we doing with the third neutral party who doesn't know anything about mormonism or are we arguing back and forth with people who kind of already have their their positions? Like, do you do you still get proselytized to a lot by anybody in your family? Or are they that way? I'd say for the most part, no. Besides, Other like when you I, and Jacob I, are fighting, a, you know, I've joined a Mormon Facebook group, so like, yeah, you and Jacob do it on purpose, type stuff. But yeah, but even even then, Jacob doesn't really proselytize to me, and not because, in my opinion, not because he doesn't want to proselytize. I think it's just because he doesn't have great arguments for proselytizing. It's more he'll, he, he can kind of fight in that, like, does God exist realm, the level one conversation. So he'll, we hang out there cause we have some, dis, like some actual battles to be had, but yeah. he d never will talk to me about like, he doesn't bear his testimony to me or I know Joseph a, Smith saw the plates. Battle. Yeah. No, nothing like that. Um, so, yeah. So I get, almost nothing close to nothing my mom gave me a book pretty recently it was like the first thing she did in 20 years and it was it was this book this this uh terrell gibbons book about sin uh, rethinking sin and salvation i think she gave it to me because she doesn't really even have any sort of general concept of how philosophically out of it I am. She just thinks that maybe he sinned once and feels bad about it or something like that. And that's that's as far as she's ever gotten with everything. And I, I, I don't dispel her of it. Maybe I could or should. Uh, um, but I just don't get, I don't get, like even Kevin, like I, I, I don't know if you followed a little bit that I gave a diet challenge and Kevin passed it. And then I went to church for a month uh, with him because I had to do it. And I, I, I was still very bored with it and uh wasn't yeah, yeah. I remember you saying that like it was so boring <laughs> yeah, but nobody tried to get me to come back or, or go or say anything or, or do anything I, I don't know maybe i just don't have mormon face maybe i have like leave me alone face or something like that and i wonder if a lot of other ex-mormons if they're constantly getting it from their family members or something like that and maybe they they live in so, a different so a lot of this is like i'm trying to like stay away from too much personal stuff, but like, here's a, a theoretical that's close enough that I'll do. Imagine if you had a child and your parents, because of their beliefs in the church, your, your child is gay and your parents, because of their belief in the church now said, uh, not allowed at our house. Would that change this calculus? Sure. Yeah. If my parents were that way, it would, they wouldn't be though, but yeah, I guess I was like, yeah, but like I, like if the church was worse than it is, like, I don't know. Like, so this is the this, thing where, like, not, for example, 
that is a real thing that's happening all over. The, this is where I think it's Zeno not. I don't, have, for, for, I don't think it's that's often, not. Though. It's not happening. Like it is one hundred percent happening. It's happening. No, no, no. Yes, wait, that, oh wait, that you have you have a gay child? No, I, no, I don't no. know somebody. So you know so have, Oh, you know how somebody who's a gay child is not allowed in the grandparents' house. This, this is well with a spouse. Okay, hang on. So this, hmm. So you can't bring you can't bring your husband to Thanksgiving is what he's saying. Yes, I think and, that and probably happened. Like, oh, it just seems to be happening in the modern world. world. What I'm saying. Okay, so so gr grandparents say grandchild who is gay and is married same sex that. Grandchild is still welcome, spouse is not. Yes. And that grandparents are saying this. Yes. Oh, that is rough. So is that and that's and that's the totality? What do you mean? Because the thing is like because like I mean what I was pushing back on to be clear for us, what I was pushing back on because I didn't know this whole story. Because like this is the thing where it's like, okay, I mean, this is not unbelievable. I know this happens, but People like to portray Mormons as being like this almost like Jim Crow for gays, which is not true. Well, like, well once you get into the nuance of some of it, it gets like not Jim Crow for gays, but it's like it gets very un. So this is where I think you guys, because where of, are these Utah you people overreactions? And so I understand the overreaction like, oh, everything's harmful. It's like you have this Mormon look and, you know, I felt ab abused because I didn't look like the Mormon look, whatever. Like that stuff's ridiculous, but I do think a hundred percent there are people that are going through some real stuff that yeah. is directly due to this false belief, and I don't see you guys ever pushing on that. Sure, you push on the this is an overreaction. Well, no, it's like there are real our thing is that, this is a big problem, and I don't well, think my situation is a unique one. And and also, sorry, I need to clarify one thing for the record. It's not exactly this case we're talking about, but it's basically this case we're talking about. It's the same. Your grandparents result. don't let your your grandparents don't let your husband come to Thanksgiving with you. <laughs> is that... No, Jacob's still cool. Um, with it though, that's just the kind of guy he is. Um, no, I don't know because like because again like with these hypotheticals because like I don't know I because I grew up in the heart of Mormonism in the 1980s and 90s, and the only message I ever got. Was tolerance and acceptance. So, so and, and would your parents we had, allow a gay couple to stay over at their house? Um, so I have absolutely. I guarantee. I absolutely guarantee. My parents I, would my, not my put a stop to that at all. My parents would allow as well. And we actually. So I said I was the only one. I have a cousin who is gay. Is out, and uh, he was in a relationship. But there was one of the one of the different families that were a bit more standoffish with him uh once he brought like a gay partner around but he brought the gay partner around to all sorts of family events and stuff but uh the family where the, the dad was a byu professor and all that sorts of stuff i would say they acted differently but they didn't they didn't uh block like they didn't block yeah. participation um uh, they were they were cold and and strange to him, according to him. And then from my parents' side and the rest of them, uh, I I think they did just uh, act like it was uh, something normal. But that doesn't mean that I don't think that the situation you're talking about isn't real and doesn't happen. But at the same time, too, I don't think I'd have a problem of, of asking anybody like that if they're in the situation. If I had it right in front of me and saying, "Why are you being like that? Don't be like that." Like, let it go or yeah type of deal um but uh no, I'd say, but, I think it's and, definitely and the response I think the response is the response is I love them so much I believe that they're sinning and yeah. so you're not being loving I'm being the loving one I mean maybe mm -hmm. like I don't know like because I just there's such a like an extreme trope of Mormonism that even in all my journeys like I feel like I've almost never encountered because <laughs> like I don't know like what, what, what specifically part? like you know because in in the, the stereotypical trope thing, which is like you know the kid like that says like I was thrown out of my Mormon household just because I was gay. So so it's like I don't that, believe that that is a thing that happens. It I, almost always comes with a whole slew of other shit that if you knew about, you might understand. So you know so like and like I, I mostly agree with that. Like it's not like the parents are like oh you're gay leave, but what if it was like oh you're gay 
in our house, that's not okay. So you're not allowed to date men. Well, no, but this is what I'm getting at is like now, when, when, people, when the people say for us that like, like, and I, I have a little bit of firsthand knowledge in this just because I was briefly a milieu counselor in a teen uh, residential treatment center. But like, you know, because you hear this story of what they say, like, I was thrown out of my house just for being gay. And you're like, my God, that sounds awful. And then you hear the parents and it's like, <laughs> no, like, you know, we don't like that you're gay because of the religious thing. But we told you that, like, we're fine with it. Just, you know, you don't bring it into the house. Like, it's and we know different with if you were straight, you're a child. But so, also, so, like, we didn't throw you out of the house for being gay. We throw you out of the house because you stole grandma's car and the credit card and you took your 12 year old brother on a trip to pick up drugs. You know, like, okay, so, so these are, my, like when you hear these things, if, you if find out like, oh, that's why they got thrown out of the house. If, if you're a BYU student and you're you're at school, but then you come home and you're straight and you bring your girlfriend over and to meet your family. How does your family treat that? Now, let's say you're a gay guy and you try to bring your, your gay partner over. And you can't do that. And so when well, I'm fucking it, surprised, I, mean, man. I don't know that you can't like, see, again, <laughs> in my family, like my, my family, family was fired. very Mormon and yeah. like, under, it wasn't common, not, but yeah, it yeah, happened yeah, enough. But and but people and everybody you, just, was, this is like not a real thing that happens all no, the no, time. No, no, no. no I, 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 I agree that, that, that I, what I you're saying is real. I think it's a matter of scope and scale. Like, I but no, but we have to say that the thing that, yeah, uncommon. No, we, We've well, talked I, about I don't before, know and talking. we we've okay, all let's, kind of come let's to have the situation in our hands. If we do yeah. have this situation, is it fair for that leave Mormonism. to be like, "Hey, Mormonism is false. Stop so, having these dumb no, beliefs okay. that are causing all well, these problems." Wait, like, if you're getting into like the whole like the grand truth of Mormonism, well, that's a whole different fight. Because for one thing, for us, like. One of my one of the reasons why I am so pro Mormon, despite being unreligious, is that any Mormon who does act in this way, you I can make and you can make and anybody who's Mormon can make the Mormon argument for why you are acting incorrectly, right? Well, like what? you need for to show more grace, you need to be are more loving, to the night at the you house? need to be more tolerant. You know, and like, like you can make the Jesus-based argument for what, you, why, get, what they're doing. You'll get thrown out of out of thoughtful saints as being Julie uh, Julie Hanks lover. No, 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 no. You get thrown yeah. out of thoughtful saints but, for pointing out why Jacob's arguments are shit. But That's I've, how I got I've had, thrown out. So I've I've been in the situation where I wasn't supposed to stay at the house with the girlfriend because we were unmarried, and I yeah. didn't. You, you know, well, but at the like, house, or in, did you, were you able to stay in separate rooms? No, I didn't stay at the house at all. Yeah, no, because yeah, like, and that's a perfect well, example. Because like, a lot first, of this stuff, room, like, take the couch. This so, wasn't my own. This wasn't. This know? was her family. Because like um, an awful lot of this, like, and Chris raises a good point. It's like an awful lot of this stuff, like, you can just chalk up to chastity rules, not no, no, no. So homosexuality. I, I'm just, no. saying a double. I, okay, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm actually more. Uh, so I'd, I'd be more on foresight here because I. Yeah. You can draw the chastity distinction right like oh i won't let you fuck dudes in my house i also won't let you fuck women in my house but it is a little bit different when they're gay and that's I, we've said plenty of times on this like yeah most of the time i'll tell people to stay in mormonism if they can square it but like if there's a gay guy i'm gonna tell him yeah just leave it it's it's not for so, you man. Well, <laughs> i i, like, I me, was reminded i remembered what the first subject was that we talked about that i forgot about but it is going along these lines, although it's a little bit more extreme philosophically. But we brought up this report that this Spanish, this uh, Spanish um, um, politician, had a leaked video of him in a sexual way, in a sexual video, <laughs> eating his own excrement, right? And uh, Peter Bogosian, uh, who we all know and like, came out and said, "Leave the guy alone," right? And Did so then, he have a shit-eating grin? So then a lot no. of the people who like Peter Bogosian or who have liked Peter Bogosian, who have aligned with him from maybe like Jacob and Cardin like Peter Bogosian, right? Because he was part of those uh, um, grievance study, grievance yeah. studies things. And they like to bring him up a whole lot. But then all of a sudden those people said, what the hell is wrong with Peter Bogosian saying, leave this guy's sexual kink, whatever it is alone. And so we, that's an, a bit more of an extreme case, but 
each of us kind of like we understand the point of those guys saying that we're going to shame that and still shame that. But then all of us would have to land on the side of saying, yeah, leave the guy eating the shit alone. You know, it's his own personal life. It's his own personal thing. And, and maybe being the extreme thing kind of makes it, you know, drives the point home a little bit more. But I mean, I get the, the point you're bringing, but what about when these lines cross over when it gets to a house? But I mean, I think that's also one of the other lines that we see going on in the world right now of like, I, I think pretty generally it's getting more and more accepted, just kind of like a very normative gay relationships getting slightly more, more acceptable, but there's things outside of that that are also being uh, moved in uh, to people's houses and, and ideas and that sort of stuff. And you like, what if they were suddenly upset because they brought home a polyamorous couple or something like that? And they said, well, that's not our values. And we don't think that's going to be good and work well for you or something like that. And, and, and under they're the based Foucauldian world, but under the Foucauldian world, that's just the, who's to say, what's to say as, as a homosexual relationship is or something like that. Um, so the, the people setting in line, like what, where their moral standards are like that. I mean, I, I mean, once again, I mean, I, I, you'd have to let them set what they set for their house and you can see that they're, they're, being that way but you can also see about how like who am i to tell them how far they take well, it or not i mean i think there's some level where i would say hey i think you're being a dickhead now well, but then there's I, another I, level where i, I say i understand yeah. like that we all kind of arbitrarily are drawing lines and i'm like open to other people having arbitrary lines and arbitrarily at some point i'm gonna say no that's i'm not gonna tolerate that one or i think you're going too far but my point is that if it's built on something you believe is a lie or, or sorry, not a lie is false. Then this is because that that was kind of the whole question. It was kind of getting yeah, yeah. I get that. Before. Like, if somebody has this belief that is crossing your line, and you're like, it's all ba based on this false idea. If I just change that, false but that's idea, the you, you but that's the part that I saw that you were asking the Mormons to imagine that that part's false, and and I go, <laughs> I yeah. think you could do it if you could imagine that part's false, but not not many of them could imagine that that part well, so that's it. what well, i was trying to that's what i was kind of you, you can imagine if mormonism was real i can but yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but they can no, that's but, the thing yeah i, I and that's I, just I, what i get is like I, I couldn't see how you could get them to stop and yeah. imagine that one like so that's kind that of thought experience that's kind like, of what you i was trying to like hey pope just imagine it ain't real give me 10 minutes of catholicism ain't true so when I was talking about the whole like five dimensional elves that I believe in that caused me to not be an alcoholic, I'm in shape and now I'm a better father thing, right? I, I'm, I'm kind of trying to point to the truth aspect of it because there's two aspects of this. There's the truth aspect and the harm aspect, right? And I had, I, I had the atheists and the Mormons sort of both on the same team when I said should, you should I talk my friend out of saying it was a five dimension? It was as false as yeah. a five dimensional. Elf. I no, I, I wasn't trying to insult them. I was. They trying might to say, be like, real, look, man. People say they see outside, them. If you're outside of Mormonism, that's how absurd you think Mormonism is. The same way that. But yeah. anyway, so wh what I'm trying to, what I was trying to get at with that is this whole like, if he believes in something that I think is obviously absurd, but it's clearly doing good things for him. Should I talk him out of it? And and it was funny watching because all the atheists were like, well, yeah, because. The five dimensional elves are bullshit, but then all the Mormons are there. They know what I'm doing. And so they're trying to like dance it. Like Jacob even said, like, we try to build on the principles that you already have and to like tell you what else is true. And I'm like, dude, what, what about the five dimensional elves is true? <laughs> like you're, you're going to eventually have he, to he tell gave me the response for like a Catholic. Sure. Like, but I'm yeah. A Catholic and, and that's doing good things. Like, that's kind of what I'm getting at. And that, but that that's the thing is that's how I view Mormonism is the five D elves, right? Like, so yeah. when, when you ask, is Mormonism bad for anybody? I'd say that, yes, it's bad for certain people. And I would tell those people if I, if I am very certain that Mormonism is bad for I you, I think gay I'll people probably try to talk you out of it. Yeah. Gay people should leave the church for sure. But, yeah. but I would say that if you had a control group of a thousand people and they all like, lived Mormon principles and, and believed in it and carried it out like they're supposed to, yada, yada, then I'd say 
the majority of them, if not the vast majority of them, would be better off. So, so that, that's kind of that's kind of my difference between because like Troy asked up there if uh, if Chris started believing in Scientology would me and Flip talk him out of it? And like, admittedly, I don't know as much about Scientology as I do about Mormonism, but what I do know about Scientology makes it seem pretty fucking terrible. And uh, yeah, I'd probably try to talk talk my friend out of that. This is more pragmatic then, for me than anything. So, so like, and that's what I think your 5D elf example is like, it can equally happen in the inverse. So like you believe in five a five dimensional elf and it makes your life better. What if your buddy believed in a 5D elf that made his life worse? Sure, yeah, talk about it. But I'm, the, I'm trying to take the, I'm so. But what I was doing with that is I mean, to I've been there. Element out I, of it. I was trying to take the I was trying to take the harm know. element out of it and just talk about truth. If it's an if if it's obvious bullshit that does good things, no, do you but, still talk them out of it the, the, just the, the because it's untrue. But no, no, you didn't take the harm element element out of it. The if it makes your life better, that's on that scale. So like. If you want to take the harm element out of it, you just say there's a person that's living their life and there's a five dimensional elf. Do you talk them out of it? What I'm saying is that the, you don't have to consider the adding harm. the inverse of harm, oh. which is benefit, then it changes the calculus. And then, well, but for, okay, Forrest, I can solve your harm issue right here. And we, I mentioned it earlier with the shit eating Spanish senator. Like, okay, as objectionable as I think that eating your own shit for any reason, let alone sexual gratification is. I think that's objectionable. I would rather tolerate that than have some kind of shit-eating police where we are actually enforcing the no shit-eating rule. Like, I can tell that that is worse. And as objectionable as I might think it is for a grandparent to say, look, you may not bring your same-sex uh, spouse to our family gatherings i can say well that's shitty but i think a world that enforces like that tells grandma and grandpa no, you no, don't make the rules arguing, about what you allowed in your house that's that worse way. that's more harm than agree, well agree. the gay guy that's can't go to in no way arguing for religion to be illegal yeah we're, we're not really talking well, no about but like but no that's my point though it's like okay like, so, uh, is grandma and grandpa harmful grandma, that's sure I, yeah no it's harm but yeah you know what life is harm and like okay like there's places that I'm not welcome. Does it cause me harm? Okay, but is is there more or less harm if I kick against the pricks? <laughs> you know, the kicking against the pricks. That's one of the biblical lessons that I really like. That like that's one of those lessons that's important. It's one of the things that I need to learn that I never fucking learn is no stop way. wasting your life kicking against the pricks. <laughs> and here's the thing about like the the gay grandchild and the spouse. It sucks, man, but don't kick against the pricks. Like, let me uh, let me uh, say. I mean, I named this thing um, "correct a fool in his folly," and I guess there's like a proverbs that they the two proverbs say the exact opposite thing one after another. Like one says, "fix the fool in the folly," and the very next prophet, proverb says, "don't never fix a fool in his folly." Type deal. But in that proverb, the concept is you come across them in the road, and in in my life, like I don't lie. I don't lie about my position about the church to anybody. Um, but I wait until I come across the fool in the road, if that makes sense. And uh, what I don't do is like go marching into that mountain looking for like the 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 fool to correct them type deal. And I, I think yeah. it's also true with like the the woke uh, situation or whatever. Or there's like, absolutely some... a thing with gay Mormons look picking a fight. Yeah. Like that is an absolute phenomenon where they will go and pick a well, fight with their well, Mormons. Probably because they're the ones that have seen the harm the most. No, no, yeah. they can walk away from church. Like that's the thing. Our our whole thing is like church is a voluntary organization. Look, if you are the, the whole if, the whole point is gay, they know that there's gay youth well, in the church, okay, and they Forrest, know what it's like to have been the gay one that has suffered harm from the okay, church. Forrest, if you are Mormon, which is that you have faith in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and you are gay, then you need to take up your cross and walk. If you are gay and you don't have faith in the church, in that, for example, you believe that there's nothing wrong with being gay, then you ain't Mormon. So fucking leave. 
No, it's but a my voluntary point organization. Is, if you, you are a, the if you're a good person that cares about the well-being of other gay people, then you're going to say, "Hey, gay person in the church, that's no, 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 no. false. You don't need to take." Not if they're Mormons. Not if they're faithful Mormons. If they're faithful Mormons, they believe it. It's their faith, and it is to to is impose it? ourselves on their faith is a greater evil than to let them persist in the false faith. So, so, so the other if, thing is, if, if Chris was joining Scientology, would you impose yourself? Impose myself? No, I would talk to him. Well, that's what I'd tell him what I know about it. it. I'm not talking about law. I'm not I've talking about law. Facebook groups and arguing and debating. No, no, no. But I'm, but I'm saying what I impose, but like, you know, would you I say like, what you're talking like, out of it? Would I, would would I make a rule like this is not allowed in my house? I wouldn't make that rule. No. No. Would you try to talk but, Chris out of Scientology? Well, sure. But what do you mean by talk him out of it? You know, because here's the thing. It's like, because I've talked to a lot of people out of the church, but it's not because I was trying to talk what him I mean out is of the that, church. That's what a gay person that you, you're saying is like attacking the church. And, and again, this is a little no, bit. No, no, I'm not necessarily attacking not the church. I talked about I'm picking not a fight. all actions that ex Mormons are doing. I'm saying if an ex Mormon says, hey, other members of the church that I think are gay, like you don't have to be a part of this organization because here are the reasons why I think it's a false religion. And now I'm hopefully being able to free you from that bearing the cross that you don't actually have to bear. I but, think that's hey. coming from a loving position. That's my but, whole point. Sure, but for us, but some some people have heard your message, and they are still faithful. Like Jacob isn't gay; he he knows what you think, and he's unconvinced. He yeah. knows what I think; he's unconvinced. He has a faith. There are faithful gay Mormons. But we, we can we tell them all day long about how the church ain't true. People leaving the church don't leave the church on their first encounter with an issue. Sometimes they do, but oftentimes they don't. Well, okay. I mean, I <laughs> well, yeah right. so that's that's uh that's kind of the crux of it with me and this is one of the strange things about it too is that like i also wouldn't tell you for us to stop to stop preaching either you know? yeah, yeah, no, yeah, like, yeah. yeah um the the i think i was saying earlier that whatever conclusions about the church are i actually think i think you and i are pretty darn close about what we conclude about the universe and world and type stuff as far as like yeah uh, almost certainly is this yeah. true or or what do we believe about a god and and all that sorts of deal and so like everything from there is kind of just like these levels of uh how much do we how much do we uh <clears throat> bring the world our truth <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah. deal <laughs> stuff. and um uh Part of, um, I guess, what we do in general is, and maybe we are a bit evangelical for the type of, don't go into falling into Reddit, yeah. Reddit, Dylanism type stuff if yeah, you're going yeah. to leave. Uh, but we don't say don't leave. Uh, <laughs> but I don't know if you ever heard me say, for well, like, this is, my, uh, like my, my answer to Garden and Jacob. I think you guys do do that. <laughs> no, I that's what I'm saying. Is we say we say. We would be evangelical of don't go to Reddit exactly. Dylanism. Um, yeah. Well, no, no. It almost yeah, yeah. seems like harm doesn't exist. If you're talking about harm, you're just uh, well. No, it's it's not that harm doesn't exist. It's that it's not that harm doesn't exist. It's just that that's not the central thing. Like I don't know if you've heard of ever. Yeah, I say I say it's like a true. I I I think I place looking for the true thing over what's the harmful thing, but. Like, well, my I answer to Cardin and Jacob, Jared's question was like, at what, when do you get involved in someone else's truth? Yeah, it's how stupid does a belief have to be before the, yeah. like, but, it doesn't so, matter how beneficial like, it is. I, I say it's kind of more like, when does it, like, encounter me? And and I, I know yeah. that there's, like, some criticisms of... Uh, sure, and but that's what I was trying to get at. What I was trying to get at is, is, like... Is if it doesn't get at you, and if if it's not a harmful belief, is there a level of stupid that a person can believe in that you would try to talk them out of it just because it's so dumb? Only if I encountered them, like I wouldn't. I yeah. mean, I, there was no, a weird exactly. time frame because Flip and I have been like around skeptical worlds. So well, and the, the problem, the problem that the Mormons yeah. have with this is that they have that whole "by their fruits you shall know them," and if the five D elves yield good fruit, then it's actually really difficult. 
to talk them out yeah. of that. And, the, and they got to explain to me what, because that's a really precarious balance. If I had a brother who's an alcoholic who believed in, in the elves um, and he didn't stop, I'd be like, fuck, I don't want to, like, I am not convinced that I have an alternative to this that would keep you out of alcoholism as well as the five D elves. And so maybe I'm just not going to fuck to me, touch that. How is that the most it's clear example? Harm, you're using a benefit. You're not making it just about truth. You're making it about truth plus a benefit. No, the reason I'm adding the benefit is because I'm trying to see if, like, it's there's only benefits. How untrue does it have to be before you talk them out? Yeah, yeah. but also, like, I, Forrest, I disagree with you that the, the, the LGBTQ issues are the most clear example of harm in the church now. No, they just have the loudest advocates. They're not the most clear example. So, so, so what's a more clear example? I mean, you find somebody w with a louder advocate. I mean, how about women? The feminists have a lot to say about that. Just ordinary straight women are apparently I mean, well, living in a nightmare wanna, of whatever. But like, no, but here's... You, I agree but, that but this is where... The case also. <laughs> but for us, this is what, like, the crux of the thing is, like, because I don't know if you ever heard me say, like, because my answer to, like, Cardin and your brother, because, like, I realized this 20 years of being an ex-Mormon. There are exactly two reasons that I don't go to church. Can you guess what they are? And I say this specifically in the contents because, like, so many people say, like, well, I don't go to church because of historical because issues. And I don't go to church because of boring as hell. <laughs> exactly. Those are the two reasons. Yeah, I don't believe in it's boring. <laughs> Those are the two reasons. I don't believe in it and it's boring. But, like, because all these people are like, oh, historical issues, oh, LGBT policy, all this stuff. It's like, when they say, I left the church for these things, I wonder, like, what was your religion when you were in? I don't know what you believed in, if that's the case. Because, like, if you believe in the church and you believe in God and you believe in the prophets, then fucking go with it, you know? And if you don't, then one of my favorite things about Mormonism is that it is built into Mormon doctrine that whether or not you are Mormon is a personal choice that has to be left up to you. Like that's the Mormons have like, that's a dogma of Mormonism is that you are allowed to leave, which is a big thing in their favor. <laughs> right. You know, and their God commands them to love us even though we left. And my experience is that Mormons by and large, yeah, but, but are, you've, you've seen very my nice. brother's, definition of love and how he can use love to perpetuate his the belief love isn't yeah. hey let gay people in your house that's not the love that mormons are talking about yeah i don't know because again like i from my experience is the vast majority of mormons will allow the gay person in the house and they'll just say like yeah we don't we don't agree with this but okay and, and, and this is where you know what, like let me ask well here's the thing like because like um uh if my my mom, for example, says, like, please don't bring wine into my home. I might say, how dare you, mother? I don't believe in your Joseph Smith no, and his I, rules I think there's about an arbitrary wine. Line, and I draw my arbitrary line at a spouse. But, well, what if they would don't you, believe would you? And this spouse? isn't just being a... a like, they believe in a Mormon concept of marriage. You, that's not a spouse. Would you, in a that's future world buddy. where there's more polyamorous spouses, like, would you say that? Yeah. Uh, what if, like what if they said uh, I won't I allow your polygamist? What if what if it's not gay? It's a polygamist. What would if the you same be grandparents... upset at those same parents not being down with the, with completely heterosexual polyamorous spouses? So my not answer to all of this, my, my answer to all of this, well, I would be upset if their justification was because the Mormon God told me so. I'd say, oh, I don't think that exists. Here's why. So why else? Is it a problem? So what if it was something obviously de degenerate, but then they use that reason? So like, this is my, this is Mr. Slave. I, I, would, I would disagree with this that. Is Mr. Slave, <laughs> and, yeah. and Mr. Slave is going to come yeah. in and, and do I, I, anal I, puppetry <laughs> uh, for the family. And they say, yeah, no, I, because Mormonism. Okay, well, now I have a problem with them. <laughs> well, I mean, I would just say, I disagree for a different reason. And whether I would argue it at that moment is a different question. Like it's to get question. Your Mormonism is stupid, but you stop, Mr. Slater. Is it special? Is, yeah, is yeah, gay maybe. special? Yeah. Is there anything special about being gay? Special? I would say the opposite. I think being gay is not that special. So I don't know why it's okay. a huge deal to people. So okay. So it's not special. Okay. So like is there anything special about having rape fantasies or also, special like, about wanting to have lots of 
Is it special? Like, is is there anything actually, special about I mean, any sexual preference? What do you mean by special here? Like they're for just like okay, because kind of, I believe I, I have my own the thing is like, window that I have drawn. Yeah. Okay, but like the point is like there's an enormous there is an the vast canvas of human sexuality is off limits within Mormonism, and gayness is just one little patch in a whole world of sexuality that is prohibited within Mormonism. Yeah, but that's what I mean. Are gays special? I, I think like because gay people like in the church, like oh, I am sexually well, attracted yeah, to so the, people of the there's same there's sex, in, and the church says of the those... church says repress that and pray, and 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 get it be in a heterosexual marriage and follow the rules and all this stuff. Like some women have violent sexual fantasies that if they are fulfilled would involve so, a man really going breaking covenants. Like, of, breaking of, covenants. This is literally just the Mormon argument of like being gay is just like how I like big boobs. No, no. Being gay is in an entire – it sits within the Mormon worldview. There's an entire category of prohibited sexual activity of I which gay is My just is that the one Mormon thing. Is false, and so I'm going to argue against that so that way okay. it shatters. That's the whole point. Well, no. Okay. Argue against them, but that's fine. But – if grandma and grandpa say, we hear you, Forrest, we disagree, and please leave us alone about this Forrest, thing. Forrest, do you think uh, – this might be just a whole other tangent, but do you, do you like, um, believe the born this way thing? Uh, for the most part, yeah. And I think Mormonism shot themselves in the foot once they kind of went to that position. Because they choose born, born this way. way. Yeah, I think so you once, seen... you, once you believe you're born that way, it's like the Mormon church doesn't have uh, any way to maneuver their doctrine around it because it's not something that was learned or taught. Yeah. So uh, have you seen like a little bit how like the LGBTQ or queer theory community now argues against the born this way concept? Uh, No, but it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, look up. I mean, NPR's Radio Lab did a two-part series on the whole entire thing on how they're glad it didn't get passed in the uh, um, in the Supreme Court because they are now against the concept of born this way. But I mean, that kind of pushes more into the queer theory type stuff. But if you take like a leftist postmodernist view, and I've pointed to this like with libidinal economy with Leotard a bunch of times, is that if you were to take their world of social constructivism literally they also believe that homosexuality isn't much different than just liking big boobs because it was yeah. socially constructed. Yeah. No, yeah. Say that. No, like, cause like, I mean, cause the whole, I like say, the thing I wonder about is life, you probably, if you have young gay people in your life or if you've known them since they were young, oftentimes you could predict it even before they hit puberty. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. And maybe, again, but maybe not, but... Constructivist thing, it's like, it's the same argument for like boys and girls are a blank slate. It's like, you only believe that if you are completely retarded. <laughs> like, okay, but so because that's thing is like, uh, many women, including very nice Mormon girls from Utah County, have like I, I have been told that they started at eight years old have violent rape fantasies. Were they born that way? And 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 should they? Should they pursue that because it's just their nature, or well, is it okay if, if the prophet comes along and says, "Sister, so sister, you, nice lady from I'm, Utah so, so County"? Question, do you think that I'm arguing that everyone should just pursue their sexual fantasies? No, 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 not necessarily. So, so but what I'm do you think I am arguing? I, I think I think because we're we're doing like kind of like some Trent Horn testing the the. Yeah, no, it's like, it's like limits and, and you know, you've already said that there's arbitrary lines and that type of stuff. If, if but, you have rape oh. fantasies, you probably have other ways to set to sexually satisfy yourself. But if you're a straight up gay dude, I don't know if straight it wouldn't be a straight up gay dude, but if you're just a really gay dude, we, it's not like oh, just just go have I, sex with a girl that'll also except satisfy they do you. it. Although, no, except they I think do it all, all of us are like, they do it all board. the time. That's the one thing that's weird is that I know yeah. so many gay men but with a bunch children. of us. I, I'm pretty sure if I get all drunk of us are fully enough. on board with the very, very square gay couple. We are all fully on board of like that should be that should be cool, yeah. fine, you know, get over it. The type type deal of people are like that, and and a bunch of our non woke heroes are those types exactly. Um, but uh, 
Um, as far as um, the other stuff goes, you can kind of get to why it starts becoming like a larger philosophical question. And um, I, I get your point that you don't like it, that it's based in Mormonism, that people aren't able to find that same arbitrary line yeah. to allow um, that that thing in. But then my, my point at, at that level would be the argument is now back to the age old uh, truthfulness of Mormonism and and not the harm argument, if that yeah. makes sense. Like we got to well, go like, back to the well, like like Forrest. I think like I think where you and I this for really like having a moral reason to get involved. That's the reason. Think, yeah, yeah. Well, no, but I think Forrest. Like I think where you and I are breaking is because like I am with you. Like and the part where you're like, hey, I'm gonna leave. I spilt shitty gin all over myself and I'm tired. <laughs> so you guys have fun. <laughs> I gotta go soon too, but um. Now I've lost my train of thought. Like in the in the sense of that your message is like, hey Mormons, your dumb shit is based on dumb shit and you're wrong. <laughs> and um and like this whole thing where you don't want to let your gay grandchildren to the house, that's stupid and intolerant. Now I am so devoted to that principle of tolerance that I'm gonna tolerate you being intolerant. That's how tolerant I am. Because I'll say I'll tell house. you I think you're being lame. But I then I'm happy. Really, but I'm also happy to walk away and say, "God bless you." You know, Godspeed. Do do so what at, you at think. At what point that. your house I guess is here, your own? And Jared hits on this with the RFM debate a bunch. <laughs> do you believe you are your brother's keeper? I mean, in like the grand philosophical sense. Well, what I mostly mean is, do you think it's loving for you to try to help people you care about? Uh, well, no. Yeah. No. Look. Try to. For us, yes, to try, but my like for me, there's this question of like, how long do you try before trying is more harm? Like, you're it's better to leave them alone. That's my point. Is like, for me, it's enough to say my opinion is that you should tolerate your gay grandchildren. You don't, you don't have to accept it, you don't have to give it your theological blessing, but if you let them into your home. I you also don't think you're sorry. understanding the, but, the 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 snowball effect of ramifications that happens with a belief like this one we're talking about with grandparents. So the grandparents don't let their grandkids in the house. How do you think those grandkids' parents, aka the kids of the grandparents, how are they, where are they going to go for Christmas? Now? Yeah, no, I know, I know, it sucks. But how far are you willing to go to change their behavior? My like, point is just what, that what, I'm how much to, to some degree I'm willing to argue. I'm willing to just debate. Okay, no, exactly. But that's, that. the that's like, the point. But like once you've stated your case and they say we hear you. Oh, no, no, but, no. So, so I, let me, I, let me tell you. A dead horse. I think that that's important and that's how people change their mind. Often it takes multiple attempts. It's not like a one Well, sure. Time. Well, no. So let, I mean, let, like, let me tell you something from my Because then you have to let it go. But that's part of tolerance. You have to let it go. You have to let it sit. You have to let it bubble. I'll let, I'll let it bubble. I mean, I'm not arguing for laws. I'm not arguing for any of this. I'm just saying Mormons are in the same boat that ex-Mormons are in. We're all trying to argue our case because we, and again, this is a generalization because obviously there's bad actors on all sides, probably more on the ex-Mormon side. But just because we're arguing uh, against Mormonism, it doesn't mean that it's coming out of a hostile place. It might be coming out of the same place that it's coming out of for Mormon. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, um uh when it comes to like the thing about being kept out of the home of a parent or a grandparent that's being like that so a lot of this comes from our anecdotal experiences right and so like i have to bring in my anecdotal experience where i was never around my grandmother because she was uh, extremely verbally abusive to my mother and so i was kept away from her because you don't go around a person who's abusive like in that way and was it was a harm caused to me like what, what i'm saying about that is like maybe if those parents are acting or being abusive in a way not being around them is, is yeah, like a better thing if grandma and grandpa well, are such I mean, shitty bigots well what are you missing out on 100 percent, i agree but <laughs> if you could change this belief that they have about this religion and change that then wouldn't that be a good avenue what? in all directions? It would say, okay, but well, sure, sure, but 
stop them from being bigots. Getting into changing their belief in God. Okay, but this is where you're getting into the territory where, like, you know, whenever, whenever somebody wants like, to not be yeah. not to be verbally abusive to yeah, like, my yeah, mother. If, if your if your grandma was verbally be abusive because if, you believed in a five dimensional elf, and you could show her <laughs> with some evidence that this five D elf did. didn't exist, I guess. But like, my that answer to that always for us, you try to pursue. Like, I, the, I agree. Like, so that's magic. back to me saying, like, I agree with like getting back to the truth. Like, as soon as we get to a thing where, like, okay, we're back to an issue here where we can maybe argue about a truth claim here rather than a harm claim. But there's no, also so the other the, question of like, could reason, I tell my grandma, like, like grandma, don't issue. you notice you're harming my my mother when you say those terrible things to her? Um, no, what I'm saying is the reason you're at that issue is because there's a harm that's happening. Otherwise, you just both live your lives in parallel and you do your thing and. It wouldn't come up. But as soon as there's like this tension or this problem, that's the impetus to now have a debate about the truth. That's kind of the the whole framework that I had answered Jared's question about is like, there's only two reasons I really care to get involved is one, the person's just like, hey, Forrest, I love truth. Let's talk about truth, regardless of where it leads us. That person, I'll say, all right, here are my opinions. Or it's the person that's, their belief is causing some harm, aka your theoretical or actual grandma i guess um yeah well, that was a if, if that was being caused was by a, a false belief then you could attack that belief in hopes of I mean, causing down her uh, downstream positive effects i mean the, but things like if if your target is false beliefs like you're you're, <laughs> you're just bound to leave so many things on the table i mean i guess i don't know like you got to pick your battles but I don't know, like, it's that like, I'm, okay, I'm with you, you almost all the way, except for the part, like, for me, it's like, you know, like, for example, like, my Mormon aunt and uncle that are great, like, they know I'm an atheist. I've told them the whole thing, like, I don't go to church because I'm boring, because it's boring, and I don't believe in it. Wait, 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 and, like, and they're totally the fine. With, and, and, like, you have like, because you don't meet my criteria. My criteria is false belief and harmful. They're not being harmful, so you have no reason to engage with them like that. Well, I don't know, like, I mean... Like so, oh, a wow. false belief that's harmful. Harmful. Um, here's a harm. A false belief that's harmful is that um, high fructose corn syrup is bad, but other sugars are not. And and if that's the now case, that is I, a pervasive I never, belief. I would never fault you for <laughs> arguing someone, arguing that belief to somebody. Okay, but like that that belief is so pervasive. I think that I would cause more harm to myself if anyone. <laughs> if well, I. But- so, right. so I go to the it's same the So I've been – that's something I was going to bring up earlier is that we've been around the skeptic world. And it, to me, it really seemed almost like 2010, 11, 12, like the atheism stuff was getting old hat. And now we were just going to argue diets and stuff for the rest of eternity. Uh, but <laughs> And then all this stuff kind of like reared its ugly head. And, but we really did get into those like kind of diet things because like major, major fads came out in like the diet world. And like they seemed to like take over the world and, and – I'd almost kind of do the same thing. Like I'd leave people alone with their weird false belief about, uh, you know, whatever fructose corn syrup or whatever. But then as soon as they approached me with it, that's when I'd say no. So, and so I'd correct them yeah, type not, stuff. And, not just approaching you. What if it was your mom and dad? Well, that I did that in my thing. I was going to ask Flip the same thing. I know I had this. Well, I did tell my parents. I've never told my brothers and siblings. Uh, my my sister and my two brothers, anything about my disbelief because they'd never asked. But my parents both one time did ask me and confront me and I started unloading and they said, stop, 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 stop. And I stopped, but I, I did like, I did, like I didn't hide or lie or say anything about it, but I waited, I waited until they asked about it. But to your credit, I don't know that my parents are extremely are, you know, kind of, Mitt Romney Mormons. I don't know how else to say it. They're extremely kind of a uh, Jim Bennett e type Mormons, you know, and uh, so they wouldn't have like any sort of major problem with any sort of LGBT uh, type person, and probably wouldn't have even had it 15 years ago. But I was wondering if you flip, like, did you well, ever actually get to talking about your belief or not with your parents? Did it ever come up, or did it? Well, so my dad was always Jack Mormon, and I talk to him about absolutely everything my mom was just uninterested in theological stuff she just believed and did not want to talk about it but talking about uh forest like um oh wait what are you drinking forest whiskey what kind it's a uh, fray ranch out of nevada don't know what that is but um uh my mom for example talking about uh 
false beliefs that cause harm. Uh, I take her to Costco and she always buys like in this, you know, a few years ago because she's like, take me to Costco because I'm old. So I took her to Costco and uh, she buys this some um, hideously overpriced, totally bogus, ineffective dietary supplement that's ostensibly to help old people with their eyes. And like, so exactly one time I'm like, you know, mom, this stuff doesn't work. And she's like, well, I like it anyway. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I fucking dropped it. I'm not going to fight. I know goddamn better than to fight with mom. But like this but, shit costs 40 bucks and it's complete crap. And she's sending it to but, crooks. But obviously there is a I line. Just that drop if, it. If, if it was bad for her health, would you start to be a pushier? I mean, no. Well, okay, maybe. But like the way she eats is already bad for her health. Like, we can talk about the other things she buys at Costco. Sorry, sorry. Again, this <laughs> like, is this is an important distinction. No, but yeah, like I'm talking about a false belief causing a problem. No, 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 no that's not harm. No, her. no, but I've definitely let that go with my mom her, and her terrible. She's an diet. old woman mm -hmm. who's wasting good money on garbage. Yeah, but I mean, obviously, there's a line of like, works. okay, I'm she's not going to fight him. of fraud. That's harm. <laughs> yeah, but I'm saying there's more out of money that cause you to get involved. What? I'm saying there's more harmful things that would eventually cross your threshold. Like no, no, no. I got away. involved. I she said, Will you find this thing for me? And I said, What is it? It's for my eyes. And I got up, I pulled my phone out and I looked it up and I'm like, Mom, this is crap. And she's like, Well, I like it. Okay. Like, cause and it's causing harm every time she buys the shit. It causes her like $48 of harm. Just money being sent so, to let's go, let's go to a different thing because like flip we've been out a long time both you and i it's not zero that we didn't we have it's not zero preaching we haven't we we haven't been zero preachers oh yeah atheism. i have talked a we, lot of people out uh, of church we've I've done talked it. lots of people out um of church. maybe backed off in recent years and, and maybe some of that too is because like it felt like a little bit like the tide has changed like like the church well, is against the ropes in a lot of ways but um I think part of the reason, like, uh, I think part of the reason why I was I am effective at talking people out of the church is that it's never my goal for people to leave the church. Like I just talk about the things that people are interested in with church, and then they end up not believing in stuff anymore. But like I, you know, like there are some people that like I might say like especially like like I'm gay and I think that the prophet is wrong about gayness and I'd say like well then you should not be Mormon, you know, like no, that's what, my what, advice. What if you're like. like what if they're like, I'm gay, and the prophet's telling me I need to marry a woman, so I'm going to? And I'd say, then take up your cross. Be a good Mormon. Pay your tithing. Um, follow, read your scriptures. Go to church. Follow follow the commandments. Be the best goddamn Mormon you can. Be a good parent. F do the things. Take up your cross. Do you think that if you believe it, if you believe it, then the you believe it. I obviously understand. If they believe it, then. They believe it. What I'm asking is, if you think it's false, is it good for you to encourage them to believe that when you know that you think it's false and it's going to cause problems? I What I know is under that... False pretenses. Th here's the thing is that this is what I know, Forrest, is that my opinion, whatever my opinion is, I know better than to try to meddle with it. Like, I know better that than to push it too far. I, I don't think I know. I want to tell out of school, but didn't I, you one time get kind of attacked by a guy when you were uh, talking about leaving the church or something like that? I thought. Oh yeah, no, there was a exactly that. I knew a guy who was gay and Mormon, incredibly depressed. Flip, Flip got physically and, attacked. Yeah, no, like the guy, he wrapped his hands around my throat and said, "You don't know what you're talking about." When I said exactly, basically exactly this, like, look, if you believe the church, then believe the church. If you don't. Then walk away. And he, yeah, he was really mad. I, I wonder how that guy is. That guy was sad. Man, I, man, I'd forgotten about that. That was crazy day. Man, that was what, 15 years ago now? It was a long time ago, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, like that, yeah, just, just perfect example. Yeah, for some people, fucking leave it alone. Just let it go, you know? Like, I mean, it, 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 it's, 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 it's like, you know, it's like your crazy aunt that only eats organic food. Like just fucking let it go. Oh, dude, my mom would go. die. It. I mean, make, I... Brother. make make it your brother or your son. Like I don't know why it's always just random strangers. What, they're Mormons. About it. They yeah, most of my family was Mormon. I 
I had this conversation with my brother. My brother was talking about, like, I don't know. I'm having issues with the church. And I told him, like, hey, I've been out of the church. I might know something. And he's like, yeah, I don't want to talk to you about it. And I'm like, okay. I think my all of my immediate family would be significantly less happy outside of the church or not with it. But um, I'm not saying that that's the case. I'm saying that yeah. certain cases, sure, the gay case is the easy case. It would be more than likely better if they weren't in the church. Obviously, yeah, there's a I ton of people say, that are like really cold yeah. for the church, yeah. and they will crush it in the church, and they'll have great happy lives. And taking them out of the church could be very risky. I understand that. I'm just saying that there's plenty of cases where, and I don't think we ever got a clear answer. So let's go to the Japanese case real quick. Yeah. The Japanese case was some Japanese naval officer um, talking to, I think it was Hinkley. So, yeah, my and only was, question that is like, are you imagining I'm Hinkley or I'm me? Like, and who's you know? Because uh, you the point are, is Hinkley obviously believes that he's. No, my point you know. is you're you. You are you. From your perspective, is what that Japanese naval officer doing a good thing, or would you advise against it? But wouldn't so. And, and I don't know, Flip, are you track? So it's, it's a hard, is, it's a hard, yeah, I showed the video. Like, I showed his, the video. His culture is going to, or no, no, his job was going to like suffer from it and his family was going to be disappointed. Um, So like, let's just say, for, make it easy. Like his career would be ended, let's say. And to me, well, like, my whole, my, my post was saying, don't, can't you guys see from a non-believer's perspective that this it'd false, be, it'd be obvious from a non-believer some really bad stuff in his life. Yeah. From but also from like, perspective, it's the obvious choice. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but also from a non-believer's perspective, like I can believe that somebody can trip their way into happiness. You know, that that's yeah, the thing that I mean, happens. We're obviously, we're just working on probabilities here. It's like, it's our best guess. Because it, it, part of this reminds me, what was the, uh, not analogy, but the story of like, it's like maybe, I think you guys talked about it. It was like this Japanese farmer's son died and everyone was upset oh, about it. He said, oh, how horrible. He said, maybe. And then because yeah, the son yeah. died, he won the lottery and they're like, how great. He said, maybe. Like, no, it was yeah. the Lynn talking Obviously, about it. We, it was a Buddhist thing and it came up in general conference, last general conference, that story. Um, the uh, You never know if like it's lucky or not. Like general conference talked about it and, and John DeLynn was mad that they talked about it because he said, they stole that from Buddhism. Um, but it, uh, because like measuring how stuff shakes out gener generationally is always kind of weird, but that brings yeah. up the question that I already asked you is like, what about the reverse question, um, of asking an LDS person to leave behind his whole culture? Because obviously too, in that same framework, we're imagining that Japanese culture, some sort of Shintoism that's, is it harmful? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I hardly know very much about it. I mean, I, I, <laughs> there was you can watch the shogun tv series and see like how extremely uh difficult and patriarchal that that you know very 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 formal the, that the, i guess my point would just be the whole framing of the conversation even from the mormon perspective was that it was so valiant or such an act of faith for him to accept this negative seeming thing because he believed in the afterlife so like it wasn't like they're saying like no 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 like from a utilitarian perspective this is actually going to work out for you better on earth that wasn't what he was like, saying i like i think i don't know Forrest. i think because like we're all having a hard time kind of nailing down what the difference is and like i'm coming up but with that's what i'm having to fun it, trying like, to sort out yeah really, because like what i've actually been about, trying like, to sort this out for years is that really, like because like, like for us like, like how much do we do we I think, bugger into people's lives or not? About I stuff? think like Chris and I totally get your view because like you have this view from like outside of Mormonism and you can look at it and be like, well, that's all. All that dumb Mormon stuff is clearly wrong. Right. But I think that where Chris and I are, because like we were there, is that like, yeah, we have that view. But the view we don't have is God's view. We don't have the God's eye view. And so, yeah, sure. From from here, some Mormons are being dumb to be Mormon. Okay. Sure seems that way. But I don't have the big grand picture and I know enough about the world to know better than to push that further than but I this need is to. Where yeah, I, I agree like, with that. 
not in an insulting way. I just don't believe you guys. I know we could come up with plenty of situations where people are believing false things that you would get involved. Well, yeah, but no, but to a degree, like, you, I mean, for example, I say, look, suicide bomber for Muslim, you would definitely be like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. I'm going to well, wait. Involved. What do you mean? Like, okay. Sure, like, just like, like, just like in everything, wrong, we start or... pushing the extent cases of stuff. There's, there's yeah, situations but that's, where, what I, what, so that's a reduction. Yeah. Okay, like, well, like, for instance, brings up something I brought up earlier. Yeah. Is that like, cause like, you know, like one of the paradoxes of like the woke world is that they believe in women's rights and they're anti-colonialism, right? So then what do we do about the Taliban? Because the Taliban is one of, like, live, being a woman, being a young girl under the Taliban is one of the worst places to be a young girl on planet Earth, especially from the view of the woke. Okay, we don't like that. We'd like it to stop. Okay, how can we stop it? With the fucking Marines. And a puppet government. Okay, well, we didn't like that. Okay, well, pick your poison, right? Now, this is kind of extreme example, but this is really what it comes down to with the Mormon gay, the Mormon, the Mormon grandparents and the gay kids. Like, okay, I don't like it, but do I want to send the fucking gay police over there and, and enforce the goodness? No, I think that's the worst evil. Yeah, but you're comparing arguing somebody out of a belief to the gay police which is not what i'm yeah. advocating no that is it's like, it we're, like, like we're, but, grandma and grandpa you may not you may not practice your belief by rational discussion then i would say yeah we should definitely pursue no, because that's where it comes down to. look you don't think you don't think we've tried to explain to the taliban why it's okay that girls can read that that's okay that that well, women should be able to drive cars well, you don't hey, think how about this? you don't would think you hillary clinton somebody, has tried to explain to, to the left. taliban would you lecture somebody to not to just give up on the Taliban that is trying to convince them? Would you say, "Hey, we don't have uh, God's eye view. Maybe those Forrest, women are actually happier." 20, of course, we lived through twenty years of of American Taliban I, yeah, repression. I'm not, I'm not arguing for like the, we the we know what it looks like when we try to talk them out of it. Bring your democracy to the. To you're the, the like, you're the one arguing that we shouldn't be <laughs> handling the Taliban because. I didn't we know. No, I didn't say shouldn't. I said pick your poison. We don't know if those women are going to be happier in the as as a member of. You know, would the they be? That, that's how fractal like, this type of argument gets. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, we're basically looking at a national scale of America first or neoconism type stuff in yeah. the, the conservative world. Do you spread your truth to the world, or do you like, yeah. leave your loan and and handle your own type stuff? And what, obviously, what the answer is for, always kind of like. You got What's it. worse for little Pashtun girls, you know, the Taliban or drone strikes? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, but like if a few, if how a few much can we drive, the Are school? you really saying that my arguing someone out of a religion is equivalent to Jones? No, 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 no. But I'm saying mm -hmm. like if I was like, arguing for the, the police to, to go in and, and no. arrest Mormons, you'd have an argument. But I'm no, not but, but I think, like at some point you state your case and then you have to decide if the battle is worth it. No, it's like, like do you, do you, do you, you know get about involved General or do you Pierce? not get involved? Can you change something? Will you not change something? Will you make it better? Yeah. Will you make it worse? Will you would you create some sort of a could you just create yeah. a, a vortex and what fills a vortex? And that's that's one of my larger yeah. questions is like if you could snap your fingers and eradicate the Mormon belief right now. And the same question was asked to Hitchens, and, and Hitchens backed off of it at least for one or two people. But um, if you could snap your fingers and all the people in in Salt Lake suddenly stopped believing Mormonism, uh, would you do it? But the question is, is like, what fills the void? And and yeah. the void that gets filled up, in in, in my view, it, it's woke shit. It's not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and. No. Um, I mean, not 100%, is, but enough of this it. This is that, where I think the argument goes. That's not my argument. I'm saying mm -hmm. you have one person who is clearly. The individual, I'd always say what's better for the individual 100% yeah, yeah. time. And say you can follow talk is to true. Individuals. No, no. And say follow is true. You don't say that, though. That's what the, that's what the problem is. No, no, no. no. You, where would you I say your case? Look. Where it's clear that, that the person believing in Mormonism is harming their life. Yes, we don't have God's eye view. It's my my no, opinion, okay. and you're saying leave them alone if they don't they don't take. Okay, no. It's so like for example, no, say follow what they ago, believe like, to be true. I was like, like, I, like if I they believe work, Mormonism is false, they should leave the Mormonism. I was at I work and I was either. talking to my good friend um, at work about COVID shit, 
and I was making the whole argument about how um, almost everything they told us early on um, turned out to be not true. And like, and she's kind of going back and forth. And at one point she said, you're not going to change my mind. And I said, okay. And I dropped the subject forever because I could hammer home my point or I could keep my friend. Like now she's persisting under her weird NPR delusions about COVID. There's harm in that. But so, I yeah, think there's greater harm in ending uh, uh, my friendship with my coworker. Let me give like more more specific it. answer to the Japanese questions. Like, what would I actually say to the kid? I would be honest with the kid that I don't believe it like that. That's not so, what I believe, or I would do. But if you believe it that way, you should do what you believe. That's what I would say to the kid. So I get the. I guess the the actual question is: Would you say anything to him? Oh yeah. Yeah, I'd be uh, if he asked. Yeah, if he asked directly. Yeah, um, and then can you see how your you talking to him is coming from a loving position? Oh yeah, yeah, totally. And that was but, the whole point of of that post <laughs> was, hey guys, can't you see that if an ex Mormon sees this and doesn't believe in the afterlife, they're not being hostile or mean or negative. They actually want what's best for this person, and that was. I mean, you saw it. it was impossible for. They're like, but it's, but it is true. <laughs> I'm like, okay, all right. Yeah, I, I only scanned some of the comments, but I, I mean, I get it now. I part of a uh, what I was pointing out later is is kind of getting that they just weren't going to grasp that I had to put on a different truth hat, and um, I, I know that's like an impossible thing to kind of think about with them or, or type deal, but. Um, obviously any Mormon, any ex LDS person, I think, I actually even think the ones kind of going about it. Um, some of them are just trying to like maybe be doing the tear down thing, but I, I'm one who tends to think that the, especially from even the woke, like I think for a lot of them, unless they're like a top level Machiavellian person using it for their own devices, most people are doing it from the heart and, and, but everything's like a little bit of a, um, what would you call it? Kind of like an immune system. And you can have like, you can have a disease and you can have an autoimmune disease. And sometimes like caring so hard can become a little bit like an autoimmune disease, if that makes any sort of sense. Um, the, the, the idea of going out and saving every single possible person from something that you think they need saved from, which I don't think you're doing. Um, because I have absolutely no problem like with like a channel. Like if you're barking something to the ether because you're putting out a channel saying like people might be interested in coming and see this on my channel. I don't think that's invading any sort of thing. I don't think thoughtful faith is invading anything because they kind of welcome and, and invite that into their their world right there. So I'm just kind of more imagining some other third place or fourth place or whatever where we're marching in and how much do we say or don't say to the average normie who's getting involved or getting, cause I mean, I guess choice question is a good question. Cause if somebody was getting talked up into Scientology, I'd probably say, Hey, uh, I don't know about, have you heard about this other stuff with those types of deal? Yeah. Would I do the same thing with Mormonism? I probably would. Like if it, if it like, yeah, you should check out this other stuff before you yeah. really get fully involved. Like, I think that, I would. That was, no, like, like, I, 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 that's my message to people going down the woke path. Like I, I saw my cousin's wife a few years ago. She posted this thing about uh, you know the typical Delin church stuff, like her own kind of announcing, like, "Oh, I'm I'm breaking with church policy." I think mean, like my message to her is like, "Look, like if if you don't like the church because you know you don't like sexual moralizing and gossip and <laughs> authoritarian and all this stuff, like you're going down the wrong path, like." That's not the way to go. Like, if you're trying to avoid this shit, going down the woke path ain't going to be the way. But, you know, got to let people go. And so so to Troy's question, I had always asked myself, like, I guess as I left the church, like when I was kind of like, am I the angry ex-Mormon or whatever? I would often ask myself if someone I cared about was like, hey, I'm going to jo go join the Branch Davidians, would I – intervene or would i try to intervene 
No, but what do you mean by entertain? Like, yeah, I honestly think that it's the right thing to do, and I also think it's the caring thing to do. Like, I think it's the moral thing to do. No, but, okay, but Forrest, but what are you talking about? It's like, it's like, hey, can we go out to lunch? So, you're joining the Branch Davidians. Tell me about that. Like, is that where you're going it? Or are you, like, sending them a text going, like, David Koresh is a fraud and a liar, and he's had sex with children, and these are all the things that the Bible's Like, when you say intervene, what are you talking about? Because, like, there's a whole I, spectrum like, of I guess, I guess in, I'll just frame it for my life. In my life, it would be I'm on Thoughtful Saints. I have a YouTube channel. And on occasion, no, but this, I'll, this is general stuff. I mean, so I, I would say this as well with you, Forrest. I mean, we've had just some little bits of, like, I disagree with that. I disagree with that. We talk with it and say it back and forth here. If you were doing stuff on your channel that I thought was completely bunk and bogus, we'd be pulling it. You know what I mean? We'd be making fun of it. We've never done that. You know, we, yeah. we watch your channel and see what you say and do that sorts of stuff. Um, I I don't have any issue or problem with with any of the stuff that you put out or or delivered like that. Uh, normally, when we're confronting on it, it's because we are actually just getting confronted with the philosophical question when should we or shouldn't we should we or shouldn't we should we or shouldn't we and we're 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 venturing into that world um i wouldn't i if i had other criticisms for you especially like back in the day i would have pulled them i mean i i watch everybody and i pull the stuff that irritates me you know what i mean so <laughs> it would have been it would have been on here or something like that yeah like, um, i'm trying to think like i'm trying to think if there's anything that i was like I, there's a few things here where i thought i might say something but nothing that made me like you know type out a comment yeah, and, and uh, my my comment the other day wasn't irritated. And I I said earlier you probably didn't hear. I was high when I <laughs> put that on there, but um, I was just <laughs> saying like, oh well, you gotta if you believe my way, you'll be able to believe my way. And and you know it was a, you were right. It was a straw man, and it was dickheaded like sort of deal. But it, it's, it is kind of true. But at the same time, I see how you were actually kind of trying to make a point with that of saying, hey, you guys, can't you see that that's coming from a place? If you if you were really in that headspace, you it's coming from from a heart yeah. place, not not a not a see yeah, you're no. believing right now or something. One thing like that I totally uh, sympathize with you, Forrest, because like with Jacob and Cardin, is the way that their whole framing of atheist ex Mormons, and it's all just this big stupid dumb angry straw man, and it's completely retarded, and both of them refuse to answer me no matter how many times because like every time they talk about atheists i always say like i always take whatever they say and i say like most buddhists and hindus are atheists does this apply to them because of course it doesn't and they will never cop to it because they cannot fucking rap when they, just, when they, they, when they say atheists majority of the time they're talking woke yeah no like, they they, they mean <laughs> they mean npr editor which is a very religious person yeah. Well, they they they're hinting a little bit at anybody who decries their stuff yeah. that they don't like. But yeah, just but in general, like the way they describe, like oh, ex Mormons, anti Mormons, all this crap. Where it's like, no, guys, like you're painting with a very broad brush, and you're not at all interested in sharpening that. You know that like that's the part where I empathize with you, where it's like because you're constantly fighting this thing. But it's just like this fight that like Jared and I were having with Maven the other day, where it's like. Just trying to convince the pro-choice crowd, like, no, we don't hate women. No, we don't want to control bodies. No, we don't believe in force. All these dumb did, tropes. Did you guys see that on Bill Maher? This, this, oh, yeah. Friday. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, Bill Maher is Bill Maher said has been really He's like, no, these out. people don't hate women. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you couldn't believe if somebody said but, that. Well, Bill Maher he, lately he has been like, I'm kind of surprised. Really He's really been hitting that hard at woke shit. There are a lot of people. Did you see that... Um, What's his name? Um, oh gosh, I forget his name. He's that. He's a black podcaster. His name's a, the the God Charlemagne the God. Oh, yeah. Charlemagne the God came out against DEI stuff multiple yeah. times. <laughs> yeah, but um, there's there's interesting stuff like that happening. And I act sometimes. I mean, some of what we covered earlier was some of the weird ways some of that right is getting way out in front of their skis in different <laughs> strange ways too yeah. and uh because we we do default back to a general classical liberalism and stuff that i mean it's part of also what we're always kind of contemplating because we also take the criticisms of like oh, that still might lead to some societal degeneracy that you can't you can't hold back in any sorts of way or something like that which is some of the things that um that dissident right will really level like they don't think the, the problems for the degenerate society is the woke's fault at all. They think it's 
the atheists and the classical liberals, or at least they're trying to change that messaging to be that. If you watch the video that we pulled up of the guy who was talking yeah. about Bogosian defending the guy who eats the shit, he was basically laying at the feet. Um, uh, Paul Gottman's kind of the same way. They, 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 it's kind of going back. Like we used to like pull up this video of this kangaroo who used to like joke, like you and I are friends now. But when it comes to the end, we're good. and it, they're, they're, both sides are kind of like a little bit knowing, like, yeah, some of us non woke new atheists sort of started befriending a bunch of you Christians again for a little bit right here. But uh, it, it does feel tenuous again because, like, sometimes, like, you guys, as soon as we default back to like a classical liberal position or leave them alone position or even a libertarian position, you guys suddenly go, no. No, you must. We must all band together and uh, form a whatever religious <laughs> ethno cult or something like that. You know, yeah. it, it, that, it that, does that's, rear that's, its head. That's my relationship with like the Daily Wire. Yeah. Like, I, I'll watch the Daily Wire, love it. Michael Knowles will get on, Ben Shapiro will get on, and they'll say some shit like that. I'm like, oh, come on. Yeah. Yeah. And if you listen to like more and more dissident right people, like, like I'll listen to like, I'll listen to their critiques of like what my world is. They'll critique what classical liberalism is or what atheism is. And I'll say, oh, you got some points there. Right? Like, like Sargon of Akkad type of guy? He's, no, he's, he's like been influenced by it a whole lot and he's he's steered toward that because now he's out talking about being against liberalism because liberalism has yeah. failed type stuff. And that's because he later got influenced. If you look up Aaron McIntyre, who's on the blaze, he kind of spells out a whole lot of it. Um, you got uh, academic agent or... Uh, Curtis Yarvin or uh, Bronze Age, um, Bronze Age uh, pervert, uh, which some of them are really weird because like they'll they'll dissect off into like pagans, like there's they're Nietzschean pagans and then extreme like Christian uh, right wing guys. We brought up some of them earlier type stuff, but their arguments are all mostly kind of critiques of liberalism, and I find them more interesting because I think their critiques of liberalism is a little bit better than Marxist critiques of liberalism. But it doesn't also then mean, okay, but now we're going to go become, form a Christian kingdom and uh, outlaw divorce. You know, <laughs> it's like, come on. Like, I, I hear you guys' critiques of how we let some degeneracy in for sure. Uh, but no, the answer isn't outlaw divorce and, on, and uh, kill the gays and <laughs> whatever, you know, type deal. And so it's like, we, we still have this like little bits of clinging to what we all knew the U S to be for the past 250 years. Uh, maybe just last past seven years, people are all suddenly saying like, no, mm -hmm. this liberalism idea can't hold together. Well, it just did for 250 years, but um, the, they, they are reactionary. They call it dissident, right? It's reactionary. Um, another big one is um, the distributist. And, they have their it's a weird like academic conservative side that they know all sorts of stuff like reading back through 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 history like going all the way back to like william blake i mean i won't even like list off like all the philosophers they get into and they're extremely smart and all that sorts of stuff and they have terrible prescriptions like their <laughs> prescriptions are just they're extremely smart and their critiques are cutting and their prescriptions are dog shit <laughs> you know i don't know like how else to to put it you know and uh um but it's a weird world because like there's going to be a moment just as jared was saying earlier that the flash happens the flash happened because it feels like a little bit like there was a flash like 10 15 years ago where it flashed the woke but i think the other flash is going to come for sure it's going to come it's going to flash back into extremely authoritarian conservative religiousness hitting and getting way out in front of their skis i, mean, I, I feel like it's happening right now oh yeah in, it's i mean it's as in like there's definitely a, a pro religious movement that i think is the most vibrant that i've seen in the last 10 years no, like i there's definitely turned back well yeah and like i mean and i think the commentary is correct which is that like people have seen what the ex-religious crowd has brought to America and have gone, oh, wait, maybe religion wasn't so bad. So, and, and I, <laughs> but then I, some of them go, and now we need to enforce it. Yeah, and now yeah, it's all Hitler. I think it was it Hitchens with uh, Frank Turek. Um, oh, man, that guy. At, at one point, he got like accused, like, <clears throat> and it's your side that has caused all these genocides and stuff. And Hitchens says something like, really? Are you saying that that Stalin was a a humanist 
pro democracy. Like, yeah. it, and it was kind of hitting on the idea, like, yeah, I'm an atheist, and those people may be atheists, but they yeah, believe like, in what's shit that I'm not advocating. For. Yeah, where where was it like the the civilization that did that stuff that believed in enlightenment principles and put those foremost? You know, yeah, like exactly. yeah. And it was just it, it was Frank was saying you're an atheist, he's an atheist, so therefore you guys are the same. It's like <laughs> this guy is believing in completely different stuff that I'm advocating for. Yeah, no, um, the, the, that's the Jake and Cardin level of atheism, where it's like, yeah, like, that's how I, I, I that's install, how Chris and I and Stalin are all in the pod with them. I feel like a lot of the times that's how the conversation is right now, though. Is like, well, we tried out that atheism thing, that didn't work. It, and it was like, know, like it's this is what it is with every crazy thing. people. That doesn't mean that atheism doesn't work. That just means, and then there's all this like broad language, like everyone. Well, has I think a it's a tough thing because like. I, I, one of the ways I think you can make atheism work is by taking some of those critiques in, to heart because the problem with atheism is that uh, they, they want to paint it as a worldview of a thing that, you know, you, you enter into something. But the real actual atheism is just what we're dealing with. <laughs> you know, I mean, this, we're dealing atheism, with the universe that there's not a God there. And we're just atheism dealing with. is not an answer to anything like Except for like, do you believe in God? No. Okay, atheist. That's the only question that answers. That's it. But this is what I. This is I think a, a good, like the the new atheists that are getting all the shit right now. Um, like all of those guys are basically anti woke. So it's like obviously their prescriptions are not the ones that are like Sam so Harris. Listen to Aaron McIntyre because like he anti dogmatism. Tries- so if you're anti-dogmatism, yeah. then you're not going to be on the woke side. Yeah, yeah. No, well, I mean, that's I don't why. Like, it... You're anti-woke because woke is religion. There was a woke division that happened from the, the atheism movement in the 2007s, but you're right that those people all kind of dwindled. The, the, the popular ones like the PZ Myers and the uh, – what's his name? Singh or something like that. The, like they definitely sure. dwindled. Like they fell off. Um, the ones who've kept their heads about them, and they've all at one point or another – kept their heads about them and um like I almost if you, if you like, listen listen to the new atheists enough like maybe they listen just enough to get out of their religion but if they they didn't actually take the whole prescription they didn't actually take on the whole philosophy they got out of their religion and then just went to a new religion but there's also like an alternate thing that i think every single one of them, daniel dennett probably even more so sam harris in his own little ways but dawkins they're all they're all not None of them are saying I I now believe in something, but every single one of them was kind of saying like, "Hey, maybe there's some stuff we need to pick and choose and grab and borrow from of a uh, of, of traditions to try to hold on to them type deal stuff." And and uh, and not an ounce of it says, "Okay, now I suddenly suddenly believe the gods there or something like that." But there there is like some reconciling of like, uh, we gotta we gotta make sure to hold on or have like a value proposition for why we're going to hold on to certain. Uh, things that like Dawkins said, like Christmas hymns, you know what I mean, type stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but that that could go even like a little farther of like saying that you're going to be a society that reveres Christmas time and Christmas hymns and that type of stuff, and and uh, yeah. and having like some sort of thing like where the atheists stand up for that, like rather than just like um, just take like acid to all of it you know um, yeah because like yeah because like okay well we don't like christianity so are we going to get rid of dickens because we don't like christmas and we don't like western so, culture and this is you where know? like in my my understanding of those guys is they would all say no to that no they definitely they definitely wouldn't but i think all of them have at this point kind of really reconciled of like beyond just saying no of saying like we got to do something to hold on to this like yeah. Dawkins, the reason Dawkins was mentioning that and the reason he's come up so much and he's been really brave about this is he's staring in the face of the Islamization of, of England, like big time. He's saying like he's kind of coming out and daring to say, no, this is and the Christian nationalists will jump all over this. Like, yo, it's a Christian country. It's a Christian country. But Dawkins is also saying it's a Christian country, but not how they're saying it. If that makes sense. There's plenty wrong with religion, but not religion doesn't seem to have any answers. (laughs) Like, you know, I don't know. It's really tough. Like, so how does Dawkins sort out? And these are the critiques of those guys you have to answer. Yeah, we'll, we'll wrap it up here. But the answer is like, how does Dawkins make sure to keep England that place 
that has all those like old Dickens, yeah. lovely lights, the tiny Tim festivals, like, whatever sorts of deal. How do you keep that society going and not have it? Well, first off, you have the invaders of Islam, but even if there's not Islam invading, like how does the society like hold on to whatever quaint, cute thing that was and not the not the belief system? <laughs> there's no answer. Yeah. But I think people are trying to figure it out. And I think that's some of the yeah. critiques. Like, why can't we start figuring it out more? I think that's one of the same things with the classical. All these people are saying liberalism failed. Now we're still in the middle of it. And part of what liberalism does is correct itself. That's what it's there for. Well, and that's I, I why it did one, work for 250 years. One so. simple answer in my mind is I think it's actually is working. We just don't give it credit. Like how many atheists celebrate Christmas and still have their pretty Christmas trees and their ornaments and their, they're pretty lights. Oh, Some even have, have nativity scenes, but regardless, like basically Christmas has been, in same with Easter, very secular. But are there Mormon and grandparents still, invited? And still a culturally relevant and meaningful practice. There's no cat here. Yeah, and but maybe they have to like go like an extra step and say, hey, we want to make sure this remains, you know, type type deal of stuff or um. I mean, I mean not, if anyone's advocating for getting rid of Christmas, I'm not about that. <laughs> I've considered yeah. the name change, I've, I, like Festivus or something, but yeah. I do, like, I do, like, if one of my dictator rules is that um, you can't start advertising Christmas shit until December 1st. Oh, really? Dictator. That's one of my dictator rules, yeah. Not good, dude. I somewhat agree just because I want to hold on to Thanksgiving a little bit, so. Yeah. No, like first off, stop cheapening Halloween by making Christmas shit start before Halloween. Okay, like well, you, you're totally there. forgetting Thanksgiving. No, I know, but I, I'm just I like, think that's how early it short gets. Short too. And then Thanksgiving awesome. just gets dumped on too because it's just yeah, lumped so into we, Christmas. Like, no, we need, to, we need to hold on to Thanksgiving and the other stuff. I don't really care about so much, but Thanksgiving is definitely the. Is that the, the one? one? Get yeah, we gotta out. hold on. We gotta hold on to all of them, man. Hold on, but I mean. That that is kind of the deal is an atheist more you know if they believe what they proclaim to believe more than anybody they should be able to stop drop and roll like reframe like we're on fire stop drop roll like we we're we're the type of people who can correct when yeah stuff it's, it's going like a weird. very utilitarian worldview almost not completely yeah. but it's like if this isn't working we can change we, we can get it better we and that's yeah. the idea of classical liberalism too and that's the idea of 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 even libertarianism, all this stuff is like, and so, so many of the people who are like pushing this stuff, like I, I recommend going and listening to like Aaron McIntyre and distributors because so much of what they're trying to push is like, and Sargon's bought into it entirely. I still like to listen to him or something, but liberalism's failed, announced. And yeah. I think Peterson's even kind of starting to listen to, to it and saying some of that stuff because he's starting to talk yeah, about, no, I heard him we're going to move into this um, post. He said like, oh yeah, the, the enlightenment area, is over. Post enlightenment area type stuff. And it's because they're listening to a little bit of those people who've made a declarative thing. This has failed. And I think the answer is no, it was always supposed to be corrective, less corrective, which is what James Lindsay's stance is and, and same with Peter Bergodian's. But keep it, correct it. But um, I don't know. But hmm. I, I, I would say that that just, takes some effort or more care than just like saying eh but i don't know that's what we've been arguing here the whole time is like hey, how much should we care or not care or get involved or not get involved but uh i actually in the end of all stuff have uh, very little criticisms uh, uh for you for us your channel uh i i can't even like imagine like a a criticism of it of what you're barking out into the ether and some of them were great your your care video was that was bad. Maybe, uh, maybe you actually got like her to girl. back down. That was something. Mm -hmm. that Kara, yeah, yeah but I down. actually think you've humanized Kara for me a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think she, did a, she had a good response too, honestly. Yeah, and um, she's even kind of come out on some other stuff, and maybe you made her brave enough to come out and say she's not down with uh, people pushing on on her marriage and that types of stuff. Because I never heard her say a peep about that until like it seemed like it was suddenly opened up for her to suddenly say, "Hey, could maybe you guys stop talking to me about uh, uh, the polyamory stuff? I get you guys like it, but you know." And <laughs> yeah. maybe uh, maybe you helped her with that a little bit. But she she, she invited me on her channel. I have, I just have you should do it. it. You should do it. She oh, seems. Man. I was like, yeah. what are we what are we gonna talk about? I don't even know. We'll come up with something. Yeah, like, you we'll totally go do it. I mean, 
some of it's just generally you just go into your backstory, right? You can always do that for an hour or so. Well, yeah, I was like, do we challenge each other or we kind of kind of find where we're common? I don't know. Well, you could always bring up and talk about you and Jacob's uh, uh, yeah, ongoing. Yeah, that's good. good stuff. I mean, that, that might as well be uh, who is it? Vidal and uh, William F. Buckley type stuff going on right there. So. Um, I only know right. half the people you reference, by the way, Chris. Really? <laughs> he does know a lot of books. He read no, all. but the thing is, is like you'll catch up. You'll you, you're how old are you? Thirty one. Thirty one. Oh my god, I had yeah. no idea. Yeah, but you'll be. Uh, I didn't think about it for a second. To all of it, thirty one. Yeah. Anyway, um, you you know Buckley and there's a good. Um, uh, all right, I got a bill. about their their debates back in the. It was like the famous kind of like conservative and liberal guy who used to debate online back in that. There's a Netflix documentary on it. Like, go check it out. So, uh, um, but it's pretty good. They were basically the only people on TV having arguments back then. And then it like all blew up one time because one of them called the other one like a Nazi. And then he said, I'll punch you in the face like right on television. And this is back in like super stuffy, like we're, 1950s. We're the, we're the only uh, ex-Mormons having arguments. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, because the rest of them is just a, I guess, a certain circle jerk or something. But yeah, yeah but um, you and Jacob doing that stuff's always good too. So but yeah, we haven't done anyway. one in a while. So we'll have to, we'll have to do another. Yeah, thanks. So. Well, you, I mean, this place is an open place. You can come on any old time you want to come on this one. So just let us know. Say shoot me a link and you can pop on whenever you want. Cool. So, Appreciate it. All right, man. Thanks a lot. See you. All right. Later.